a te nei te ara kai ronga te nei te ara e rangi. Tahi a te pō, nau mai te ao. Nau mai, nau mai te ao, nau mai te rangi awa te ao, nau mai te rangi mokopuna nei. Ka whiwhi, ka rawe, ka puta ki te whai ao ki te ao marama. E kura, e kura una, e kura whākina, whākina, whākina mai rā, hei kura mō te tangata, he kura. Ko te kura nui, ko te kura roa, ko te kura i tawhiti, tawhiti mai Hawaii ki rā anō. Tēnei te kuri i whiwhia, tēnei te kuri i rawea. Rawea mai rā, ka puta kei waho, kei te whai ao, kei te ao marama. E rongo whakiri hi ake nei ki ronga, turu turu o whiti whakamaua kia tēnā. Hau mi e hui e, tēnei te mihi atu ki a tātou, ko tau au tēnana mai nei koutou i tēnei wā. I raro i hoi te pātu, wata wata te pātawhi tō, a mātangi āwhio, ki ronga i te papa, o kō pū tīraha. Ara, kei muri i te wai o tai o aorere me te maunga tapu o maunga tapu e tū ake nei. Ko tēnei, ngā iwi, e waru o te tauhu o te waka e mihi ake nei ki a koutou, nau mai, whakatau mai, kara pini pini mai rā. Kia koe e te rangatira nik, nau nei, i whakatūwhera ai tēnei, hui hui ngā o tātou, kia whai i ngā hua, kia whai i ngā ara tika, Ngā ara whānui kai mua i a tātou. Tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Tēnā koutou. I te mea no nā nei. O hā no nā. Tūpū nai tūpū i ho. Tēnā koe mātua, tēnā koe whaia. Nau mai, haere mai, welcome to this, our City Revitalization Summit. It is incredibly exciting to have you all here today, and I'm going to do the very boring bit of, in the event of an emergency, the public address system will kindly advise you to evacuate out of your nearest exit. You will see them dotted around with large green exit signs, uh, and we will gather over on the grassed area uh, on Rutherford Park. Uh, the wonderful Paul will be our fire warden, so do what he says. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you all here today gathered. This is a room in which great things can happen and where great ideas can start. Uh, and that's really the point of the summit today is sowing the seeds of our future actions and really leading the start of a program that has the potential to transform our city and transform the way we interact with it, uh, lifting our economic development, delivering gains for our people and our planet. Uh, and all of you will play key roles in doing that. So I just wanna start by welcoming you to this conversation. Uh, we want this to be a free and frank dialogue. Uh, we do have uh, wonderful media dotted around the room. Um, so as free and frank as you'd like to do in that context. Uh, and this will be live streamed um, so that the very many registrations we had for those who couldn't fit in the room uh, can still enjoy all of the all we're going to have today. Uh, but we welcome your engagement. We welcome your feedback. And I just want to acknowledge the time everyone has taken out of very busy schedules to be here and be a part of this event. Uh, and with that, I will welcome to the stage Mayor Nick Smith. Uh, kia ora hui hui tato kato ko Nick Smith aho. Can I thank our iwi for their full, warm welcome uh, this morning? Uh, the ambition we have today is to harness Nelson's our smart entrepreneurs, the creative thinkers, uh, our strong community spirit to help us build a more prosperous, a more vibrant and a more sustainable city. Uh, I want to join with Deputy Mayor Rohan and thank every one of you for giving up a big chunk uh, of your lives and today uh, to help us with that challenge. The catalyst uh, for the summit was a widespread feeling that our city needed a shot in the arm, and renewed direction. We've just come out of four years of adversity, certainly the worst I can remember in 30 plus years of being an elected representative. The COVID pandemic, really tough in 2020 and 21, 
the storms in August uh, of uh, 22, and then last year, it's almost felt like an economic storm with the pressure of interest rates and inflation on everybody. The message we had at Council was that winter 23 was the toughest ever for our Main Street businesses, and we lost some. Now, the push for this has come as much from the community. The What If Nelson Fokatu initiative in November and our Stuff Nelson Mail running a series of articles late last year has sparked a lively community conversation. Uh, it's great to see the What If panels that I really invite you to have a look at. And I want to acknowledge uh, Anne Rush and all of her team uh, for giving a shot in the arm and starting this conversation. I ask you to put your hands together to acknowledge that work. The, from my perspective, the, the timing almost feels somewhat perfect. Uh, I've got to be honest and say the last 18 months I've been up to my eyeballs with a team like Alec trying to sort out how we clean up the mess from the August storm, and I just sort of feel like I'm getting my head above the parapet. We've just had that pretty gloomy economic news of New Zealand as a whole moving into recession. It feels to me like there is the energy and the desire to, to get up and do some stuff. I want to acknowledge uh, our elected councillors that are here today. Can I ask each of them, please, uh, just to stand up for a moment? Yeah, you, Rohan, you're one of those. Can I acknowledge uh, every uh, one of them? They're going to play a really key role this afternoon in uh, facilitating the discussion uh, in our, our breakup groups. Uh, and a personal thank you to each of them for the commitment they give our city. Uh, we're committed to delivering on our collective vision uh, that was formally adopted last Friday uh, for our 10-year plan. I've only got the title on it. I think at latest count, uh, Nicky McDonald, the legal requirements make it a 3,500 page document. We ain't going to bore you with that here. But that vision's important and goes out for consultation this week. One of the very specific priorities in that plan is transforming our central city to be a thriving, accessible, and people-focused centre. And at its core is an ambition for Nelson to be the commercial and the cultural heart of Tita Ihu. We're supported by a great team of council professionals led by CEO uh, Nigel Philpot, uh, a year into his job next week. Uh, Nigel's session this afternoon, titled Open for Business, signals his and our ambition. I also want to acknowledge our eight iwi, Ngāti Kuata, Ngāti Kuia, Ngāti Tāma, Ngāti Tawa, Te Ati Awa, Ngāti Rārua, Rangatani and Ngāti Apa. Council late last year signed an important agreement that builds on those key 2014 settlements. We welcome their help, their involvement and their investment as we shape the future of Nelson Fokatū. There are three parts of my presentation this morning. I want to reflect on what's good about Nelson, but highlight our key challenges. I want to summarise some of the key initiatives that are already in the pipeline that we need to build on. And I want to talk about some of the key ingredients that I think are going to be important to the success of today and more importantly, our plans going forward. Nelson has many strengths. Our climate, our natural environment, and our life and our parks make us a lifestyle mecca. We have a diverse economy driven by innovative businesses, and we actually have this really unique advantage of being the seafood capital for New Zealand. Our creative art sectors and heritage facilities give our city soul. We're a safe, caring, and inclusive community. Our predecessors in council have actually bequeathed the city very good infrastructure. We're actually big enough to be able to do some really cool things, but also small enough that this is a place in which each one of us can make a difference. So what are our challenges? The ASB Regional Economic Report that was out last week rated us 16th of 16. It wasn't just a blip. 
Last spring we were second to bottom, in winter we were again bottom. The reality is that not only is New Zealand uh, in recession, but our community here in Nelson is at the bottom of it. The long-term trends are equally bleak. I see Nelson and Tasman and one, and would merge into a single council tomorrow uh, if I could get away with it. But I worry at the drift in retail and investment from our city to our neighbour over the past two decades. Since 2000, Nelson's population has grown by 30%, whereas Tasman has grown by about one and a half times that, 43%. No surprise there. But retail spend over those same years has grown by 13% in Nelson and 71% in Tasman. That's five times stronger. The reality is that more Nelson people are choosing to shop in Nelson and fewer people are coming from Tasman into our city. On this track, the retail spend in Tasman will exceed Nelson's by 2030. It's the same trend in commercial building investment. Every year before 2020, we saw more investment in Nelson than what we saw in Tasman. Yet since 2020, it's reversed the other way. In rough terms, pre-2020, very consistently with the up and down on the economic cycle, two-thirds of the commercial of investment was in Nelson City and a third in Tasman. And since 2020, it's been exactly the opposite. Two-thirds in Tasman to our one-third. The concerning part for me and for Nelson is that we're not only losing retail spend to Richmond, but we're also seeing a drift of professional technology and services companies. Now, I do not wish Nelson to become the port for the city of Richmond. I acknowledge Tim would make a great mayor. He'd need to give up his tractor. Uh, but I would make a terrible harbour master. This summit is about how we reset those trends. Now, there are some really positive and exciting things in the pipeline. Council's biggest project last year was the new e-bus service, the first all-electric bus service in New Zealand with better frequency, new routes, and new destinations like the airport, like Wakefield and Motawaka. The next big step is the new bus interchange at Miller's Acre. We want to create an integrated transport hub for the e-buses, for the intercity buses, for the buses that service Nelson Lakes and Abel Tasman, alongside the existing bike hire and dock information centre. The project is planned to start later this year and to be completed next, subject to being able to get funding from NZTA. Engagement on the concept design um, starts next month and we hopefully will get there next. The $76 million bridge to better upgrade of the infrastructure and streetscape is one of the oldest corridors in the city, it is a transformational project for this part of the city. It will facilitate investment in central city housing, but also address long-standing problems such as the regular flooding uh, on Whakatū Square. Our Tasman Bay's Heritage Trust is well advanced in its $15 million Church Street Arc project, with the hope, subject to funding, of being getting construction in the next year. We have a rich history with some of the earliest Maori settlements. Our museum is the oldest in the country, and its collection contains over 200,000 objects with a value of over 20 million. This development will enhance this corner of Nelson and grow our city's identity as a heritage centre. Our council is also progressing the development of a new play space with $2.4 million of government support just along here on Para Para Road, adjacent to the Mai Tai River walkway and cycleway. Our ambition is for it to be the best play space in Tita Ihu and be a mecca for bringing young families into our city. Our council is also committed to delivering a community arts hub in the central city with the proposal out for consultation as part of our long-term plan this month. 
It's intended as a home for our arts development agency and as a comfortable, affordable space for Nelson's artists to come together. It's about enhancing our city as an arts precinct. Another important council initiative is Plan Change 29 that facilitates intensification. Uh, I openly acknowledge it's contentious, as we found out last year, in many of the residential areas. But there's actually really strong support for its provisions in enabling higher and easier development in the CBD. The hundreds of submissions to that process shows these conversations are difficult, but they also show a passion and interest in the shape of our city that we collectively need to harness. Now, I've long had a deep belief that the future of the city is well tied to the sea. Our port and our marina, our fishing, our aquaculture and our marine industries are the science and technology and that support them. We will this year begin construction on the marine promenade, improving the walking and cycling access between the marina and the city. You will also hear this afternoon of proposals from the council's marina for tens of millions of dollars of investment in that marina facility that, in my view, will help support economic development. We can add to this list of initiatives the Connings Food Market on the council-owned strategic site at the entrance of Fokatu Square. A pop-up store will open later this year to be followed by redevelopment into a similar complex to the Conning successful Appleby operation. And the adjacent Remax building on Rutherford Street is proposed for a refillery store by Good Four. I love the mix of these initiatives and projects. They involve the public sector, the private sector, and the community sector. They are about new buildings, new underground infrastructure, new transport, new community facilities. And those revision of planning rules, the biggest in more than 30 years, will open up the doors for new investment. Now, these are a great foundation for today's agenda. But let's not underestimate how much hard graft, attention to detail, is going to be required to deliver each one of them and get them right. And let's also acknowledge that success for each of them is not guaranteed. Now, the focus today is on what's next. And want to conclude my presentation with some of the ingredients that I think are needed. My first is a plug for a and and not or conversation, particularly when it comes to investment and transport. I hear these really passionate arguments between people that say, oh, Nick, the future of the city is central city housing. Or, no, 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 it's retail. Or, no, 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 got to get into that technology sector. Oh, no, 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 it's those traditional professional services areas or it's tourism, or it's international students. My plea is that a vibrant city needs all of those. I also hear similar debates over transport between advocates for cars, for biking, for walking, and public transport. We need to be investing in all those modes to deliver on our vision of a city being the commercial and commercial hub for the wider region. We need transport choices that work for the 85,000 people who live in our region, but not in the city ward. We also need to maximise the opportunities to secure government funding. Remember, central government spends 10 times as much as local government. We did very poorly from the Kanoa Provincial Growth Fund over the past six years, with Nelson and Tasman securing 37 million or 1% of the 3.2 billion. We are, Nelson and Tasman, 5% of New Zealand's provincial population. So on a fair share, we missed out on about 120 million. Northland, per head of capita, got 10 times what Nelson achieved. We need to do better with the new government. Our Nelson Regional Development Agency has positioned us well but we will need to be focused and united, particularly with government funding being a lot tighter. We've been engaging early with ministers and officials on the $1,200 million regional infrastructure fund initiated by New Zealand First. 
We've also been in talks with National on its policy of having these city and regional deals that has local and central government partnering on local development, regional development, a model that's been used incredibly successfully in the UK. We've been very clear, Nelson and Tasman, that our top priorities for the region are that billion dollar upgrade of our Nelson Hospital and the half billion dollar Hope Bypass. My next key message is that private sector investment is going to be pivotal. We can have all sorts of ideas about what sort of city we want, but it all depends on someone being prepared to invest their assets and their savings and put them at risk. Making development stack up is difficult and it's actually incredibly challenging delivering them. Civic investment is important and it's got an important role, but it also adds to the rates burden. Private investment grows our rating base and enables us to be able to spread the burden. We need to get close to the investment community in retail, hospitality, technology, and both in the commercial and residential building sectors. Great to have so many here today. We need to listen to them about what it is that's going to make them investing in Nelson attractive. I have one personal proposition to put in the mix today about our waterfront. We developed a stretch between Guyton's and the Sea Lord Marine Rescue Centre through the Nelson 2000 Trust that I established when I was the MP. I think there is an opportunity to have a crack at another stretch with council owning for years the Anchor Building, the old Powerhouse Building and three other vacant properties around Haven Road. I look at what other cities like New Plymouth, Wellington, Auckland, uh, even Manawatu with its river, have done with their waterfronts and want us to connect more with the sea, I think there's an opportunity knocking there. My final point is the importance of working together. Council has a critical role, role and we're up to it. But we need the business sector, we need our iwi, we need our community sector engaged with us and actually engaged with each other. There will be differences of view today on Nelson's future. That's healthy and just as it's healthy around the council table. My invitation though is for us to focus on what unites us and get some good stuff done, albeit I confess Councillor Rainey tends to use a different S in the GSD that I will not profess. I reiterate my gratitude for every one of you giving up your time today. Uh, your contributions are welcome. This is the beginning of a concerted effort to re revitalise this beautiful city that we are privileged to call home. Namahinui. Thank you, Nick. Um, he almost stuck to time, uh, but the good news is last week he had COVID, so we're going to put him in a mask in the corner um, and just make him <laughs> listen to all of you for the rest of the day. Uh, we're now on to our uh, session one, our economic context for revitalization. So I'd like to first welcome um, Nick Brunston from Infometrics to give us that wider overview of how we're looking. Jordan, Nick. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Right. Um, kia ora, and thanks for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Um, I'll follow on from, I guess, the time set by, by me and Nick and um, start with a bit of gloom and doom um, about how things are looking nationally and, and where Nelson's fitting in within that, and then um, move on to um, a couple of sort of uh, longer term challenges for the region and then end on a couple of bright notes to hopefully um, provide a bit of positivity for the rest of the day. First things first, um, we do have a challenged national economy. Um, we had the announcement last week from StatsNZ uh, that New Zealand had a technical recession, um, two quarters in a row of you know, negative GDP growth. Around the office, that didn't really get anyone excited. Um, what was sort of more interesting or perhaps more concerning within that was that we had a, um, a much bigger recession on a per capita basis. New Zealand had record population growth last year, record net migration last year. Um, and so when we adjust for that growth in the population, our economic activity fell 2.1% per person. 
Um, by comparison, in the GFC 2009, at the worst, it was a 2.9% fall in GDP per capita. So we're not quite as bad as the GFC, but actually it's somewhat getting close. If we look at what that means for retail sales as a more sort of tangible um, indicator of how how the economy is going and how people are feeling, um, obviously um, with high interest rates, sort of cumulative impact of high inflation, households are squeezed, people are spending less. What we see is that firstly with the green line, um, overall consumer spending volumes um, are up about 3.4% over the past year and are starting to soften a bit. Once we factor in that huge inflation and sort of think about how many, um, not so much about how many dollars are going through the tills, but how many bags are leaving the stores, we're down 3.8%. If we account for how many more people we've added to the economy, we're spending 6.1% um, less each per person. And so that makes a real challenge both directly in the retail sector. Obviously, there's less money going through the tills, less goods being sold, um, but also it indicates that broader um, health of the economy. Nelson is at the pointier end of these trends. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise, given we had the ASB scorecard come out last week, as Nick alluded to, um, um, Nelson at the bottom of the table um, up to the end of 2023 um, in our own quarterly economic monitor. Um, we didn't put it in quite so rough terms, but um, you know, there's a few indicators showing Nelson was underperforming the national economy. If we look at consumer spending, again, just a good indicator for how households are feeling and, and, and the sort of activity happening in the community. Um, consumer spending and now sitting up 2.5%, so a fair way behind inflation of 4.7%, um, and certainly less than what we saw over in Tasman with 6.2% growth. Northland, the only region that was worse on that measure, and they've had um, they've had cyclones, they've had the closure of the Mars and Point refinery and, and some road, road blockages and stuff, so a few other challenges there. If we look at uh, trends in employment, so this is again a bit more of a tangible outcome of, of how things are going, are people being hired, is employment growing? Um, again, Nelson um, sitting unfortunately um, towards the bottom of the table, uh, employment growth of just 0.6% um, compared to growth of 2% in Tasman. If we look around the regions, um, particularly towards the top of the table, um, these regions have all had a strong gain of net migration. Um, you know, Auckland went from sort of zero growth to, 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 to great growth last year on the back of um, you know, large numbers of migrants coming in and filling jobs that they struggled to fill for a couple of years. Nelson's still got a share of net migration. Nelson's population grew from 0.1% um, from to 1.1% over the past year. So Nelson was getting its share of that net migration. Its population did accelerate last year, but it seems that it hasn't really translated into employment growth. So perhaps the sorts of people you're getting in are maybe a little bit less economically engaged than um, the sorts of migration that we're getting into other parts of the country. Um, that sort of brings us into one of the uh, next sort of into the structural challenges, and I think you can possibly guess where this one's heading for Nelson. Um, the ageing population, um, Nelson and Tasman to an extent, have a, um, have a seriously ageing population. Um, they are sort of at the, again, to, to reuse the phrase, at the pointier end of New Zealand's um, ageing population. Um, the population under 20, so these are the people, these are your kids now, these are the people that will be entering the workforce over the next 20 years. That accounts for 22% of the population today. Um, the population that's um, between 45 and 64, so that's the people that might be looking to leave the workforce over the next 20 years, they account for 26% of the population. So we've already got an imbalance there between the people that might be leaving the workforce and the people that are local that might be going into the workforce. If we look a little bit further into the future, kind of thinking a couple of decades here, that sort of childbearing age or um, the newlywed age, um, the 20 to 44 year olds, um, they're projected to decline from 31% to 28%. So we've got fewer people in that childbearing age coming through the ranks. So naturally we'd expect even fewer children um, coming through in, in a decade or two as well, which is going to exacerbate that kind of imbalance between the number of people leaving the, the workforce and the number of people entering. All of this is to say that um, you know, Nelson does have an ageing population. We're not going to turn that around the, 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 as a structural feature of the population. Net migration is going to be absolutely essential um, to, to just keep the lights on, um, and you'll need extra net migration to actually grow the economy. And so when we sort of think about the future of the city, thinking about how it's positioned in terms of attracting migrants, attracting people, attracting hopefully some slightly younger people as well, is really, really important. The other challenge for the region is around productivity, and I think that's been covered a little bit by NRDA over the last couple of years, but if you look at economic activity per capita, per resident, um, 15 years ago, Nelson was um, was 
pretty much bang on about the same level of productivity as the national economy, and Tasman was sitting about 21,000, 23,000 behind. What's happened in the last 15 years is that Nelson's productivity has done nothing, um, and New Zealand's productivity has roared ahead. Tasman's productivity has kind of moved up and kind of halved the gap between. So that really signals um, a lot around the sort of the level of activity, the value of activity going on, and the sort of generation of, um, of, of, of wealth, of income, of living standards in the city. Onto the two bright spots to leave on a more positive note. Um, firstly, um, I mean, I think, you know, again, um, the integration between Tasman and Nelson is, is getting closer and closer and closer over time, and absolutely that makes sense. But when we think about growing Nelson, we do have to acknowledge that the structure of Nelson's economy is actually quite different to Tasman's economy. They are very different. Nelson is a fully-fledged regional city, and it behaves like a city. And if we look at the structure of Nelson's economy, it's got a lot more in common with Auckland than it does with Tasman. If we look at high value services, so these are people um, people working in the likes of professional services, information, media, health and education. It accounts for 32% of jobs in Nelson, 35% of jobs in Auckland, 20% of jobs in Tasman. And we sort of see the inverse in, in, in the primary sector, and unsurprisingly, um, playing a much bigger role in Tasman and a relatively insignificant role in a direct sense, accounting for 5% of jobs in um in Nelson. So um, working together as a region is absolutely important, but they are two, two quite different parts of the sub-region and they have different structures and different drivers. Finally, on the retail sector, and I guess picking up on the, on the thread around that sort of um, drift to Richmond, it's certainly true that we've seen that drift in population towards Richmond, the sort of centre of centre of gravity of the region is shifting out that way. And we have seen that happen in, the, in, in, in terms of um, retail sales as well. Most prominently in terms of um, grocery sales, as we've seen, you know, the likes of Richmond Mall develop, and that's sort of to be expected. People are going to want to buy their groceries close to where they are. We've seen um, Nelson's share of the region's grocery sales going from 49% to 40%. That's okay. Supermarkets don't really drive the local economy. What's a bit more encouraging is that if we look at other retail, so that's capturing things like the high street retail, your clothing, your footwear, your homewares, um, that's held its own a little bit better. That's only declined from 70% to 66%. Despite all that growth in Richmond Mall, the sort of Nelson CBD is still holding, um, holding a good share there. And if we look at hospitality spending, that's actually grown from 58% to 60%. So 60% of Nelson Tasman's hospitality spend happens in Nelson. So that says that even though the population is drifting out that way, when they want to get um, go out for a, for a drink, go out for a nice meal, um, go and buy a nice suit or some shoes, they're still coming into, Nas into Nelson um, to do so. And so that's a really strong platform um, to sort of start with as you kind of think about um, revitalization going forward. At that point, I'll, um, I'll wrap up and um, we'll pass on to... Um, on to Chris. Well, thank you, Nick's, both Nick's. Uh, that's beautifully set the scene for our presentation. And thank you, Nelson, for having us at this uh, transformational event, I think, for the city centre. My focus today is really to uh, help set the scene for the discussions that we're going to have ahead of us, but talk firstly about those macro trends, those trends that are going on nationally and globally. We can't do anything about those trends, but what we can do is recognise those in how we plan our developments and the decisions that we make. And then secondly, I want to talk about the ways that we can do that locally here in Nelson. But firstly, I want to talk about what is driving those consumer decisions that where people are going to spend their money and who they're going to spend it with. So we've seen a significant shift over the last decade from products to experiences. And as a retailer told me just recently, people buying less stuff but spending more in bars and spas. And it was a beautiful analogy because that's exactly what's happening now. People are wanting to spend money on things that they enjoy. And that's really proliferated since the pandemic. Nelson's always led in terms of its environmental focus and its priorities, but that is something that's no longer isolated to Nelson. That is happening nationally and internationally as well. So that's a real factor that drives people's decisions on the things that they're buying and where they're spending. Convenience 
that certainty and reliability. People are more purposeful in when they're shopping these days. So they want to know that those stores are going to be open. They want to know that those products are going to be there. That's where places like malls can really benefit because they don't have stores that are closed on Mondays or open some days, not others. That's where some of our city centres are now finding the challenges. And where I saw yesterday people who had made the trip to Nelson peering into store windows that were closed and, and, and the resulting disappointment of those customers. So it's a challenge that we see not only here in Nelson, but in other places as well. Aspiration. People want to identify with places and brands that share their values. So that's something that we need to be cognizant of. And finally, that enjoyment, escapism and differentiation. Differentiation is really important because we need to set ourselves apart as a destination. Escapism, the world's in turmoil. You don't have to do, walk too far to find those challenges. But people come on shopping journeys into towns and cities and malls to escape a lot of that. And we need to remember that in the environments that we deliver and the themes that we're portraying. How are retailers and the sectors and the property owners responding? So fewer, better located and more efficient stores. That creates a challenge for older cities like Nelson. And that's the reason that why we're seeing businesses go into some of these more purpose-built sites. Being amongst complementary businesses is another really important thing because businesses love to be amongst their competitors. It creates a really powerful draw for customers, a very certain destination value. Increasingly, businesses are using e-commerce to drive that visibility and that attraction. It's really important. Nelson's always been extremely strong in its digital performance. And it was so gratifying yesterday to spend some time in the AI hub in the city centre. What an amazing operation that is. And what an edge for Nelson and its opportunity going forward. Creating environments that inspire, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer really, but you know we've got to give pe people reasons to come into our cities. And finally making it easy and convenient. That convenience is a factor that drives people's destination decisions. If we're not easy and convenient, we will lose out to competitors. And how's this playing out in our cities around New Zealand? We work here in New Zealand uh, from Invercargill to Kaitaia. We work in Australia. We work in the UK. So we're seeing across all of these areas these shifts from hospitality, from retail, again, buying products, to hospitality, entertainment, and those experiences, whether they're spas or whether they're other types of experiences, that is a big factor that's changing things. Our health and wellness categories are snowballing. You'll see it through our city centres, but people are spending more on looking after themselves. And whether that's bigger pharmacies or whether that's mobility centres that are catering for our ageing population, these are categories that are growing. We're seeing younger, more progressive, well, we're seeing younger businesses and our entrepreneurs now no longer wanting to lock themselves into longer term lets. They're looking for shorter term opportunities. They're looking for more agile models. And it's something that we need to be considering as our city centres are evolving. Non-retail uses are also populating our city centres. And while it's great that those sites are active and used, they do punctuate a city centre. So whether it's a labour hire business or other types of activities, it's important that we work with them to create those active frontages, to make those places look exciting and inviting so that they don't disrupt our retail flow. And that con these continued the continued rationalization of sectors like banking. So some of those largest, larger facilities that may no longer be suitable for modern retail are becoming vacant and causing some challenges. What does it mean for Nelson then? So our retail landscape is gonna continue to evolve. Some of those traditional retail spaces may no longer be suitable. 
And our larger spaces may need new solutions. They won't necessarily be retail, but we want them active and vibrant and contributory. And that activation and vibrancy is really important to us. We work in a lot of areas where there's some social challenges going on. It's, it's across the country, it's across the world, but getting people into our cities and creating more activity creates what we call capable guardianship, and it means that we, we have a lot less of those issues going on in our city centres. And we need to be thinking very carefully about successive uses and operators, especially in places like Nelson where we have such creativity, such innovation. How can we respond as a city? So understanding and building on our niches, the areas that we do really well in, the areas that we can own and dominate and lead in, these are the things that we need to be focusing on. Becoming an even more customer-centric CBD is a really important thing as well. So focusing on our customers that are using us now, but also those people that aren't spending with us. What do we need to do to bring them into our city centre and get them spending? Encouraging precincts and clusters, I know this is a focus for many of our property sector, for uh, Uniquely Nelson, uh, but we really need to double down on that. The Connings opportunity is so, so very good. We often hear wherever we're working, can't we get a Farrell or can't we get a Moore Wilsons? Well, Connings goes to the next level because they actually produce the stuff. No one has that edge in New Zealand. It's extremely lucky. And when it lands, we need to be supporting it um, Boots and all. We need to be creating those, those environments that people want to be in. We need to earn the return to our city centres. And we need to increase our visitation and we need to broaden that appeal. That's a really important thing as well. Increasing that visitation because we may not be able to get more out of what we've got. People coming in now, getting them spending more. But if we have more people, the chances of that is much, are much better. We were asked to compare Nelson with other places, and I don't, I'm don't. i not really that keen on this because Nelson is unique in many, many ways. But what I can say is the secret of success for the cities that are doing really well is that they have very, very strong and vocal advocates. People out there championing the city, talking positively about it. And one of the challenges we found with Nelson as we've talked to different stakeholders is People say, I wish people would talk more fondly about our city centre. Or I hate going into the club and people talk, what's happening with the CBD? We need to change that rhetoric. We need to reset that going conversation. So, next slide, guys. Um, beautiful. How does Nelson stack? So our challenges aren't anything different from our other cities. S suitability of buildings, our, our seismic aspects, a dated public realm, the social challenges that we have, increasing competition, whether that be in, uh, locally within our region or online, and our core categories under stress, such as, um, and I would call core categories are our biggest occupiers of floor space. So apparel, hospitality, to be honest, there aren't many sectors that are doing well in terms of retail and consumer-facing sectors at the moment. But where's our potential? So celebrating and leveraging that provenance, that conning story is so very exciting, but there are so many other opportunities for provenance in our city centre that we can own and dominate in. Building around our creative sectors because this is where our succession can come from. Strengthening our edge and differentiation. So actually, firstly, understanding where our edge and differentiation is and then building upon that is important. Increasing our visit accommodation. So often we see there's not a lot of capacity left in Nelson. People want to be here. And we've got important niches too. We need to rebalance. We need to get that uh, the um, backpackers back again because so many businesses told us how important the backpackers were in terms of trade, but also aspects like temporary staffing and those. So bringing those back online is very, very, very important for Nelson. Enabling more inner city living and activity, it's a no brainer, but 
getting more people into this area is an important thing in terms of activity, but also trade. And that positivity and advocacy for our CBD is absolutely vital. Our last, last slide and our first steps. Number one, we need to work out our why to rebuild our pride and purpose. We need to work out where we want to head as far as the city. What's our edge? Where's our differentiation? What can we win in? Defining and enriching our destination value, that's a key part of that as well. Understanding our successive audiences. I was so delighted to see the children's play area because when we spoke, we've spoken previously, we've had uh, young families talk to us about the challenge of the city centre not having anything for uh, those younger families. So this is a really important part. Thinking about our successive audiences is absolutely vital. Re-energizing through catalyst developments, opportunities for new civic developments, whether they be libraries or whatever, we're working on a number of those around the country and I cannot tell you how important they are. We're based in Wellington and I can tell you how losing our central library has hollowed the city centre. It's really impacted the businesses around it. And it's not until you don't have it that you realise what you've got, what you've lost. But the places that have revitalised, and chatting just before to Brett Callaghan about uh, the, the, the vibrancy that's happened in Hastings recently with the new development, you see the, the activity that it brings back into a city centre. And it's that type of thing that we need to be focusing on. Supporting our businesses through change, we are going to see change. We do need to get these developments happening. We do need to, to upgrade our city centres infrastructure and our public realm. And then finally, focusing and cultivating our future occupiers and experiences. Thinking about our successive opportunities here for Nelson. Change is, uh, has been on the agenda for many, many years. Um, 1969, these news articles were published, and this came from a retailer's history, uh, the Trithurn family, um, some beautiful uh, snippets out of the paper, Nelson Mail in 1969, talking about a vision for the future. And this was the comment from Trithurn's was, we believe an overall plan for the city has immense potential. There was a lot of other comments in there, but I thought that was absolute gold. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nick. We do have time for a few questions, uh, brief questions. Uh, so I'll, we've got Paul with a roving mic. Uh, so if you want to throw up your hand, if you've got a question for either Chris or Nick, um, if not, we can roll straight into the next session and I can stay closer to time. You're all so efficient. I love it. All right. Another huge round of applause for Chris and Nick. And I'll invite our uh, panelists up for panel number one. Come on up. And whilst our panelists come and join us, um, I'll just give a brief introduction. Uh, many of these spaces will be familiar to you. They do a lot of great work uh, across our city. Uh, and I'll let them introduce themselves, um, but really the conversation here is about investment and about spending. Um, and the levers to make that happen, mm -hmm. but also the barriers and challenges that we have. Uh, so, first up, I'll invite Ian to introduce himself. And I'll ask our panelists, uh, I've given them a, a time to do a brief sort of pitch. I'm gonna beg them to go as quickly as possible for that so we can have as much time for a discussion afterwards. Kia ora everyone. Um, I'm Ian Williams. Uh, I have two hospitality businesses uh, in the city centre uh, and also I'm the uh, president of the hospitality associations for the region. So I just want to give a bit of a quick overview. I could spend a day on this, but I'm going to try and do it in a few minutes um, to paint the investment picture, because that's what we've been asked to talk about in terms of being an owner operator in the hospitality sector. So um, as a business operator in Nelson, so this is the kind of journey we're going on very quickly. Uh, as a business operator in hospitality, why would anyone 
uh, invest in Nelson? Well, we'd need to check out uh, a few of two key elements, and one is resources available to us, and what, and the other is the business environment that we're operating in. So, in terms of capital, we need the confidence to invest what are, what we have and what we might need to borrow to open a business. Premises: Do I buy or do I rent? What's available, and can I do business with the landlord? In terms of continuing resources, of course, we need people. Is there a local workforce with talent, with a work ethic, and who care about the business? Is training available? Can an immigrant get a visa or renew a visa? Our customer base, do customers see the attraction of our city? Are they loyal? Do they get value for money? Do they get a lifestyle here? And in terms of professional support, is there access to banking, accounting, legal services that suit my needs? And is there a supportive business community? On to the business environment. The business support, is there access to business collectives? Is there access to my specialist associations in whatever industry I'm in? In my case, hospitality. What's the housing market like? Is it healthy, vibrant and affordable? Is it a place where people want to live and work? Landlords, are they willing to support business for me and for the city? What are their aspirations? Public sector, is it fair and supportive? Is it business focused? Do they limit or do they enable business in their attitude? Do they start with the question, how can we help you? So I then went on to look at a bit of a traffic light system around these areas. So let's kick off with the, the greens and get those out of the way. Uh, and again, this is for uh, from the perspective of, of hospitality operators. In business support, I feel we're very fortunate. We've got the Chamber of Commerce, Uniquely Nelson, our own business association, uh, association such as Hospitality New Zealand. In terms of professional support, we're surrounded by high quality, supportive, friendly professional services in my experience. And COVID is a testament to that. I think we got through it because of that support. So let's look at the ambers. We've got work to do in business, environment, and the resources elements in this. The housing market is pretty unstable, still uncertain, and it does impact on customer availability and spend. So what confidence is there in that market? The public sector, so we're talking about central, local government and agencies, but of course the focus for us is very largely Nelson City Council. We have talks and plans, but we need them to be converted into action now. We need to make regulatory services supportive. So for example, consents, food certification and alcohol licensing. In other words, how can we help rather than provide high costs, hurdles and bureaucracy? How about, here's an idea, how about a Nelson City Council business ambassador, a one-stop shop, if you like, rather than have to go to each silo? We need to be solution and customer focused. We need to know what our regional development agency is doing for our little business that sits on, uh, on a street in the central city. A hospitality and tourism, a city eyesight is an, is an essential uh, element incorporating digital boards and that capability, but also as well as tourists needing technology, they need people to help and recommend and book. They need the human touch. Essential to hospitality and also I would argue city prosperity in general is events. And this is something I bang on a lot about. They're the lifeblood for growth of the city they bring out the locals, they draw tourism, and they melt, make Nelson City the place to be. Taramaroa, food festivals, music festivals, arts and culture events, concerts, they're all local and unique, and they're testimony to the way it works, and it does work. The evidence speaks for itself, and we need more of it. On to premises. The availability is good. We've got plenty of choice right now with some empty spaces. The challenge is the affordability of rent and rates and the willingness of landlords to invest and support business operators is highly variable. In terms of people, 
post-COVID, it's still a struggle to get quality staff in hospitality that have a strong work ethic and are trainable. Immigrants and tourist workers, and, so, and, and Chris mentioned backpackers, are gen generally come with experience and training and perform better. But the visa bureaucracy and median wage nightmare continues on for us. The customer base. Locals need to be convinced, firstly, of Nelson as a first choice, affordable, fun place to live. And secondly, we need to focus on attracting tourism into the city because we have so much to offer. This summer, in the experience of my membership, has been harder than last summer. Generally, a lower spend, uh, spend in hospitality uh, because of the cost of living and all of that. And we're still off, uh, way off pre-COVID spend levels despite the fact that overall tourism nationally has bounced back pretty well. So new for 2024-25, it will need to see more arts tours, gastro tours, heritage tours, artisan retailer tours, walking, biking, all of that stuff. It's all here, so let's improve uh, on it and shout about it. So let's get to the Reds, the showstoppers, if you like. Capital. Hospitality industry has been stung big time by COVID. It is still in recovery, and we think it's probably going to take another three years to get back to where we were. Borrowing is difficult and expensive, so growth is hard to achieve, and selling a business in hospitality is hard. Most operators are stuck where they are in survival mode, rather than development and expansion, which is where they want to get to. Landlords, not sure about their commitment to Nelson's survival and renewal, Nelson City Council has set that good example of working with Connings, and we need to see more of that from private landlords focused on building business confidence in partnership with their tenants. We all need to come together with Nelson City Council to create a real vision backed by the dollar investment. Sustainability and continuity for us is, and that's, you know, we need to tackle those reds and ambers that are on there. An environment for long-term thinking, capitalizing on the magic of Nelson. Build and support an entrepreneurial culture that's focused on quality and excellence. Often people talk, and they, in my 14 years in Nelson, I've heard this a lot, they talk of the old guard. Well, I don't know whether that's a myth or a reality. All I know is that the average age of people in this room typically needs to drop by 10 or 15 years. So my question is, are the operating entrepreneurs under 45 here today? We need the next generations being listened to and taken seriously, encouraged to take leadership and be given a green light to their ideas. Personally, I'm focused on fa my family business succession in my own small corner, but we need succession on a bigger scale for the bigger picture with young people, younger people, younger operators having the voice and building on the heritage that is Nelson going forwards, not backwards. So in conclusion, if you ask younger own operators in hospitality today, whether it's worth starting and staying in business here, they will probably say no. We need to change that to a yes by taking urgent action on the business environment and support. Hospital hospitality costs have gone through the roof while real spend has reduced. That's survivable if we get the volume of people through our hotels, motels, restaurants, cafes and bars not least local people and domestic visitors in winter. Last week, Hospitality New Zealand launched its new five-year strategy. Much emphasis is on training and quality, getting hospitality back to being a career choice. And we've got a long way to go, but building a good business environment here will be a key factor. We have the resources and tools to make it worth investing in Nelson to build confidence, wealth, and positive culture. So let's stop talking about it and get on with it. We've been talking for 14 years in my experience. What are our immediate enablers when we look at this lot? What are our limiting factors? Nelson, as we know, is currently at the bottom of the national league table in economic development. Why is that? What are we not doing? What will NRDA, NCC and MB do about this now with the business community in support? Finally, the invitation to attend this forum says this, our ambition to the, for the day is to harness Nelson's smart entrepreneurs 
creative thinkers and strong community spirit to help develop the ideas to revitalize the city, attract investment and build a more prosperous future. If it's proving difficult to do that in business now, in the current climate, which it is, we need to change what we do and how we do it in order to capitalize on any entrepreneurial ideas and creativity that we possess as a city, especially with the support of younger business operators. We really need to listen to what gets in the way of business growth and city vi economic vitality. Examples might be the loss of Bay Dreams, why? Greater restrictions on alcohol licensing, why? Difficulties in coordinating conflicting regulatory barriers, why? Radical steps bringing radical results targeted positive trading conditions will I guarantee bring every Nelsonian success. So should we choose to invest in Nelson? Yes, but get the reds and ambers to green, simplify the processes, do the planning, eliminate the blocks, and let's get faster to the action and results. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Andrew. Kia ora koutou, uh, ko Andy toko inua, um, po whakahare i whenua um, at Walker 2 Incorporation. Um, I've got the pleasure of dealing with um, over 350 properties um, across the region, and I see all sorts of um, different businesses and operations um, and hear lots of stories from our tenants and our business partners and all of the parties that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things that kind of comes through for, at this current time is the struggles that people are having just to continue with their business operations and, and move forward from, you know, what we all know about the COVID years and, and the current economic climate. Walk two is intrinsically linked to this region and it focuses its investments on this region but it comes with substantial challenges. In the building space, we've seen build costs increase by about 40% over the last two years, which makes it incredibly challenging for um, any developer to really start to get things to stack up and then pass on something that is tangible for the uh, tenants to move forward with. So that we have to look at it and really, really drill down into how do we make our developments work for the people who use the buildings day to day, the people who come and um, invest in the buildings with their businesses and ensure that there is a longevity for our tenancies for the people that we work with every day. So with those increased build costs, we've also got increased compliance, increased um, regulatory frameworks, which stack up each time a new piece of work is brought in, a new policy is brought in, it makes things increasingly more difficult to get these developments off the ground. Uh, at the moment, there's talks um, in the engineering space about um, altering the seismic um, engineering loading for buildings across the region, which will inevitably make it harder and harder for us to develop um, multi-story buildings. The costs are going to increase. Those cost increases naturally drive um, rents across the region. They naturally um, make it more and more difficult for um, every everyday operations to you know, in, pay for those supplies. New build properties, you may even see them have double the rent of a an old style property that you've got in the city center. So what does that mean for, for us looking into the future? Well, prices are starting to come down, but it also means that we need to make sure that we are honing in on um, the supply chains that are feeding this region to try and actually bring costs down and work with parties to ensure that we cost engineer what is deliverable so that we can realize the dreams that we are looking at doing with these precincts around the around the region to make sure that we are making sure developments fit the bill. 
rather than trying to pick things off the shelves and, and not achieve our goals. Overlaying all of this is the elephant in the room is the climate change agenda. And I actually find it quite challenging within the Nelson City space that we have all got a really strong understanding of what climate change means for the built environment. But we haven't yet understood whether or not we are staying in the city centre and managing our, our, our approach to um, protecting our um, crucial low-lying areas such as Fokatu Square or are we going to gradually manage retreat out of the city? And I think that's something that Nelson really needs to get to grips with, but not get to grips with over the next 10 years, get to grips with quickly so that people can confidently invest into the city centre without fear that in 50 years' time, their, um, their investments are going to become redundant or devalued. And I think that's something that we really got to work forward with um, as a community and put pressure on to ensure that we get to a point where our climate change agenda is really understood locally. Some of the challenges that I've highlighted are countered significantly by our region's um, lifestyle the most of us live here because of lifestyle choices and there's so many unique businesses that operate within the nelson area and nelson city center lots of entrepreneurial um endeavors and i i suppose echoing what our colleagues have already said so far is how do we continue to bring those people in faced with all those challenges of rising costs climate change, and other challenges that have been highlighted. And I think to kind of close out my relatively short speech is I think the best way to drive that is through supporting our education bases like NMIT and the good work that they do there, supporting our art spaces and bringing into the region that very unique blend that Nelson actually delivers so well already and improving on it thank you thank you very much andrew i'm just looking outside and waiting we'll, we'll see if the sea comes in today uh next up steve thank you mayor councillor Iwi, people of Nelson. Uh, my name's Steve Bajant, as uh, has been said. Uh, this year marks uh, 40 years since I bought my first property in Nelson City and be began building my property portfolio. Since then, I've touched a number of uh, properties in the, in the Nelson City, always the, with the uh, mantra of adding value. It's been a successful formula, which by extension is good for Nelson City. At the same time, I and my team have built an actually significant property portfolio based on shopping centres, so I have some idea what it takes to create a successful retail environment. I spend a lot of time looking at aerial photographs of Nelson trying to think where are the solutions and where are the opportunities, which led me to pr propose some five years ago a, a significant investment in the city, which unfortunately we were not able to execute. So I'm a reluctant speaker, but... Uh, uh, I, I'm passionate about Nelson City and feel as though I needed to to speak. Hopefully I've got a, uh, something here. Yeah, and so Nelson City, a great place to invest. That's fun, isn't it? Or is it? And I just want to pose that question. Um, five positives that I see in investing in Nelson. And historically, Nelson has provided good returns for investors. Metrics that we uh, would look at are rental growth, stable or affirming yield, leasing ability, capital growth, and market stability. Historically, the returns have been there. Investing locally um, provides ease of visibility and management. And Nelson is still perceived as the commercial hub of the Nelson region. Uh, investment sizes within the range of many investors are generally tightly held, which is good for investment. And uh, lastly, council is, has tried to be proactive and is open for business. For example, the heart of the city 
planning the past, the current efforts to fire up the CBD. It's been council has been welcoming of investment in our case over years have been approachable to re resolve issues. Rather than delaying, although it's not necessarily a universally held view amongst the, the property uh, community, investment community, uh, and it has parking. I didn't get that on there. It has parking, but parking is under real pressure, and um, I'll come back to that shortly. So the question is, the city and the problem, could it be better? And here are my thoughts that I offer uh, to increase investment for what they're worth. Nelson City is in desperate need of major investment, and that's already been highlighted. Major investment in retail and in office buildings. Much of the current stock is tired and is run down and has earthquake issues. And I'll come back to earthquake issues uh, shortly. The city needs a makeover. There's no doubt about that. Um, and the solution needs imagination. I can't um, underscore the fact that we need imagination uh, in a major way. Tired buildings do not bring fresh excitement and cash flow experience, and we need more. We need a more exciting built environment in architecture and in creative spaces. There's a general lack of customer experience. There's average fit outs lead to average customer experience, which lead to average outcomes. Um, we need good customer experience uh, right through. Um, paving trees do not increase uh, foot traffic, might add to the customer experience. But shopper come, shoppers come for goods and services that they require. The city has the benefit of parking blocks, the main car parks, but it's also its Achilles heel. That might be news to you. This design creates strip retail on two faces. The sites facing the car, car, city, car parking blocks will never be prime real estate, but are only secondary strip retail. And that's half the real estate in Nelson City. The above two factors force the city to be too spread out and creates a long way to walk to reach desired shops. What's more is that with a generally 30 metre depth from street front to car park, it's not enough to, to create concentrated and high value foot traffic laneways. So that idea will struggle too. It needs exciting laneways, a mix of large and small tenancies, an awesome food precinct, and a central key property of scale. As most tenants already been highlighted by Chris this morning, most tenants hunt in packs. Um, and we need them to be, uh, these buildings be tenanted by amazing traffic generators. The retail area needs imagination to intensify by consolidation. This will assist by creating the opportunity for residential projects around the perimeter, and this is already happening. And there is climate change issues, and that's already been addressed. Uh, ownership by small titles is a significant issue, I believe, for Nelson City. Uh, no coordination of tenancy mix or, or marketing. It creates random disjointed precincts from fragmented tenant mix and no critical mass to attract people. Many investors are relying on adjoining owners to also be doing their part to enhance their offer. And sadly, this is missing in so many locations. It's incredibly hard to aggregate sufficient sites for an intensification project. I've achieved it just twice in my lifetime in Nelson City. Both times could not progress due to factors outside my control. I advised the council in my presentations five years ago that we believe Nelson will not see a better proposal than ours for many years, and that is still my view. Unfortunately, the horse has bolted on that one. The same problem existed in Christchurch after the earthquake. The city council took the opportunity to force the aggregation of sites, and the result now is becoming evident in a vibrant city. We don't have that opportunity, but the example is relevant. However, property investors now have the obligation over time to significantly strengthen their building stock. The cost of this has significantly devalued the investment by in many cases up to 150% of the cost of undertaking the work and has become a huge invest issue for investors throughout the country with a significant loss of capital. This compromises their ability to fund upgrades and development. And as the date for compliance draws near, investors may well be forced to act or to sell. The ideal in Nelson City is for a group of investors in the 100% footfall area to get together to do something, that, but it will need strong motivation. If not, then more peripheral projects, such as the one we propose, or the likes of Morrison Square and the peripheral, will dissipate foot traffic in, um, in various different directions and uh, um, won't add to building the 100% footfall. Then I think, well, there's some council issues as well. Investors require certainty of council intentions. The um, 
Kiora development turned off major investment, um, which uh, I've heard of. Also, su other suggested council ventures like the library going further away from the city centre or council officers uh, maybe leaving city centre if that's a, a possibility, uh, create uncertainty in the investment investor and tenant community. Um, it's just going to spread out the city and we need more uh, concentration. Um, those things would be much better right in the 100% footfall area just to build and concentrate foot traffic in a given area. Council compliance costs and Council compliance and costs and posts for development such as traffic management costs are a huge issue in terms of affecting the viability of projects uh, in the Nelson City. Uh, and Council's attitude towards parking over the last few years uh, has been very cavalier and has not been inspiring to the investment community, more a disincentive. Investors need, um, need tenants, tenants need customers, customers need parking. Council has been far too aggressive in reducing car parking. Um, investor issues, um, the economics of replacing one building with another, the same rentable area simply does not work. Even upgrades of property often don't give a return on maintenance costs. So more imaginative thinking is required. And I've talked about the earthquake issues. And I see the earthquake issues as probably alongside climate change, one of our city's major, major issues. Um, if you want an A-grade tenant, you've got to have an A-grade property. And we're seeing already a number of uh, key tenants leaving their buildings because they don't comply and uh, moving to better buildings. But where are our A-grade buildings around town? We don't have enough of them. Current times and seasons, uh, that's the retail and financial climate are not conducive to major build, new build initiative or investment now unless there are unique opportunities. And they're still there. Um, Remember, investors make decisions about investments, not professionals, ideologists, or advisors to the council. Too many punitive conditions will deter investors and send them elsewhere. Those who will shape the built future of the city and be enticed to invest here require the right business and economic environment to do so. <clears throat> investment is not an altruistic uh, activity, but must produce rewards for those who take risk. No reward, no investment. Full stop. However, I fear that Nelson has not deteriorated enough for investors to sit up and take notice that they need to take action. And we may need to see the city deteriorate further before real action will happen. So in conclusion, council needs to create certainty, needs to review its charges, needs to stop eroding the number of car parks and may need to invest capital. And we've seen that in Invercargill where the council invested in, uh, in a major inner city project and um, that may well need uh, some stimulation from uh, and assistance from council to um, to make things happen. And also de a deteriorating retail environment uh, that we're all in requires significant imagination, risk-taking and investment in real estate to turn the city around by replacing current stock and potentially intensify the offer to create some exciting spaces or a better customer experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And last but not least, Justin. Oh, well, who sure had to follow all that? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, kia ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tātou katoa, uh, nō whanganui a hau, nō rau pehu, uh, toko mana, uh, e nai nei no pokatu, ko Justin Candish, toko ingoa. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the City Realise uh, Revitalisation Summit. Um, obviously, I'd like to acknowledge... Um, uh, our, our mayor and um, deputy mayors, um, and uh, so originally, I'm originally from Wanganui. I started my career in the construction as an apprentice at the age of 18. Um, once qualified, I uh, did my OE, went to London for five years, and had the opportunity to train as a as a project manager. Returned back to New Zealand briefly, um, worked in Christchurch um, before relocating to Nelson with my wife and young family. I've uh, been Managing Director of Scott Construction for the last 18 years. Um, we're a locally owned company uh, with a proud history in this, Nelson dating back to 1970. Our focus has mainly been on the top of the South Island um, and we currently employ around 150 people across a range of uh, sectors in our industry. Um, being a resident of Nelson for the last 20 years, um, I've been, we originally lived in Stoke and now in the city centre. Uh, I have a passion for the city I call home, or now call home, um, and I want to see it re revitalised. 
and people working and living and enjoying the environment that's there to offer in our community. We feel very fortunate um, to live in the city. Um, in my opinion, the growth of Nelson has, has slowed significantly over recent years. When I moved here, there was a, there a number of large projects that were happening and re energizing the city. NMIT constructing new buildings, um, and they had a great growth program going on. Saxton Fields was being redeveloped, um, which was which was fantastic. Um, Theatre Royal was 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 being uh, given a big makeover. Walker Two were building buildings flat out, including their new headquarters. There was heaps of discussion about uh, convention centre, performing arts centres, new hotels, and I thought, geez, I've come to a really good place. This is going to be fantastic for construction. Um, the focus on apartment living was mainly along the waterfront, although there were some some neat projects happening in town um, around slightly higher density um, living. I guess where we're looking at Nelson now, um, it's apparent that the regions around us have have leapt ahead of us, and um, you know, looking at obviously listening to some of the stats this morning, not alone with that thinking. Um, in terms of housing intensification as well as investments in building and infrastructure, um, we do a bit of work over in Marlborough, and I guess if you if you look at what's what's happened over there, it's quite phenomenal, and I was quite surprised to see just how far ahead um, I guess Marlborough is, and I think part of that has been the uh, uh, council investment in, in their civic buildings and um, really getting behind what's happening there, and the council being quite innovative in terms of even becoming a developer where they need to at times. Um, if uh, you know, development's not happening, they have jumped in and done that um, and facilitated that, which I think is something we could do a lot more. Um, and of course, if we look 20 minutes down the road to Richmond, we certainly see the, the growth in that area. I guess, um, you know, with Richmond, it's got the benefit of having a lot more greenfield sites, um, a lot of area to spread out. Whereas in, obviously in the city, we're, we're focused on brownfield redevelopment. Um, the inner city is quiet. Um, you know, certainly living in town over last winter, I was sort of blown away at how quiet it was, to be honest. Um, the availability of, of high quality commercial space um, and affordable inner city living is limited. I think a key goal should be to boost this central city population uh, in order to be revitalising it. We've got here one. I just thought I'd just go through a couple of projects that we've we've been doing in the last couple of years um some of you will will know these um so this was a bit um on the old car park on on trafalgar square um now that was a quite a neat um council initiative just a little bit of water somewhere. dry it out um that was a neat council initiative i thought um basically the the land was was put up as a as an RFP out to the construction industry or development industry to say, look, we've got a um, piece of land here that's currently underutilised. We they were very prescriptive around what what council was after there. They wanted between twelve and twenty apartments. There was new urban planning um, input into it, a design around how the uh, how the apartments should look, and uh, in terms of addressing the street. Um, and uh, and that sort of thing. So I guess it was it was quite a neat process. We had to put in a a price to buy the land, but and a proposal on what we might do with that bit of property. So it was quite a neat neat project. We set up a syndicate, um, but with with a builder, obviously ourselves, an architect, um, engineer, and and um, an accountant. So basically, we were trying to get people that could be involved in the project and could benefit from the project, but also also um, had a passion for. For what's going on? So that that was a neat project, which created uh, seventeen um, houses in in Nelson CBD. I guess um, that was one of the projects under the under the SHA um, scheme, and which was, in my mind, a great tool to get things done. Unfortunately, we that's we're still riding the wave of a few of those projects, but they're nearly over. Um, so yeah, a little bit about Scott. So so as I said, we're 50 years, 150 employees. Um, we do civil, commercial, residential construction, housing identification, um, social housing, retirement, um, work for private developers and high-end architectural. 
about 30% of our workload is, is relates to development. So whether it's uh, developers, um, external developers doing investing in Nelson and wanting to do work or whether it's um, some of it is, is our own developments as well. Um, some of our staff there. So we employ a lot of people, a lot of families and a lot of subcontractors and uh, people rely on us. We've got an extensive tech apprenticeship program with um, 26 apprentices currently coming through. So we, we know a lot about uh, young families um, and what they need. Um, this was a project we did in um, Tahuna last year, which many of you recognise, um, Ocean View Apartments, so that created 37 apartments. Once again, under the SHA scheme, probably wouldn't have happened without, without a bit of legislation like that. They've been privately sold um, and, and we're bank funded, funded with, with pre-sales. Uh, Malthouse Apartments, that was another one right in town, which has um, created another 14 apartments. Um, that was actually done under the under the existing um, RMA, so traditional resource consent, um, pushing the boundaries a little bit there, but um, probably uh, um, you know needed to be a little bit higher in terms of the in terms of the metrics for these these apartment buildings. If you're providing a you know a basement car park and, and you're providing all that infrastructure, and then you only build three levels, it's very hard to get that return to stack up. Uh, it's another one of multi house. 71 Haven Road, um, it's a pretty current photo, it's about where we're at at the moment. I walked past this morning, see th three cranes up, so that's exciting. This one's been a, been a tricky one, um, once again still under the SHA, so 31 apartments. We've tried to really go uh, focus on as many environmental factors as we can here by using CLT, which is cross laminated timber, so the building structure is predominantly timber. So just want to reduce the carbon footprint there. Um, where this one's been quite tricky, you will have noticed that we got up to a basement level and then it, uh, it was on hold for some time. Um, what happens there is you you know you're so we're so exposed to the um, uh, to the banking banking sector and and trying to get the funds to work that um, you know during the last last couple of years where things things slowed down and um, banking rules changed. The, the project got to a certain point where they'd sold down uh, 15 apartments and uh, ready to roll. That was the, the pre-sales requirement. And then we went to draw down the uh, the amount, the banks changed the rules and said they would like to see 20 pre-sales and a high level equity. So the, the project had to sort of go and hold a little bit while we sorted all that out, but it's uh, coming back together and it's, it's an exciting one uh, close to town and um, with great views. So it's worked out really well. Um, Wymere Road, this is an example of a social housing space we're working in. So it's providing 20, 29 uh, social houses um, close to the CBD. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in quite a good spot for that. Um, once again, traditional resource consents that managed to get through. Uh, 279 Hardy Street. Um, this has been a really neat little project. This is an example of, of, of taking a existing building and revitalising it. Um, the owners of that building have had it from the start. They actually built it back in the 80s and um, they wanted to create a mixed use model. So it's got um, restaurants in the bottom and then converted the top two floors into into uh, living, which is which is really neat. It's, it's uh, sort of um, hard, to, hard to achieve. It's expensive. Um, by the time you look at the structural strengthening and uh, all the things you've got to do with it. But, um, but I think more of this mixed use would be would be great um, in town. That's the rest of it. Um, some of these projects on Nalan Road, this is a little bit outside the town, of course, but it could apply to the wood. But I guess it's um, trying to get uh, uh, terraced housing and um, multiple multi-unit housing to work really well. Uh, once again, this is probably another one that wouldn't have gone through without the SHA. Florence Street's a similar, similar model. Um, the retirement sector, we're working a lot on the retirement sector. So we have Oliver States and, and Somersets that we've been building over the last few years. I sort of feel when I look at some of those environments, the, the terraced housing and the multi-unit housing and the way it's all clustered together quite well with open green spaces and and areas to, you know, um, like for facility buildings and um, club buildings and things like that seem to seem to work quite well. It almost seems like, a you know, quite a great place to 
to live and a, and, a, and a good way to live, perhaps as a community. So I could see some of these rest homes in, in the future, perhaps even becoming um, becoming uh, the way we might sort of live as well. Um, so some are set. So yeah, really, that's that's us. Um, yeah, I'll have a seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. All right, so there was a lot of information to digest. I've been scribbling down notes. Uh, I think my first question is really around, if I was just to talk to you for, I'd think that there was a universal agreement that council should be investing in the city. Um, yet, on the other hand, my experience has been every proposal council has ever made to invest in the city has been equally met with significant backlash. And I'm interested how you think that conversation could be navigated around that civic side of investment of how we can overcome the immediate and, and initial backlash to from the public to spending significant sums of money. Um, please. <laughs> Would one of the um, things is to frame the conversation in around what spending looks like. So to an, to the layman on the street, you say, we're going to spend $30 million on something, they go, oh, $30 million. But in reality, when you look at the public spending within Nelson City Council and, and any other council around the world, it's it's actually quite a low um, exposure that you've got. And also the other part of it is that your long-term lending space in um, from a council's point of view, is significantly better than uh, than a commercial enterprise's lending space. Therefore, you know, talking in and around that with the public hopefully might engage with the kind of resonate with them to say, actually, well, you know, spending thirty million dollars on a, um, a a civic centre, a new library, or something along those lines is a very good thing to do, and isn't exposing the council to. Uh, an abnormal degree, but also then leading on, which you do deliver quite well, is talking about the pros of that development into the future, which, you know, you express that extremely well. Ian, I'm, I'm interested in your experience with Upper Trafalgar Street, where obviously uh, when the submissions were opened for whether or not that should be closed permanently, um, the percentage was heavy, very heavily weighted against closing it. Um, Looking back now, I think most people would say that actually that was the right decision. What was your experience of that? And, and what do you think there is to learn from that project? Um, I think a lot of it is about vision. And it's just having that vision in the first place, seeing like, how could that work? Um, and I think even though there was, you know, quite a bit of, uh, of, of pushback, um, I think I think we work really hard as a, as a group of businesses to say, actually, we want to give this a go and we need the council support on that. Um, and it, it's been a long, it was a long journey to actually get from the that initial idea to it being uh, in place. And it's been another kind of long journey to get it up to the standard it is now. Um, but I think it is about, it is about vision and going back to operator investment, you want to invest in a place um, where you know it's going to be vibrant and attractive uh, and and that people are going to want to come to. Uh, and I think uh, Chris touched on it around, you know, having having a, a group of, of businesses, like, like-minded businesses and similar businesses together is actually pretty powerful mm. so that we can kind of invest together in partnership with, with, uh, with council and landlords. Steve, yeah, yeah my, my uh, background and my comment, I guess, was... Uh, uh, the scale of investment that are required to create a significant development in the inner city area um, is beyond most people, obviously. And um, I think if council were to partner with them rather than do it themselves and forming a part of an investment team, because it's probably going to take some sort of significant syndicate. I'm I'm also interested in your comments around, um, you know, and it was shared, uh, the, the need for the CBD to have a facelift. Um what does that look like and how do we 
trade off some of those those trade offs around. You know, you talked equally about parking, um, but we've also had from the public many requests for for further sort of footpath space, more um, more out on street dining, those sorts of activities as well. So, how do we work our way through and find a balance there? Really, I'm just looking for easy answers. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is like cheating on a test. <laughs> yeah, never easy, but uh, I think you try and buy whatever cheap space you can find to turn into parking rather than, and council has such peripheral sites, um, rather than selling them off, liquidating them, they should be turning them into parking, in my view, uh, to uh, to compensate what is lost from the inner city area. And Because I, I like I like footpaths, and I like dining on the, on the street yeah. and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's a matter of finding those, uh, those cheaper pieces of, Pockets of land that you can buy for parking. Just on your your very interesting comment, the one that I haven't necessarily heard posited uh, around the impacts that the central parking squares have on on that value of of those buildings mm -hmm. um, and and that retail space. You know, what does transformation there look like? Does that does that look like transforming some of those car parks into? And and offsetting them elsewhere, but actually transforming them. Well, where were you going with that thought? Well, an ideal world, I think you'd try and uh, move either of the car parks east or west, and get more retail depth, which means buying cheaper land on the uh, on the peripheral, and selling off the higher value land into into development. Um, Justin, I'm. I am interested. One of the conversations we have, and we saw all those um, stats around growth out into Tasman, and, and particularly housing growth leading then um, that mix of retail and commercial investment uh, over the very invisible line that separ separates us. Um, with your experience in, in sort of doing vertical development, is how will it stack up? Will we see infill? development will we see that sort of repurposing of buildings into um, accommodation if we have this sort of large access to cheap land out onto the Waimea Plains is, is that a barrier that you see for um, our upwards development not really I think I think what people you know there's, there's, there's a lot of people that do want to live in the CBD and I think there's it's great to be able to provide these options for them to be able to do so I guess what's worrying me is we're sort of building, we're building the high end stuff, um, and we're also building sort of the KO type stuff. It's not we're not really dealing with the kind of middle range and, and people starting out and and uh, and how, how do we get how do we get it a bit more affordable? So to be able to do that, we've got to have a bit more scale. So we've got to have a bit more land. Um, just down in Christchurch at the weekend, um, and just having a look around that eastern eastern frame and. You know the three level walk up type scenarios um, kind of seem to be seem to be working quite well. You know they haven't got the lifts and the compliance. But they're uh, kind of low rise with the occasional five or six level kind of building as well. So I guess and I guess, I guess one of the challenges and um, Steve touched on it was was just that the land's been tightly held mm -hmm. over the years. You know there's there's lots of pockets of family trusts that have owned things for a couple of generations and the current generation can't be bothered doing anything with it. So it just sort of sits there, you know. So there's a lot of that going on. So how do you actually start to cluster that up? The other thing I'd say is the council has, has a lot of land around the place. And as I say, Bets was a great example of of releasing something that that was going to create something for the town. So I guess identifying those those er those pockets of land that perhaps um, council could uh, could look to release or partner with or um, Perhaps lead the way, and 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 I'd just echo that. Yeah, this, these civic buildings are important. They, you know, they are. It is essential that we we have things for people to come to. Um, a lot of our staff are, are quite uh, quite quite young. They've got young families, and you know, not many of them actually live in the CBD. Um, they they're all out in they're all out in, in Richmond or Stoke. And what's the reason for them to travel in in the weekend? On, you know, on a Sunday to do something. You know, if there's no, and I've pulled what. Um, Nick's talking about with with the parks and bits and pieces as well, because um, I think you know we do need that. What's the reason? To, what's the reason to go into Nelson? Um, we want to. We need to sort of keep 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 doing that. Yeah, mm. uh, we. It was touched on and and in our sort of pre panel discussion also talked about climate change and, and the risks that it presents and and so obviously council has released it's pretty detailed modelling of where we think hazards will arise should nothing change. 
you know, Andrew, you you're obviously pushing for a a solid answer. Um, there is, yeah, and and I and I appreciate that. Uh, I guess my my question is around how do we give and and how do we provide a solid answer like that sort of investment because fundamentally from a council side it's an investment question of how much money do we spend to protect um and what role do you think developers play in that conversation um around sort of the ultimate value not just the present value of land that you're protecting but the future value of land that you may be protecting I think land values naturally increase on a 12 to 15 year basis. It's um, fairly regular in that attribute. So calculating that out into a future time frame is actually, you can make a, a reasonable guess, you'll be millions of dollars out of it in, in reality, but you can get, give a good estimate. And then you look, you look at what an approach to the city center might look like if we choose certain paths. So, if we look to say, well, we need to invest in um, um, uh, tidal surge defences um, over the next hundred years, well, that can easily be viewed as how much is it for a rate, you know, individual rate payer over a long period of time. How much is that equivalent to the value of the property that you're going to protect in a hundred years' time as well? And I mean billions of dollars of assets in the in the city now imagine what that value is going to look like in the future so those investments need to be reviewed they need to be proposed they need to be bold and around the world we've got good examples of other locations around the world where stormwater tidal protection and um defenses against um rising um, tides has worked really well and we'd certainly not the only people in the world on, in this boat. So we can look over the fence and see what others are doing and move forward. Um, because the alternative is indecisiveness and the alternative is that the, uh, uh, you know, within the Climate Change um, Act, it's got managed retreat as one of the topics. And that for me is not a palatable um, route. Yeah. Because right now, the place we're sitting in right now, do we manage to retreat from here? And in which case, where does it go? Into the hills? There's not enough space. So we need to make those decisions now, and we need to be decisive on them. I'm I'm going to quickly chuck off my hat as Deputy Mayor and just keep the panellist chair hat on for this next question, which is, it was touched on plans that, you know, heart of the city um, and various projects that had been proposed, um, and they're not followed through, you know, things like uh, the sort of Performing Arts Conference Centre. If I, or taking that hat off, if the council said to you, yeah, we're going to protect the city centre and we'll start work on protections 30 years from now, is there a trust gap there? You know, from an investment perspective, what would actually be required to give you the confidence that that would be followed through on? Needs to be, getting really tough yeah. here. Well, it needs it needs to, it needs to be put in you know put down in in policy and and clear and directive, and ensure that the wording is specific enough to give confidence that we can all move forward as a society, as a as a um, a group of people working every day in the city to say actually you know the work the mahi we are going to put into um, developing a new site. Um, near to the coast is going to really work. Um, it's a very vital. Steve, you chuckled. Up. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, uh, obviously, uh, we have a, a much longer time horizon than what I do. I, I work on a shorter horizon, you know, measured in years rather than uh, uh, long term. So, um, uh, what would give me the confidence? I'm not sure. And I, a question, final question from me for all, all the panellists, which is it's, there were sort of some key themes that came up and, and it also came up in our economic data, which was, you know, we've got issues with housing that's flowing through to our ability to attract sort of that, uh, what was the great term used, our operating entrepreneurs in, um, 
we've got challenges in the retail space, we've got this changing environment, we've got the potential for council investment, for the need to give a, a facelift to the city, you know, where do we start? Um, if, if each of these pieces are, are impacting one another um, and, and there's sort of the fingers being pointed in, in various directions, where do we actually start to unpick this? Um, what, are, what are our first steps here? We have a meeting like this today. Oh, it's the first step. <laughs> and you know, at the end of the day, Rohan, it's um it's having that dialogue and maybe finding a route to continue having this dialogue between all of us um on a more regular basis. And I know this has been visited so many times before, and you've got archives that you've all found that show of ideas that the city has wanted to do. Um we found some in some deep in some of our archives of ideas that have been floated around that just never got off the ground. So do we need to be brave and bold and move forward on some of these things? The bridge to better is one key thing. I just think it's brilliant. So let's hope that doesn't fall through. We've got to make sure that it does happen. Yeah. I think from my perspective, um, I understand that we've got to kind of look long-term and, and we've got to look at those big, big issues. Um, but uh but we haven't got 10 years we haven't got five years in terms of revitalizing the city we've got some based on those stats we've got some blue flashing light stuff to deal with so i think i'm looking for and we've got a lot of wisdom in this room and i think what i'm looking for is what are the what are the easier lower cost quick wins that this city can put into place like in a year or two because if we don't do that um, uh, hospitality and retail offering is just going to diminish rather than grow. I came back to the point about certainty and uh, council deciding what they're going to do with their own accommodation and what they're going to do with the library will then determine you know, where things will go. Whether it's going out of town, well, that's going to change the nature if it's going in central city. Um, people will start to get some confidence and say, well, yeah, I've got confidence that's going to happen. I can now think around it and start planning around that because that's where the opportunity will arise. Justin? Uh, yeah, I echo this certainty thing. I, I guess when, um, so we we buy a bit of land or we, we we work with a developer to identify an area and we think, yeah, we can get that to happen. It's a bit like a lottery. You've 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 you've, you've put you've bought it, um, or you might be some DD. You might have a little bit of time to to perhaps talk to people at council. By the time you work your way through every department to try and understand who might oppose it or whether it's a, 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 an opportunity or not. Um, I'd, I'd like to see um, you know, one point of contact that we could go to that really that that will give us an answer. You know, is this, is this viable or not viable? Because you've got so many moving parts in terms of development and, you know, a lot of it is going to come down to the to the return, the commercial return of the financial um, side of it. How is it going to work? How is it going to be funded? And I guess um, it's, a, it's a big risk to... To just um, to go in there um, almost blind, which is kind of how we sometimes do it. So um, certainty is a big thing, and 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 um, just yeah, I guess understanding. I, I see, you know, with the plan change, you can see what what's trying to happen there. Um, so I guess I guess we're moving in in a, in a direction where there's um, we're trying to get that, but uh, but it is uh, it is quite difficult to make it stack up. In all honesty, yeah. Well, the good news is our chief executive is busy scribbling notes. Um, <laughs> he wasn't in that moment, which was a poor bit of timing, but uh, yeah. it's all we have time for for this particular panel. Can we have a huge round of applause for our panelists? I, I think, if anything, we, this has been a, a clear demonstration um, that... There is a conversation to be had and that having that conversation is going to be fruitful. And so I think that theme around continuing this and, and finding those actions is really at the heart of what today is about. So thank you all. Uh, it's now time for morning tea. Uh, so we've got until 11, but we're going to be starting back here at 11 sharp. So if you hear me on the microphone sort of whispering, come back to your seat, come back to your seat. That is why. Uh, but there's some Kai at the back. Um, grab a coffee, refuel. Keep these conversations going and we'll be back at 11. Kia ora. All right. So this next panel, we've got a very 
talented lineup um, for an exciting conversation around Nelson as a great place for talent, knowledge, and technology. Um, and so really exploring what is the story we're putting out to the rest of the country and to the world, um, and how can we, uh, sort of building off of that conversation um, and that last panel around our operating entrepreneurs, uh, bringing that younger generation of uh, fresh ideas and fresh talent, of which we've got some on stage, uh, or I'd say all of them on stage uh, represent that. Um, but I'll hand across first to Olivia um, to give a bit of a kōrero to kick us off. All right. Or wherever you want. Kabai. Uh, tēnā tātou, he makupuna tēnei o tētou i hua te waka a Māori, mihi a tēnei ki a koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Olivia Hall and I am Executive Director, uh, Regional Executive Director of Te Pukinga uh, uh, with responsibilities for leading NMIT. Just in case you're worried that I'm a bureaucrat uh, based in Wellington uh, as part of a centralised function, don't worry. I live in central Nelson and have lived here for a very long time, including working at NMIT. I do have a very short presentation that someone's directed me to a clicker. Just to um, uh, quickly touch on NMIT, what we're already doing and what we should be doing and what we need to have from our region to be able to do more better. Um, so very quickly, NMIT, 120 years. Uh, we have four campuses. Our largest one by far is in Nelson. Uh, last year, we had nearly 7,000 learners. We deliver a lot of uh, part-time courses, so that equates to not quite 2,500 equivalent full-time learners. Uh, over 1,000 of those are under 25. This is a growing area for us, a lot more foundational learners, a lot more uh, low-level qualification. 300 of those are secondary school learners that come for usually one day a week of learning with us. International learners currently at 185. Pre-COVID, we were over 640. We are slowly building up, but like the rest of uh, the tertiary education sector, we still haven't seen the numbers that we had before. We have over 100 qualifications from certificate through to master's level. And regional specialisations include adventure tourism, aquaculture, aviation, engineering, maritime, viticulture and winemaking. Flexible blended study options to support learning with life, including online, on campus and on job. One thing that's not so well known about us, we have offshore delivery, uh, predominantly in China, which brings in 1.5 million. So getting to the, um, meeting the needs of the region through tertiary education. Um, partnership. Partnership is the key uh, way in which we've been able to continue to meet the needs of our region, uh, as well as uh, flex and change. Uh, so we have MOUs, agreements, et cetera, with in New Zealand, King Salmon, White Marlborough, uh, with a wide range of uh, different entities within our region. We also have a lot to do with our not-for-profit sector and our partnership with those is also exceedingly important. We also, uh, uh, alongside the Chamber of Commerce and Nelson, NRDA, have the Mahitahi Co-Lab, which is obviously a hive of um, entrepreneurship and sharing amongst small businesses. We partner with iwi, we partner with our Pacifica community, uh, and we also partner with international institutes. What I did want to, sorry, I rushed through that to get to this bit here, which is uh, NMIT, our learners in Kaimahi, we have over 500 staff, sorry that wasn't on the previous slide, so not only with our learners, we have a large cohort of staff as well. What we can offer to Nelson and to our region is predominantly workforce planning and a pipeline of kaimahi staff. We have specialist knowledge holders that can contribute and support our region. 
Uh, we have uh, learners who can add vibrancy and youth to our centre city. I don't say that to, um, to be mean or to be smart, but it is quite something when you have a vibrant happening centre of the city where there are young people as well as old people and a variety of different ethnic backgrounds and a variety of different socioeconomic statuses. We also offer our venue, and this is sometimes the unseen, our venue is used and can be used for a variety of reasons. Um, the Nelson Lights Festival, a number of uh, art exhibitions, et cetera, are used in our premises. Our premises are also to be used by our community and often are done so. And solving the training needs of the region. What we do need, though, is being the first pool of call for education needs. We understand that NMIT will not meet all the, re all the education needs of our region, but it's great if we're the first point of call, because sometimes we are forgotten what we can actually offer and what skills and experience we do have. Um, our learners, the biggest stress and strain on them is cost of living. So that's predominantly around accommodation. So that is something that definitely plays into the conversation we're having at the moment. Um, transport, getting to and from, as our learners are predominantly low socioeconomic, they often have to live outside of the CBD, which also causes um, car parking. Uh, the bus services have been great, um, but if they have young children, the ability to get to our campus on, site, uh, on time with a car park is is next to nothing. Um, welcoming an inclusive city centre. As I've said, some of our learners, um, they, they like to wear whatever they like to wear. They like to be whoever they are. We need to have a city centre that is open and welcoming and inclusive to a variety of different people. They, aren't, they don't usually, we're honest, they don't usually spend a huge amount of money in the city centre but they do are able to contribute in a variety of ways. And flexibility for all the employers in the room. Uh, earning whilst learning is one of the key things that uh, your staff, our learners uh, may need to do to get through. So how, how flexible you are as employers that enable your, your staff to learn or you recruit people that are learning that can also do part-time work. Like, kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Olivia. Volker. Kia ora koutou. Ko Volker Kunst Tokui Noa. I have come to Nelson some three years ago and not only to lead the Cawthorn Institute, but because I wanted to live here. I came to Nelson the first time in the late 90s as a fish buyer for Unilever in, in Europe. And Nelson happened to be the only place amongst my whole supplier base where a um, supplier said to me, why don't you come over for a barbecue on Friday evening? I have one with the family. And I felt at home. That is a very unusual thing to experience when you are out there dealing with vast um, people all around the world. The other thing was standing on Trafalgar Street back in 1996 and looking up the cathedral steps, I thought, this is a place that reminds me of a place that is really close to my heart, Stellenbosch in South Africa, where I've lived some 10 years. I would live, like to live here one day. And then four countries later, I was offered the opportunity to come and lead the course on Institute. Um, and I've come here with um, four children. Um, the oldest one of those is 15, the youngest five, and they love walking to school. I have two other kids. They decided not to live in Nelson, but to go to Berlin. And I must say that after 25 years, having been here 25 years ago, the place has not changed. That's a positive. Um, it is still attractive, but is it inspirational? And that's where I come to Cawthorn. Cawthorn has been around Nelson for over a hundred years. 
um, and was really created um, out of the bequest of an Estonian businessman back then who left behind what is in today's money, $120 million to build a science institute. And he had the vision that science could contribute to New Zealand. New Zealand spent about 10,000 pound a year on science in those days in 1915. Um, and he had the vision that we could do better. Today, the Institute has 270 scientists, technicians, and support staff from over 30 different countries, all in Nelson. Um, half the team is younger than 40. We span sciences from genetics all the way to marine mammal ecology. We work with the agriculture industry as much as we work with farmers. Um, we strive to achieve healthy ecosystems, a prosperous blue economy, and thriving people and communities. And we basically focus on climate change, biodiversity loss, and the food systems. You might now say, well, they do everything, don't they? Not really, because our real focus is on the aquatic environment, the oceans, and freshwater systems. And that is what we are known for as New Zealand's largest independent research institute here in Nelson. Did you know that? That is a question that I have been asked very often. What does Cawthron actually do? <laughs> and that is what I ask you. What does Nelson actually stand for? And you wonder why we aren't that attractive. So, well, I've got a solution for you. And that is what I want to share with you. What the Institute actually does is create impact through world-class science. Our scientists come here because of certain people that we employ. That was a revelation for me as well. They don't know Nelson. They come here because Susie works here or John works here. These are world-class scientists who have come from somewhere else in New Zealand often um, and do some amazing um, science that is published on in um, publications like Nature or Science, very high caliber scientific um, um, publications. What we do differently to many others out there is we connect science with indigenous knowledge, which is amazing because only with that um, way we can actually approach these difficult challenges that we are facing today. It really takes all our wisdom to come together. And I've put leadership there because as opposed to what science is traditionally, well, it could be a little like that, it could be a little like that, we have a bold opinion on things. And we are not afraid to go out and actually say what we think about topics. And I think that also attracts young people to come to us. They want to change the world. And here's an institute that enables that. I wanted to just highlight, this is the aquaculture park out at the Glen. Um, that is another difference, actually, that Cawthron has brought about. It's very much applied science that we do with, for example, the aquaculture industry, working with companies like Moana, Sanford, um, Marlboro Oysters, NMIT, um, Tipukenga has a lecture area there and does experiments with, um, with their students on the site as well. Um, that site is 20 hectares, has only been around for 20 years and does some amazing work. All the sciences that we do basically fit into five impact pathways, dealing with um, communities around the Pacific, including New Zealand. We work a lot with EV, developing their water space to create value, but also, and it's, there we go, and also on the Pacific Islands to help um, nations to adapt to the effects of climate change, deal with sea level rise, understand how to under, um, identify harmful algal blooms and the seafood that they consume, for example. Turning the tide on climate change involves a whole range of different projects, starting from um, restoring seagrass meadows in Nelson Haven in collaboration with um, the Port of Nelson 141 and Westpac, but also now a whole array of other um, businesses, banks around um, New Zealand, a very collaborative entity. To, um, to helping farmers rewild the rivers on their farms in order to mitigate the, the issues that they had contributed earlier in terms of sedimentation to our marine environment. We rejuvenate and enhance aquatic environments. We realize the potential of algae and we secure safe and sustainable food for the, for the future. 
algae, both micro and macro algae, is a really hip topic around the world these days. Micro algae and macro algae lend themselves to producing alternative proteins, producing oils, um, producing anesthetics, medical um, supplements, um, and food supplements in general. That's one of the topics that attract young people to, um, to us as well. One of the um, really challenging um, aspects around Cawthorn is the funding that we um, enjoy, which um, is a mix of contestable funding applications that we send to government on a regular basis. Um, we are funded through the science consulting that we do with um, farmers, for example, and then um, also through um, commercial labs that we run back in Halifax Street. The success rate of these government fund, funds is extremely low, um, around 10%. We spend $2 million or so a year on writing these applications. Um, and if we're lucky, we do get some awarded. Um, we've been fairly fortunate lately, but it is a continuous um, challenge. And with the current um, environment that we face, it's probably going to be an increasing challenge. So what we've done lately is commercialize more and also introduce a philanthropy strategy. Commercialization works great if you've got an environment that supports, accelerates, and, and really enables the commercialization of IP. I think we can do more in that regard. Having a community, being a Nelson-based institute, it would be wonderful to have a community that helps us accelerate ideas. And we have a number, but it is a challenge to actually take them to the next level. And philanthropy is another wonderful opportunity. Having started from a phenomenal philanthropic bequest to somehow engage with our community going forward to see how Cawthorn can move into the future um, with um, philanthropic support. One aspect that I feel is extremely important for Nelson and for me probably the pivotal point around which we can gather is um, the blue economy. And it's only about six months ago or so that nine founding partners, and Cawthon is one of them, started a collaborative um, effort, a blue economy cluster called Moana Nui, um, with a headquarters based in, on the, in the top of Trafalgar Street, um, where we are coming together from science to industry to really create an environment that fosters innovation. Um, just yesterday, our 31st partner joined, um, and the partnership ranges now includes EV as well. We're very proud to have Nati Rara at the table, and we are hoping that others join us um, in future as well. The, um, the um, preposition of, of the whole cluster is that it brings entities together in an environment where there are already 400 plus marine related entities. Did you know that? Nelson at the center of New Zealand, at the center of the fourth largest marine domain in the world with an unbelievable unparalleled diversity in marine species with ample opportunity to create economic value and environmental value. If, if we invested a billion dollars into our oceans, sounds like a lot of money. That's about three days of government spend a billion dollars, we would turn New Zealand into a climate positive country in one generation. From Nelson, we can lead initiatives like that if we really came together around in initiatives like that. So um, what I would like the community to wholeheartedly support the future of Moana Nui, because right now funding is guaranteed until about October. For me, it's really all about just five simple things to embark on the future. A mindset shift from just all over to looking at the ocean with the massive domain that we have out there. Investment into science and innovation, that's where the value is. Ki uta ki tai, I love that um, Maori phrase, from the mountains to the sea. It's all interconnected. And that same concept applies to basically all of us connecting us all. Global connectivity, don't forget that the world is moving on out there. 
let's not just focus on what we need to do better here, but let's see what others do. And that example was brought up earlier. There are many places around the world that face similar challenges. What have they done? Learn from those. And then collaborative models, um, very much like Moana Nui. Thank you. Thank you, Valka. Chris. Hi, um, I'm Chris Rodley, CEO and founder of Snap. Um, I, I I don't have a presentation because I'm being busy running a growing tech company. Um, it's, it's great to be here today to talk about um, uh, revitalization of Nelson. We're a product of Nelson. Um, my great grandfather was a, a leather tanner in the city. Um, it has a different meaning now than it did back then, but um, kind of technology. Uh, my grandfather was a watchmaker in the city of Nelson. My father ran an electronics uh, business that serviced fishing boats. And what we do is we um, produce technology for uh, fisheries and, 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 and food industry. So we've designed a, a camera and tracking systems and hardware that's being used on fishing boats around the world um, to provide... Uh, uh, information that will transform the way that fishermen fish. Our belief is if we can create sustainable fishermen, we create sustainable fishery. Uh, we now run four businesses. Uh, one, we acquired our, our first business in, in 2020, Canadian-based company called Team Fish Monitoring. Um, and so we have offices on the east coast of the US, west coast of the US, we have people in Dublin and an office in Wellington and in British Columbia. Our focus is to literally change the way that fishermen and aquaculture farmers um, market and sell their product. Um, we have large ambition and our head office is based in Nelson. In, in part, um, that's because that's where my family's always been and that's where I have always been. So that's where I'm gonna stay. Um, however, I couldn't imagine moving anywhere else. I think uh, I'm a product of, of Nelson. I'm a product of um, the leaders in Nelson. Uh, I remember going to um, our, our Mia's caravan uh, a few years ago and, and forgetting my business card and feeling like that was a disaster uh, and meeting the mayor for the first time and being welcomed into the city eff effectively as a businessman. I remember working extensively through the time that we have run this company with the Regional Development Agency and growing our ability to, to uh, scale and grow our business with the wisdom and knowledge that has consistently come from our NRDA. Um, I'm definitely a product of our Regional Development Agency and uh, I think three generations now of leaders. We have never been in better shape than we are now despite what you see in the media, these investments are long-term investments. We need to lift our investment into regional development is my message and not reduce our investment. Um, there's a real risk now. We kind of sit on a turning point. There's a bunch of businesses that have come up in Nelson that have kind of been born here. There's a bunch of companies that are relocating here um, and um, Moana Nui and uh, these initiatives that have that have been launched recently are just the most exciting thing that I've ever been involved in in the city. So my my message to the city, I think, is 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 really clear. Uh, we need to lift our investment, not reduce our investment. And the only way is up from this point. Uh, so we're we're surrounded by people who are actively engaged in in growing our city. There's no one here who's holding the city back. So what we need to do now is communicate. The, the 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 success stories uh, to talk about the things that are going well and to um, reflect on the things that are, 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 have gone bad <clears throat> and really um, now invest in the growth of the of, of of this place and honestly it's it's never been a better time um, so uh, yeah I'm I'm, I'm not going to share so much about what we do I think I'm just more interested in the ecosystem, the infrastructure that we can construct in the city to ensure that we see and continue to maintain the growth that we have. Uh, so that's my message, nice and short. Thanks, no Chris. slides. <laughs> and finally, Sam. Okay. Tina Katu Katoa, and kia ora everyone. Um, I'm Sam. And it is uh, it is 
a privilege and it's fabulous to be sitting here in the room looking out here to see so many people who are obviously very passionate i think about the future of nelson and um i for one uh feel like i might be a part of the problem and i'll expand on that a little bit more and maybe you might identify with that as well but first i think it's um quite helpful just to look out the window for a second look at those hills and I get you to also think about what you did over the summer here in the region, or maybe if that's too far away, what you did over the weekend, or maybe over the last couple of weekends, if, if it's too hard. Um, I, for one, had the privilege uh, a couple of days ago to um, ride out at the Wairua Mountain Bike Park. That place is freaking amazing, right? Who, who else here is a rider? Has anyone gone out there? You can see? Oh, not that many. I'm going to sort that out. Oh. Um, now, the pity of about that was there were four other people that were riding there with me. Right, This amazing world-class billionaire's pay playground, four other people. The next day, um, <clears throat> I had the joy of uh, running 25 kilometers of pristine kind of national park uh, in St. Arnold's, around the Loop the Lake. Last time that race is going to be run, sadly. I don't, uh, don't suppose anyone wants to go rescue that place, but amazing. Right, and then I come home and just kind of zip down over. It's only an hour and a bit to, to get back home. And then a um, whole bunch of fringe festival shows, like fabulous things to go to. Now, I don't know about you, and you might have your own version uh, of what you did over the summer and what you did over the weekend, but hopefully it will be some version of that, right? But for me, that's a pretty good definition of lifestyle. And uh, in a nutshell, I guess that explains why I'm here. But at the same time, like I said, I feel like I'm part of the problem. So four years ago, uh, I decided after 10 years on the road with the family, uh, living overseas in Germany and parts of Asia, it was time to come home and bring, bring the kids and settle here, as many people do. Um, we had basically chosen Wellington uh, as a place to live. <clears throat> but of course, uh, at the 11th hour, Nelson won out for many of the reasons that I've just told you about. But, you know, I distinctly remember at the time thinking, ah, oh, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to park the career for a little bit. That's okay, because, you know, family wins, and you've got to make trade-offs in life. This is just the way it rolls. And then as I get to meet more people, and I kind of hear their stories, and I kind of pick very similar sort of uh, traits and characteristics from them, I find myself repeating the story too of yeah, great place to live, but you know, don't go there if you want to change the world. This is just just where you hang out. Well, well, hang on. Is that true? Because it's these little stories I think I've caught myself telling and hearing that I wonder if makes me a part of that problem. And so I, I think that's my first sort of challenge to you is to think a little bit about the stories we're telling ourselves. I think some people were talking about that a little bit earlier on as well. And of course, the facts don't lie. You know, we've got some challenges in terms of our demographics. Um, but the reality is um, if we keep believing in these limiting beliefs, then I think the reality is they will become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, I don't make a presentation either, so I'll see what else I've got to say. Um, I of all people should probably know that um, this sort of false dichotomy is one to be challenged. Um, you see, for four years, I uh, worked at the end of an internet connection uh, for the United Nations, uh, based out of New York. We had a global team, much like you, Chris, um, 60 people across all five continents. Uh, in every conceivable time zone, which was to my demise. Um, and so technology is radically not just reshaping society, but it's re just changing the way of, of work. And, uh, of course, uh, I my background is in technology. I'm a, a recovering technology entrepreneur. I, I feel your pain. I don't know how you keep doing it, to be quite honest. Um but I think there is an enormous potential for, I mean, we're, we're talking about talent. How do we attract and retain talent? People who are 
uh, able to choose anywhere they want to live, consistently choose a place like this. Yeah. And I think we have, I've heard it said before, uh, long driveway syndromes, right? Physically, I think, as well as metaphorically, there are people down these long driveways, and at the end, they're doing some phenomenal things, things you wouldn't expect to necessarily see. Um, and yet, we don't know about them. I didn't know about them. Um, and as I kind of discover more and more of these, you know, people with these these talents that are down these wrong driveways, I am kind of left wondering how do we how do we change driveways into you know roundabouts if we were to extend that metaphor, uh, or or cul-de-sacs? Because um, the premise that we have to attract new talent that's true. And I really like what I mean, Nick was saying. We we really need to embrace a bit of a yes and mentality. It's a common design pra practice as well. Yes and. Um, yes, we need to attract more talent. And we need to really just nurture and uh, almost discover the talent that's down these long driveways because there is, there's a lot of it. So I would love to see how we kind of begin doing that. Um, one of one of the things I'm really glad, Volker, you talked a lot about um, Moana Nui and the blue economy. There are some world class kind of strengths uh, in this region, as well as world class individuals down these long driveways. And so the way to do it really is to double down on what these strengths are going to be. And um, I was thinking the other day. So I'm I'm also in tech, and obviously there's a lot of talk at the moment about AI. Um, world-class kind of athletes and elite athletes use the best tools available. And so if we're truly world-class in blue economy and if we want to be world-class in horticulture and in uh, tourism and forestry, then we've got like incredible opportunities to use some of these tools. They're just tools. You know, they, they do some pretty interesting things, but they're ultimately they're still just tools. It's still really going to be the people that matter. And I think that sort of belief in the stories that we tell ourselves about also how we think about these tools and what we can do. Um, and I'll close by really just maybe issuing a bit of a challenge too. I heard a lot about um, this region versus that region. I heard a lot about um, existing industries and what we can do to make them better. So yes, yes to all that. And I guess I would just add, and can we also think about what the total addressable market would be? So in software, we talk a lot about this idea of, of, of the TAM. What is the total addressable market? And it's not just New Zealand, and it's not just Richmond, and it's not just Wellington or Auckland or New Plymouth or in Chicago. I think uh, we're entering a new era where there's just a massive total addressable market. There are a lot of people down long driveways, many more who can hope for, hopefully come and join the roundabouts and the cul-de-sacs that we can build as well, not just the long driveways. Um, and uh, together, there is there's a pretty exciting kind of playground, particularly in the blue economy, I think, uh, that will allow for some pretty exciting prospects. Um, the one thing, what last thing I will actually say, I, I'm remembering different thoughts now, um, is um, Olivia, I'm really glad you you on this panel and talk about education and youth. Um, and it must be a definition of old age when you refer to yourself as old. But um, the young people uh, who have to live in this new future that we occupy, they really have to be part of this conversation. So I'm glad um, Youth Council are here, for example. Um, we really need to get a bit more of that energy and a bit more of that passion and bring in the backpackers. I don't know how we do it, but bring in more young people because that uh, enthusiasm, that zeal is kind of what we need to um, kind of build a platform for Nelson 2.0. Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Sam. <laughs> I made the mistake of getting a bigger piece of paper to write my notes out on, and now they're just way more disorganized. Um, so many interesting themes uh, in in that sort of opening discussion, and I'm trying to decide where where to pick up first, but I, th I think Chris really introduced this um, from First Retail earlier in the day, that idea of the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, and I'm interested, uh, you know, is there a when you look around, you know, is there a story that we tell ourselves in this region? Um, and do you have a pitch for a different one? I mean, we <clears throat> we make our own stories, right? So, <clears throat> so are we going to tell the same story? Like one of the early stories that we had was 
we um you know we worked in dad's back bedroom and blah blah and all those kind of small beginnings and i mean that's a useful story up until a point but now it's not time for that story anymore we've we've progressed from that we're not um when it's sunshine wages my goodness how many times have we heard that right so so that this this is not this is not it, whether whether it's true or not today is it our identity it's not our identity i'm i think our identity is um our identity is who we're going to be <laughs> in a way uh, and so so some of the stories that we need to tell they almost it's almost like it's like a prophetic thing right who are we going to who are we really cuz mm. cuz cuz we're an acorn is what's an acorn, right? So, so part of my storytelling has been to talk about that, to talk about the change that I can see coming, and um, particularly in a blue economy space. And so, and it's a powerful thing to do. And so, um, I've had um, the opportunity to to talk about Nelson and uh, on stages around the world, and uh, people are inspired. And and so you know we like you were saying we just we need to shift the narrative a little bit and not persist those those tired uh, tropes. And um, I, I'm I'm telling you, despite what what we see, uh, this is the best period for the city, uh, and the future is really bright. So so, is that helpful? Does that answer the yeah. question? I mean, look, this is this is the truth as far as I can see. So. I am also interested. I I often joke that I'm like provincial New Zealand's biggest defender, um, unless I'm talking with people like actually from that place. In which case, you can have the honest conversation. Um, you know, I, I, here I'll say that Invercargill is wonderful. When I'm talking to my friend on Invercargill City Council, the conversation's slightly different. Um, and so I I'm interested as well in, you know, are there differences in the way. That we're telling our stories amongst ourselves versus the stories that we're we're putting out to the world when we're looking at attracting talent into the region, and is, is there a gap between between those, and is there a risk in that that we uh, and I guess I I'm leader this is a very leading question because I've seen it happen where we tell people oh Nelson's great come 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 live here and then they find themselves uh, in sort of constant conversations about how not great our city is. Um, about a month after being here. And so how can we sort of bridge that gap? And and is it really, I, like, I'm kind of feeling like we're getting into, like, we need some more s positive self-talk, you know, sitting and rah, rah, like yeah. looking at ourselves and going, you are beautiful. <laughs> um, but tangibly, <laughs> what needs to change? Well, I for one can offer one thing, right? I didn't know there were, what, what 300 scientists? 300 world-class scientists down these long driveways. Um, I think we just need to act. Talent attracts talent. I mean, someone else had talked about the success breeds success, right? You want more talent to come here? Well, go, you know, your your, your friend Kate works down in Nelson. Oh, okay, cool. Well, what, think about Nelson. So I think practically, if we want to celebrate more people like that and people like you who are doing the hard work of actually making stuff happen, shift the focus a little bit to, okay, we're trying and there's a whole bunch of good stuff, good stuff being done. That might be for one really good and we might be surprised how many how many talented things come out of the woodwork? So again, just really the the, the nature of the conversation, I think, would really help. Yeah, I also think that, um, I mean, people are attracted to Nelson because of what they do um, and what opportunity they face here. I don't think there are many of them that actually realize after some time that Nelson is not quite that flesh that is what they thought. I don't actually think that's the case. That feeling of Nelson is run down etc there's a bit of a contagious element to that that mm. people talk it down um but a lot of the young people especially that come to Corson do exactly what you did over the weekend mm. they are out there in nature they take their kids into these amazing places that we have around three national parks within an hour's drive i mean what other place in the world can actually boast with that and so there's great opportunity here and if we just talked a little bit more about that letting alone what the city center looks like and that that's a little tired i think there's amazing opportunity here and it's very inspirational and you bring the right people together and you create um opportunities for people to come together um then i think the problem almost solves itself and that inspiration that's then born will also lead to just creating a positive vibe throughout the city center 
and all of a sudden there's this need to actually do more and people won't argue forever about should we invest money into changing this or that it just feels almost natural that yes we need to go down that path um yeah sorry i want um just add another element because education backpackers this whole idea of the blue economy being a focal point here just imagine we had a work and travel visa that inspired people to come here and do a blue economy immersion and they worked for a company like sea lord for two months and actually went to sea and then they worked for a marine research institute and then they worked at a marine engineering company or they worked in at mm -hmm. the ai sandbox or whatever but they connected elements that all had to do with the ocean and it's amazing how many people actually love the ocean but don't really find a way to get close to it that opportunity to be to to be provided by nelson um globally olivia i'm i'm interested in you know some of the things you touched on around the fact that a lot of students uh at NMIT uh, pushed out. I know I've got this deluded belief that anyone under 30 in the city, I should know. Um, and I often go into NMIT and, I, and to talk and I'm like, where did you come from? Um, why don't I see you around? And often the answer is, well, we, we live in Stoke, we live in Richmond, transport costs are expensive. We are, are poor students. Um, and and I, I think we're kind of seeing a, a diverging gap between talents that we attract in versus the talent that we nurture at home. Um, I'm really interested in, in your thoughts about how we can do better by that, that homegrown talent and, and retaining. We've talked a lot about younger generations and the need to keep, uh, keep them in the region is actually, how do we do that? What needs to change? Um, I think following on from some of the other themes is around the connectedness, how we keep connected. We have all these, um, amazing spots of brilliance in Nelson. Uh, I think that the long driveway, I've never thought of it as a long driveway, um, but it's a great way of sort of going, actually, if everybody stood at the edge of their driveways in their cul-de-sac and connecting up, it's this different sort of concept. So I think for our learners, I think sometimes we forget to value what we have. It's very exciting to think of things um, globally or in in large cities and forget we have the same a lot of the same skills we have a lot of the same um uh businesses etc etc that can punch it absolutely the same weight as uh, some of those bigger ones or the global ones it's around how we connect up i think keeping our youth in the region is really important and we know education plays a huge role in that but so do all those other components around uh, how they can live how they can recreate and have fun um, and how we can keep, uh, particularly in the Nelson Centre, how we can keep them coming to do lots of activities there. We've talked about Bay Dreams. If you ever want to see all the youth of the region, you go to Bay Dreams. Um, I, I just walked around the edges. I realised I was miles too old for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it is around that, how they uh, are able to seamlessly to employment when they need to, as well as uh, learning in different ways. So they're the ones. Um, and the excitement of how we connect them into the really cool things that are happening, um, you know, IT, blue economy, aviation, et cetera, all these things that they can actually get in the top of the South without having to leave the region. And I just building on that, I guess it's sort of been posited, you know, we've got these long driveways, we've got this local talent, we've got this innovation that's happening here and stories that aren't being told. Practically, what what should we do about it? Have everyone talk about it, actually. Because we come together here, we sit on stage and people look at us and think, yeah, that's actually, I never thought of that. How do we foster that and make it much more a community activity? How do we talk more as council about the opportunity that, that Nelson has? How do we, as a community out there, talk much more about what we actually stand for and possibly agree what we stand for? That, And when put, people talk about Nelson, it is about how beautiful this environment is and everything, now looking at the positives, but also from an economic aspect, the opportunity that Nelson holds 
um, with the blue economy. And I, when you talk about these statistics, like we are the biggest um, fishing port in Australasia, for example, here in Nelson, then people say, really, I didn't know that, that we have over 400 marine related entities here that cover the whole spectrum from research into um, manufacturing, then that's quite amazing. And then we wonder at Moana Nui, for example, who's going to actually pay their contribution to be part of Moana Nui when you realize, but there are so many entities here. And this hesitation of, well, should I take that step forward? Be bold. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly push the question because in your answer, you said, how do we talk more about these things? Um, how do we, is that work happening? Is organizations like Moana Nui the key or, or does more need to happen? Do we need to walk away from here and go, right, here are, here are some actual steps we can take? Because I, I think, at least among this part of the room, I'm not sure about out there, but we'll get to that, um, is, is there is agreement that we, we've got a great story to tell. We need to be telling it. Um, is your so, question more who's going to do it and how it's going to happen? Yeah, I want, I, I mean, want, who's going to pay for it? Uh, I, I think it's going oh, to be a question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think we just need to take more risks, right? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. That's right. And the size of that risk needs to be proportionate to uh, the, what we hope to learn, probably. And I think that's a lazy excuse potentially to say, well, there's no money, or well, there's no people, or well, you know, whatever. Um, and actually just looking across the room, my hypothesis is there's actually plenty of money and plenty of good ideas. It's just what is that sort of limiting belief around our our concern about risk and why we want to do it? Yeah. So practically, I mean, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I kind of said, man, it'd be great if we left this day with like five proposals. So I don't know, 10 grand each, and then we'll fund the ones that we think are great. And let's give it a go. Maybe all four will fail, and maybe one's got half a life in it, and then we're going to rinse and repeat um, because we we probably do need something else to focus on rather than you know talk about um, one day we'll do something else. But yeah, it doesn't have to be. We don't have to also counsel. You guys have got a lot going on. <laughs> like um, to sort of pass the buck back to you and go, well, it's your job now. So good luck with that. I, yeah, I don't know. That seems you know. And then to ask for millions of dollars for you to do something about that too, I I think that seems to be bit of a hospital pass. Yeah, and I think the challenge is idea, times are ideal to actually be more innovative because money is not really out, around. Yeah. When we talk to government at the moment, then the first thing is, but don't expect us to pay for it. So you come with opportunities that don't cost money, but you need government to say, right. sure, have that space out there in the ocean that you, where you can do your trials with remotely operated vehicles or whatever it may be. To start with something that um, that is actually feasible and not immediately costs a lot of money. For me, the first thing would be as the city or maybe council to decide. All right, what do we want to stand for? Let's let's discuss the different opportunities that this region holds and that we want to talk about and ensure that people yep. identify us on. Bye. Yeah, there's a common common saying an innovation, <clears throat> and I, I think it was Lord Rutherford. I've used this a bunch of the times. I actually don't know if it was him, but we'll say that it was. <laughs> um, we don't have any money, so we're going to have to think. So innovation requires it requires lack because if you don't have a scarce resource, there's no need to innovate, right? So that that that's vital, and that's my job, and that's the job of entrepreneurs. We need to raise those up in the city. In order to do that, we need infrastructure. We can't have infrastructure be lacking. We have to invest in infrastructure. It's my job to take that infrastructure and to turn it into something, right? To to innovate around the problems that we have, which is access to AAA developers. So there's a difference between an engineer, uh, um, uh, 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 the, like a good engineer and a great engineer. The difference is 10x, right? So NMIT are raising up great engineers there's been there's been a real shift we're taking five interns a year now out of nmit and providing work to half of them on average um so there's that that's happening in nelson there are changes that are occurring that are really positive but we have to have that infrastructure and i, I just i really want to push that if there's one thing you hear from me today it's triple our investment into regional development agency it's increase that because that builds the infrastructure that we can build on and we're doomed if we don't do that. We really are. It's a backward step. 
And um, and so for me, that's the key. And I'm just going to say it over and over again. Um, but you guys here today. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, good, good. Hopefully you agree. I think one of the good and bad things about a place like Nelson is it's it's pushing one great big agenda uh, kind of underserves all the amazing slightly smaller ones. So it's multiple stories, which is really hard from sort of a marketing aspect when you're trying to pump through multiple stories um, and even just looking at the different panel members and the different conversations that have already come up and, you know, the creative one coming up later on. They're all really important stories for our region. Obviously, I'm involved in uh, Iwi Māori activity as well. That's a different they, they have a different set of stories and history of how they see our region um, and they have a different businesses as well. So all of these, it's kind of the multiplicity that, that's kind of part of the problem if you are trying to tell one great story, um, but it's also the richness uh, of this region. Sure. I'm getting the, the text of you've got only a few minutes remaining. So I, with that time, I want to, I think I can guess what Chris's might be. <laughs> uh, but I want to, I want to give the floor to the panelists to go, uh, give us your, your pitch for one thing. You, you've got a room full of uh, incredible people. Um, you've got all of your elected members here. What do you want? I won't guarantee you'll get it, but yeah. worth a shot. Take, take risks, take risks. Yeah, I, I love to leave today risks. with 10 projects, ideas that are seedlings of an idea to, 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 that can be fixed, it can be funded for you know, 10 grand each, something, somewhere to start. I would love people to all know what the course run Institute is about. <laughs> <laughs> We've been around for 103 years and we have a large cohort of fascinating people with incredible stories and the work they do is amazing. That inspires me every day. Still, after three years, I run into people who tell me what they do that I didn't know, whether that's something that's happening in Northern Norway, the impact of offshore wind energy on fish swarms and, and spawning stock, mm -hmm. or whether that's somebody that works with um, a deep sea mining company and has just been on a boat that was entered by Greenpeace um, offshore for wrong reasons. Um, fascinating. So there are so many rich stories around. Feel pride for this amazing thing that Thomas Corson has, has really started. And is there an opportunity to continue that legacy? So good. Um, I think for me, uh, particularly with NMIT, is if our community and our industry uh, remain, and we've heard some great examples of it, that, that their ownership, it is yours, it's ours, um, how much we use it and help it grow and turn benefits. Um, if, if it's not doing something right, give it feedback um, because it, it is there to serve the needs of all of you and our region going forward. Um, so uh, that would be my plug. So can I add one, one more? Just, just for you. Okay. All right. Please learn about digital. Like our world is changing radically and uh, kind of from the seat I've had in the last kind of three years, it's only going to change much more dramatically. Right. And regardless of what you think about it, um, AI and its broad umbrella term is going to have quite a significant impact on how especially a region like this bears. And so uh, from a business standpoint, use it. Sounds like the beginning of a course. Technically, I'm on this panel, so I'm, I'm going to do an ask as well, which is uh, I had so many more themes that I, I wanted to get through and discuss. Um, so please keep, it's been a key theme of this conversation is keep these conversations going. Um, but can we please have a huge round of applause for our panel? Thank you. And I now have the privilege of welcoming up to the stage um, Anne, Ellie, and William from the What If Fucka Two team uh, to present back on some of the amazing work that they've done. So, kia ora, and over to you.
dynamic entity is constantly evolving and adapting to the mega trends of the day. I believe they're built by thousands of actions from hundreds of individuals and their collaborations and not just the whim of a few. We had a... A community-led engagement process that happened in a makeshift space in Hardy Street and it operated for five weeks in November and December last year. It was quite remarkable what came through the door. Why did we do it? There would have been engine rooms of conversations across the city um, with kind of a public concern and it's been covered by other um, speakers today. But it was tempered by a real love of the city as well. And there was a movement for change and a slight discontentment for the lack of investment that, that locals had seen over a period of time. Our partners were the Nelson Chamber of Commerce and the Institute of Architects, and we acknowledge the um, support of the sponsors underneath. So what was it? Oh, dear me. We, we ended up with a program of talks, and it grew like topsy. So over a period of five weeks, there were 29 talks and 62 presenters. And they, the, the demographic of the people presenting was right from children from Hampton Street School who were busy, um, doing field trips to the city through to older people, um, and they were leaders of the city. We couldn't even accommodate all the numbers of people who wanted to speak. It injected this big... Um, energy of wanting to give opinions about how our city should be shaped and what their vision for the future was. So one of the things we asked people that came in the door, the public started coming in, we asked them to write up one of their ideas. And we put it up on a poster like this and we started plastering the, the room with these ideas. We ended up with 300 citizen ideas. So we sorted them into themes. I mean, and I want to acknowledge this report that sits on your desk is a record of everything that happened in there. And there's things there that are probably relevant for every one person in the room. The themes that we identified, there are obviously lots of things that the Nelson City Council sort of are in their cluster. There were ideas about transport. Um, talking about philanthropy, um, one a great idea that we should have a philanthropic brokerage service, talking about Thomas Cawthron. Where are the new philanthropists that could help build energy and projects in the city? Um, there was a big lot. We had a whole week on the creative city. And as a person who's worked in that area for decades, it blew me away when Julie Catchpole said that they have a higher visitation at the Suter than the Wellington City Gallery, more exhibitions, and actually educate more children. So things that are right under our nose are really, um, we've got a lot here, festivals, all sorts of things. So how do we differentiate Whakati Nelson from other regional cities? I think this is a really big question. So the first recommendation in here is to position, we've talked about the blue economy, but we need to position Nelson as a creative city. We've got this big basket of, of institutions and festivals We've heard how important it is for hospitality, keeping people in town longer. Um, and we've got the creative industries. And one of the inspirational speakers was Johnny Henriksen from Shuttle Rock. He would class himself as the creative part of the creative economy. Now, this is a stat that's just recently come out of the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. Now, we're not talking about fluffy stuff here. This is a real... Um, a real um, important part of how ne the New Zealand and Nelson ticks. So I wanted to just show you about how we get projects going. Um, the Nelson City Art Walk, you will have noticed it around the city. It had 26 sites. And it was a collaboration project that um, was a mix of working with the property owners to get permission to use their walls, the suitor, and these other um, Nelson City Council gave us 10 grand, but the donors came walking through the door because they were thrilled to see our stories depicted around our city. And it's been a huge success. 
Now, this model is going to be adapted for the next one that we are going to run out, roll out soon, which is Art Doors to Fokker Nelson. We have the first prototypes of these up, and we aim to get over 100 art doors around the city to give it a little spark and, and take away some of the gloom. And again, that's a collaboration between these entities that are on the board here. One of the first prototypes went up in Trafalgar Street the last week or so. This is another example of a collaboration. Now, Wakatu Incorporated, um, and we worked with Andrew, I acknowledge him, came and said, we've got a, a development site here. It needs to be boarded up. It's not going to be developed anytime soon. What can we do to make it interesting? And if you walk around that um, site, there's some storytelling boards on there that tell you about the Tents Trust, the history of that building, that they commissioned a, the Ma a Maori artist designed the, um, the designs for the building. Now, just imagine what that would have been like if it had been left as a boarded building by now. It would have been covered with graffiti posters and would have looked really untidy. This was another one we did. You can do anything creatively in a city, like a white-wrapped building that was the, the original eyesight. Oh, sorry, the original eyesight. Um, and, um, yeah. Another area that I think is really important is heritage storytelling. Um, we've got the oldest post box in New Zealand sitting down Hardy Street. What could we do with it? It sits next to a, a, a beautifully restored heritage building. Um, and it was built in 1860. Um, what if we had a postcard campaign that told the stories of Nelson and we all got together? They could be wacky, beautifully designed. They could even use some of the 1.3 million negatives that sit inside the um, Museum Heritage Collection. Um, and I think the recommendation we have, and in front of you, you've got some of the Suter Art Walks. Why don't we have another set of them, eight or ten of them, that tell our stories of ways of navigating the city? But also, as Sam said, there's all kinds of new digital techniques to, to be able to take you, yourself around the city in a, with, your, with your phone and, and new technology. Um, these are things that are short wins that could happen really soon. Now, this is a big question, I believe, that we have, I've just talked about Pākehā and European stories. If we go back to the heritage of Nelson, like, we need to be telling our stories of iwi and mana whenua. One of the suggestions that came through the door was why don't we um, research and designate the Boulder Bank as a World Heritage Site? Now, this is really interesting. Everyone flies over it. They think Some people think it's man-made, but it's got huge cultural stories that, that are attached to it. Geologically, that's one of the unique places in the world, and it's probably the reason why we've even got Nelson here in the first place, because the Wakefield settlement would have cho chosen us. So there is a lot of storytelling that could go around this. There were boulders that were taken up to the head of the Mai Tai by early pre-European um, Maori to um, mine the Argelite. Lots of stories that we could be telling. This is another area that I think we, we really neglect. 23.9% of our residents are born overseas. Now, if you take a walk down Hardy Street and you start at Chop D, which is um, there, and you go right up to Collingwood and turn around and come down the other side, you'll post past 23 migrant businesses that are all part of the fabric of our city. And I mean, if you map the rest of the city, the contribution that these people make and the stories that they bring to our city is something we need to think about really deeply. At the weekend, you had over 7,000 people that went to the um, Multicultural Nelson Tasman Festival at Founders. Right, here are some of the um, civic pride ideas, actually. Oh, no, it's um, William's next, sorry. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, first off, just want to say how uh, really exciting it is to have this happening, this event, and uh, just to see all the people in the room who are really, I think, invested in this idea of how do we revitalize Nelson. Uh, and that was a really strong theme that came through for the What If uh, Whakatū Nelson space. And there are a lot of ideas there that came through on the question of urban redevelopment. 
Uh, and really that idea of how do we give Nelson a bit of a facelift? How do we um, invest into our built environment? Uh, so there was a lot of ideas that came through. So as Anne said, there are about 300 ideas that came into that space. But there's a, I think there's a bit of, big question here, which is how do we actually turn some good ideas into, into reality? I think in Nelson, we're really good at coming up with ideas. There is no shortage of ideas, but it's actually taking that next step and enacting them, uh, which is currently currently lacking. I don't know about you guys, but I'm personally a bit tired of just having the same conversations about things we should do in Nelson and never actually having anything happen. Uh, I think Sam made a really good point earlier about this uh, this question of, you know, what is what's 10 ideas that we can just sort of say, let's kick up these ones right away. Uh, and so that was a bit of a question that came out of the What If Nelson space is that we've had 300 ideas, but who's going to do anything about them, right? How do we actually get sort of the ball rolling on some of those things? How do we keep the momentum going so it's not just another discussion fest that just stops at that point? So uh, what we're thinking, and uh, this is an ongoing process, is uh, to actually go through some of those ideas and just see, you know, these are ideas presented by the community. How we can we go through a process of just assessing those and see which of those are actually really quite viable uh, and important ideas? And so uh, we're in a process at the moment. We're putting together a couple of working groups uh, to focus on particular ideas that were submitted. So. Uh, for example, the urban working group uh, collected a bunch of architects and landscape architects and urban designers to run through each of those ideas and to assess the viability of each of them uh, and then uh, identify the key stakeholders for those ideas and then importantly actually develop a delivery strategy. How can we take this from being an idea being into reality? If it's one of those ideas which, as Sam was saying, you know, $10,000 throw it towards it, let's try and actually get the ball rolling on that. So for the urban working group, the key criteria we looked at was uh, cost versus impact. You know, uh, where's the most bang we can get for our buck? The, other, the next thing is where does the funding come from? I think we're at a real problem if we have to rely on council all the time for our funding. Uh, I, I just don't think, we can't think of that as a limitless resource. I think the funding for these things need to come from the community. It needs to come from local businesses and other funding sources. Uh, there's also the question of can these ideas be enacted via a low-cost trial? We have a tendency, I think, to uh, think of things as being gold-plated. And with the cost of construction at the moment, getting projects to be viable is really, really tricky. But there are often projects we can just do a little bit uh, at a time and just get, get the ball rolling. And then if they're successful, then you can invest more money into it. So that was a really key question for us. Uh, who are the community champions? Are there people in the community that can actually get behind this and back this? I think the Nelson Bike Hub is a great example of that as a project that started quite recently, and everybody's backing that. And so what are ideas that, as a community, we can get behind and push for? Time frame. Uh, we, we can't have ideas which are going to take 10 to 20 years to enact. Those are important, you know, and we need to be doing those, but we also need to be identifying the ones that we can get started immediately. And the last one was really about the X factor, which is just that question of excitement. How do we build a bit of excitement in Nelson, that momentum, that energy? Uh, so uh, these, uh, I've got a couple of the ideas that we're currently uh, looking at at the moment. And as I say, this is an ongoing process. This is just a snapshot of, of that. But um, here are some of the things that we're currently thinking about. One of the ideas submitted was, what if Nelson had a market hall? And this is about leaning into what Nelson's really good at. Come to Nelson and uh, visit the Saturday market. You know, it is one of the things that we're really, really proud of. Uh, and it's a fantastic thing. It's an incubator of small businesses. It's an incubator of artisans. It's an incubator of local producers. And it allows us this place uh, where these uh, these small businesses can, can form. But we don't really have anything beyond that. You know, it's hard to extend beyond that and into uh, one of the retail spaces in Nelson. And I think you can see that if there's uh, fewer sort of small businesses in Nelson or artisans working in that central city, uh, and instead we have, you know, vape stores and mobile phone repair stores, like that's a problem, right? So how do we have a space that we can actually become more of an incubator for our local producers and our, uh, our artisans and so forth. So the thinking here is, well, what if we had a market hall, you know, a space that could be open all through the week, that could be undercover, that's operable in winter, and whether that's a, um, an open space or um, something like the Queen Vic Markets or something along those lines. It could be a new building or it could be a repurposement of an existing building. We have a lot of large vacant retail space in the city uh, where we could do something like that. Uh, and it allows these uh, small businesses to expand from 
uh, from just the one day a week at a store to something which is a little bit more substantial. But the key thing about that is it really brings vibrancy to those areas. And I think that's something we need to harness is how do we bring vibrancy into the retail space? How do we get the, uh, the unique offerings which are really special to Nelson? Uh, and they can be spaces which uh, uh, really have a significant impact into the um, urban environment. Nelson Youth Hub. Uh, we had a lot of submissions to the space about this idea of what uh, what what do we have for our younger people in Nelson? People, the younger people, they don't really come to Nelson because there's not a lot on offer. Uh, so, what if there was a youth hub? Obviously, we used to have a youth hub in Nelson. Now, obviously, that had its problems, but it was also a really vibrant part of town. And currently, that is now a council car park. And the impact for that part of town is is just blindingly obvious. So Christchurch is currently in the process of building a youth hub. They're investing $10 million in this thing. We don't need to do that. You know, it would be great to have that, but we can't really afford that at this stage. But we could do something which is a bit more tactical. You know, what if we found a space in town, a retail space, which we could uh, then convert? This is in Hobart, exactly the same thing, just a vacant retail space, which they've turned into this youth hub. Uh, and it's doing that does a number of things. It creates a place for, for younger people, but it also brings a lot of vibrancy into those areas. Uh, and that can spread out from beyond that youth hub. I think we, we need to think of younger people as a, as a resource to exploit. They have so much energy. They have so much vibrance. We need to harness that uh, and actually try and bring that into the city because at the moment there's nothing much that's drawing kids into the city. Um, Port Nelson and the waterfront, and uh, picking up on uh, Nick Smith's comments earlier, and I, I completely agree, we, we have the largest fishing port in Australasia, but you wouldn't know it. There is nothing in Nelson which is um, really expressing that, or as a member of the public, you, you barely even see that. And at the moment, the port is actually acting as a bit of a barrier to our waterfront. Uh, there's areas, you've got a kaikoura for crayfish, you've got a pavlock for mussels, and we have such a magnificent seafood industry in Nelson, but we don't have anything that we're famous for. We don't have a, a, a regional dish, a regional seafood dish. So what if we uh, what if we change that? What if we had a fish market, a fresh fish market at the port? Um, you know, what if we had uh, industries and retail and uh, public spaces at the port where people could actually engage directly with those uh, those industries? Um, the Auckland fish market, for example, you know, becomes a really vibrant place. People go there; they go to that part of town. Uh, Mapo Wharf. I put this up here because I think this is the best urban environment in the top of the south the Marple Wharf redevelopment. Uh, it is um, really recreated that environment and it's really significant in terms of the economic impact that that has had on that region and the ability for people to enjoy that part of uh, Mapua. I actually think we can do even better in Nelson. Uh, and um, uh, the slide that Nick Smith had, I think pointed out some of, uh, a number of those locations that we could be relooking at there. Um, the other thing to point out with that, of course, is there's significant commercial benefits to that. And so it doesn't have to be purely a publicly funded exercise. It could uh, engage with businesses and industry and the like. And then there are also urban realm enhancements, which uh, was a key part of the What If Nelson space. And the ideas presented is how do we actually make a better urban realm? How do we green our city? How do we have a space or spaces within the city that are actually really pleasant to occupy? You know, what if we had a space in the city where you could actually go and sit and eat your lunch right in the CBD? Currently, there isn't really that opportunity. Uh, and so there's many examples of these, such as the idea of these pocket parks um, or green walls or greening of the city um, or the redevelopment of our laneways. So those are just a snapshot, a couple of the ideas. As I say, this is an ongoing process, and I would like to invite people to just partake as well in this process. If you have a look at the books, there's uh, towards the end of them, there's about 300 ideas there, and I'm sure that a lot of those ideas would align with the various sectors and so forth that you're working with. And um, maybe we can start to narrow down some of those ideas. And as Sam was saying, we can identify 10 of them, which we can just um, hit the go button on immediately and, and just start to get things happening. Thank you. Kia Tata, number three. Um, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial city, this was a theme that came through quite um, strongly through the whole of the What If um, initiative. And um, we've mentioned him a couple of times and unfortunately he's not here today, but Johnny Hendrickson said, Nelson has a really unique opportunity to be the most entrepreneurial city in New Zealand. And if anybody knows what Johnny does, I think that they will see that he is 
really puts his money where his mouth is and he's, he's a serial entrepreneur. But I think that um, one of the things that I did before I came, and I know that um, Chris and Sam will be really pleased about this, was I looked up with my pal on Copilot exactly what entrepreneurship is influenced by and what factors do we need, what environmental factors are needed to make ourselves that entrepreneurial place. We need supportive infrastructure incubators. We need those research institutions and education. Networking and collaboration, hugely important, and collaborative spaces. We need technological advancements and those businesses that are taking those risks. Importantly, and this came up in the last um, panel, we need cultural attitudes towards it to be really positive. People need to be able to take those risks and fail, and innovation needs to be celebrated, and uh, we need to foster more entrepreneurial activity. Education and training, we've heard from Olivia, we know that we have got um, NMIT to Pukinga right literally on our doorstep. And we need social support, again, those networks coming in around it. So if we look at Nelson, I just wanted to point out, and clearly we should have um, collaborated on our, on our presentation before we got together, but incubators come in all shapes and sizes. And the Nelson Market absolutely is an incubator. So if you look at one of our local entrepreneurs and where he started, that's a really great example of actually having that as a space to nurture those businesses and then develop into something that is not only important for this region, but actually for this country, because Pick has now gone on also to revolutionize the industry and they're planting peanuts in Northland. So what we've seen here is from the Nelson Market and from that idea, something that's grown way beyond the stall that's still there today, I have to say. So I just did a list because I didn't have time for many more pictures. But I think I just wanted to really highlight some of those things that do support that entrepreneurial um, environment that we need. The Mahitahi Collab's already been mentioned today and clearly I've got a vested interest in that with the Chamber of Commerce. That's where we're located with our partners at the Regional Development Agency and Te Pukinga. And over the years that I've been there, which is longer now than I thought I'd be there probably, um, I've seen how that's changed and the dynamics of that space has really developed and the businesses that we're seeing using that space are really, really becoming important to our region. NMIT to Pukinga, I've already mentioned. Cawthron, we've heard about today. Um, and I think, you know, Folk is absolutely right. The amount of people you talk to and say, they say, we love the Cawthron Institute. And then they don't really know what it does. And I think we're all, it's all beholden on us to really tell that story for what that, that institute does. The other CRIs that we have in our region, again, Moana Nui. Clusters are nothing new. I, I've been around long enough to know from the last sort of two governments, I think, or three governments pr prior to this one, clusters were such a thing for a while. I used to knock on the door all the time and try and get cash for the arts in Nelson, like never to be too successful. We were seen as being too small. Um, but Moana Nui is a really good example of how that can work. And that just to see the um, momentum now behind that as an, ind an industry grouping is really exciting for this region. That's just got so many great places to go. I've added Bench, and I don't know if many of you know who Bench are or what Bench is, but Bench has recently been opened in Nelson City. It's a jewellery school. And that's a really amazing opportunity for this region. That's a lot of tenacity in that word. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real um, leap of faith for the person who set it up, but also supported by really strong philanthropic support. So seeing this wonderful marrying of philanthropy, of business, somebody with a really great business idea and wonderful talent. And I know the first four weekends that that was open, it only took students from out of town. So already we're seeing some momentum around that. The tech set we've heard about today, I think we see this great energy that's starting to grow. Not only do we have obviously Snap and Chris, I can't see him in the room now, but the guys at Kaimamed and the work that they're doing and all of these other businesses that are really starting to generate some real attention. I also added the Center for Fine Woodworking. It's been going for quite a long time and it's hidden up on the hill. But again, the amount of energy and talent that comes through there, the people who come and stay in Nelson for a year studying and spending up large because they're making fine furniture. And I've also, I realized I missed off the guys at Kiln, so I have to apologize, they're not in the room. But again, the, the clay workshop, you can see where my passions lie, can't you? But I think it's really important because these is, this is where we get that intersection of that arts and creativity, that creative talent, and that business vibrancy that we're talking about. Can't miss out the AI sandbox. I talk to people in my job at the Chamber of Commerce. I talk to people all over the country. People are envious of this. I've been hearing about people coming down because they want to come and play in the sandbox. My understanding is it's only a temporary situation, but who knows? I think it's the sort of thing we need to keep front and centre. So congratulations to both the Richards, who I know are, who are here, Richard Butler and Richard um, Brudvick, for really getting that off, the, that off the ground. Again, it takes energy and effort beyond your day job to do these things. And that's what we see in this, this town so much, in this city. I'm just going to talk a tiny bit about social cohesion because I know I've probably rabbited on a bit. Um, 
I've been around long enough to know, uh, remember things like Robert Putnam at Riding the Knowledge Wave back in the year 2000, I think, the conference that was the Helen Clark government put in place. And Robert Putnam came over and talked about social capital and the importance of social capital for healthy, strong communities to build a really strong economic vibrancy. We call it social cohesion these days, but basically it's that. It's essentially people getting together in really decent spaces to get to know each other, understand each other, enjoy each other's company and experience something simultaneously. You can't beat that for bringing a community together. So I just now just got some nice pretty pictures of Nelson doing social cohesion really well, because when we do it well, we do it really well. And as somebody involved in many years up with the arts festival and seeing the mass parade in action, we see that year in and year out. Space is just being used to connect, to meet people, to enjoy sport. <laughs> this was a great year. I don't, probably most of you remember it. The Rugby World Cup was fantastic. We love it when the All Blacks come to town. More of that, bringing people together to enjoy that moment. The cricket this weekend was fantastic out at Saxton. And then I just wanted to show this because this is a great space showing how the, the, the uh, council have invested in this space. And now we've got private investment coming in to match that through the, the team at uh, River Kitchen. Oh, back to Anne. Another, th another three slides. Found the one in the middle very interesting around as far as generational. Somebody wanted a charging up station for mobility scooters with our aging population, but they wanted a cafe next to it or a, a street coffee cart. These people can't get into cafes. And um, so there are sort of generational issues that we need to attend to. And that's kind of an illustration of the social cohesion. Kids wanted a basketball hoop in a park so they don't have to go home after, straight home after school. Anyway, the question is to all of us, how can we nurture the, this what if Fokker Nelson movement? You're welcome to take the publications. There's plenty of um, information in there. And if you want to feed back to us, you're very welcome. Any sponsors or donors or ideas in the room, we're really interested to hear from you. Because I think a community-led engagement initiative, the one thing that came through the, the door at the What If was that there are huge resources sitting in the community. And we have to just get those ideas up and get the right partners together, and they could start to happen. So these two um, websites for you to check out. Thank you very much. Uh, can we actually just have another big round of applause for the What If team? To... Their concerted efforts um, certainly made our job easier because that is something that typically uh, Nelson City Council would do. And we've had it all done and handed uh, neatly on a platter for us. Uh, speaking of platters, it is now time for lunch. Um, so we have actually, can someone tell me, look at their schedule and tell me how long we have for lunch? 45 minutes, so we are back at 1.15. Grab some Kai, start building those connections, uh, and we will see you back in 45 minutes. Kia ora. Well, kia ora and can I ask people to uh, rejoin, take their seats uh, after the lunch. The session five we move into now uh, is uh, being led uh, by Council Chief Executive uh, Nigel Philpott, uh, those of us at council and in local government are feeling a little nervous at the moment. Nigel comes from a very heavy background in the Navy, and the Marlborough District Council has just announced John Boswell as the previous head of Army, becoming the chief executive across the hill. There is a military takeover. I'm a little bit nervous Nigel's going to start off his session by insisting uh, that we run around the block and do 100 press-ups. <laughs> Uh, can I acknowledge uh, Nigel uh, is nearly a year into the job at Nelson City uh, and is genuinely transforming uh, our council uh, into an organisation of which our community can take great pride. Uh, it's so often in a civic role such as myself that as sort of the public spokesperson, uh, 
you get credit for stuff, much of which has been done by the hard yards. And I know that Nigel would want to acknowledge the team uh, that he has with uh, him as a bunch of local government uh, professionals. Nigel, right from the time when he interviewed for the job, made it plain that he wanted Nelson to be open for business. Uh, we're going to ask him to address us uh, on that theme, introduce some of our council staff, and then we're going to have a presentation from uh, Dean Croucher on some of the work uh, that Nigel has been done in that theme. Please give a warm welcome to Nelson City Council's Chief Executive, Nigel Philpott. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I've got the dubious honour of having the graveyard shift after lunch, uh, but I'm not going to talk for too long. We've got lots to get through. And look, I'm the warmer pack for a more, much more important session with, with Dean Croucher. Yes, I have been in the job for almost a year now, but I'm not going to be able to say that for much longer after next week. And I'm just going to have to get on with it and start own, owning this stuff. But um, look, I fell in love with the city and the region back in the 1990s when I brought HMS Gloucester over here. And um, you know, when this job came up, I jumped at the opportunity to help lead the council and to to help shape the the the, the city for the next uh, few decades. Um, I inherited two big problems um, from Lindsay, and he said, "You've got to sort this out, Nigel, once and for all." And that's Civic House, and that's the library. Civic House we bought in the '80s, and we've not invested in it at all. We've got staff working in quite frankly unsatisfactory conditions. We've got an earthquake-prone roof. Um, and I've also got a library, and, the, and Alec and the team have done some amazing work to, to extend the life of the library. It's um, You're given another five, maybe even ten years of life, but it's life X after that. So, we, look, we've got a problem we've got to solve. We've got to solve, and I, as chief executive, have got to solve that. And I'm going to be pushing Nick and the elected members to, to be bold and to and think about the solution. Is that solution invested in the current assets or investing in, in new? And um, so, look, I wanted, we, we've been talking about this for 10 years, and we've heard about certainty from, from, um, from some of you this morning. We want to see some certainty in the council. So we need to make a decision and we need to we stick with that and move forward on whatever that whatever that decision is. So I took the decision to uh, invite Dean from 22 uh, to look at all the work that's gone over on, on over the last 10 years, bring that together and do some new thinking and come up with a, an, um, a, an indicative business case on what we might do next. I'm really looking forward to Dean's going to be presenting his, his report and that's going to be released to the public today. So look, I'm, I'm looking to get in into that, understanding what Dean's going to present, and I'll introduce him very shortly. Um, as Nick said, I've got a background in the maritime world, but also a business background and plenty of central government experience. And I'm used to working with ministers, maybe not used to working with ministers that are now mayors, but um, yeah, that's, a, that's another challenge. But... Um, <laughs> But I have absolutely no local government experience whatsoever. And you think, why on earth am I leading a council? Well, actually, it's a really strong advantage because I am supported by an extremely talented senior leadership team that have got years and years and years of understanding of local government business. And they are advising me really well. Now, of course, I can ask the stupid questions as to why we do it that way. And we're starting to gel really well in, in that creative tension around, you know, this is where we've always done it. And I'm testing the way we've always done it and sort of trying to sort of shape things a little bit more. So I'm used to leading large and complex organizations and setting the culture, the tone and the vision. And my simple message to staff and to you all today is that we as a council are open for business. We're open for partnership. And we're open to working together collectively. Whether that's persuading the central government to give us some money towards the marina development, whether that's working on bridge to better, whether that's the, the Connings deal. I've just had a text from the um, from Scott and the team saying they've just concluded the commercial negotiations on that. So Nick, you'd be really pleased to hear. I will be signing when I get back to my desk tomorrow the the deal with Conning. So that's fantastic news that that's going to be that's that's now that's now concrete. And also, it's not just about investing in new housing or new developments. It's also about the cricket that was on at the weekend, the mountain biking extravaganza a few weeks ago, which is now being showcased around the world through the video, and the arts trails that Anne's been talking about, the events Moana Nui. We've signed a partnership deal with them, so we are pushing. I've got an appetite for risk. And I want to push this council to do some great things. 
So I might, I'm going to have to get my senior leadership team to hold me back a little bit because I do push quite strong. And, um, you know, and, I, and I'll be pushing at, at the end of this to say, OK, we've had today, which has been fantastic. But how are we going to wrap that up? How are we going to agree the two or three things we need to move forward? Like we jumped on the Connings thing that came out of the blue. We said we need to do this. We started kicking that around and we said, oh, we could do we could build higher. We could do this. I said, yeah, we could do that. And we could be talking about it in two or three years time and not get anything done. But. Thanks to Mayor Nick's leadership and, the, and all the elected members, it was a unanimous decision to move forward with Connings. And I think that's the right approach. Not take too long. Let's not talk about it for the next 10 years. Let's get on and do some shit as, uh, as um, sorry, do, get some stuff done. Sorry. Is as the polite version. But as an organization, we exist for one reason alone, and that's to deliver for the people of Nelson. Now, we don't need to do everything as I'm hearing this morning. We need to be a facilitator. Yes, of course, we need to be a, show some leadership. But mostly we need to be a progressive organization that finds ways to move this city forward and not find, find ways to slow the city down. Now, we've all at one point or another bought a new car or a secondhand car of a certain color, a red car maybe. You start driving around in that red car and you start noticing, oh, didn't realize there were so many red cars on the street. You notice them all. Now I'm leading a city council, which I never thought I'd ever do. I'm starting to no notice those articles around the country and indeed around the world, because actually councils around the world are pretty similar. And quite often those articles are how difficult councils are to work with. Now I see Tim, you're here now. You've made it on your tractor. Tim talked about this one. Where's Tim? You've made it. Only just got here because the tractors are pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I live in Mapua. I've chosen not to live in, in, in Nelson itself because I don't want my neighbours to be complaining about what the council does. So look, <laughs> but I do on the Mapua Facebook page. I see every day complaints about Tasman District Council, and I'm glad I'm not part of Tasman District Council. <laughs> But I'm not going to stand here in a glass house and throw stones at Tim and their council because I know that we're also guilty of some of the things that, that, that happen. You know, look, we have got many different teams, many different points of contact. Some of our processes are complicated. We can have varying response times. We do have silos. There's no question of that. And we need to fix it. We have com complex policies and processes. But what we also have are amazing staff who get up every day and want to do the best for Nelson. Most of them are Nelson ratepayers. They don't get paid as much as, as people working in the private sector. They come into a building every day, which quite frankly is not appropriate for what they do, but they get up every day and they want to make the best for Nelson. And we've got amazing staff. We just need to have better, some better processes to help them work uh, more collegially with you all. And we mustn't forget, when you all get frustrated with the council, we have to work within extensive legislation limitations. In fact, my job description talks about the 50 or so pieces of legislation I must deliver to. I had Mark Hunter, our head of the building unit the other day in my office, just talking me through the uh, Building Act 2004. And he took me through and, and, and went into the subsection and the clauses and every building. It just goes on and on and on that we are required by law to make sure we deliver on these particular requirements. And that's why you probably get frustrated with us when we're sort of saying, well, you've got to do this, this, and this. It's, it's really difficult. But we can have a can do and, and not a can not do. So we can interpret as best we can those rules with it. And, and it's important that we interpret them in a way that we want to move this city forward. Of course, Mayor Nick's probably written half this legislation, didn't you, Nick? Some of it? Not some, this, some of it? Not like that? No, okay, fair enough. So look, um, my first year is about being, get, getting to know the organization, getting to know the team, working with Nick and the elected members, getting the long-term plan in, in good shape. And I have to say, I'm really impressed with what the team and the elected members have done. And you were about to get the consultation document and I really commend it to you. We are in a cost of living crisis. Cost of delivering council uh, activity has gone up exponentially. But what I think we, the, the team and elected members have produced is a consultation document that is really commendable. And I would ask you to get engaged with it. This, this puts some options to you, and you, we need to get we need to get some really good feedback as to what we do. And that process will continue, and my team of experts will guide that process. But I'm starting to turn my attention to transforming the organisation. It's not something I want to do overnight. It's something I want to do carefully and thoughtfully. We do need to break down the silos. 
we need to use technology a lot better. We don't think blink an eyelid about investing 20 million in a, in a pipe underground, but if we, we should we should invest some technology in making sure it's seamless into, into, into the way you access uh, information that you need. You know, we, our website's terrible. We're going to we're going to improve that. So there's quite a bit we could do. We need to we need to improve the experience of the customer. We need to empower our staff, and we we need to learn how to work more collaborative, collaboratively. I can't say that word with you. So one of the things I've been talking to Mandy Bishop about is um, is how we get concepts or ideas off the ground because certainly one of the gripes that I've had um, quite often talking to many of you in the room here and and others is that actually. We do have this thing in the military called a dockyard runaround. You know, you, you've got a problem, you ring the council and they say, oh, no, that's not me. You need to talk to them. You get talk to them and then they say, oh, no, that's not me. You need to talk to them. And you just get this, this experience. And indeed, when I lived in Wellington, I did a subdivision in Wellington and I working with the Wellington City Council, I found it really frustrating that I, I, would, I would do something, work with a team. They were really, really nice people. And then two weeks later, I get another team that said, oh, no, but we don't agree quite with that team and we think you need to do this. And it, was, it took about six months going backwards and forwards. And then I got a bill at the end of it for, for all the work that the two teams or three teams were doing. And so that's just not OK. So what Mandy and the team have been thinking about is that if we had a idea of a concept development team, and this is building on some things we already do. But if you've got an idea or a concept, come in and talk, talk, talk to Vince and the council and the team. And Vince, are you here? Vince, stand up. This is the man you're going to need to know. He's leading part of this, this new work. And come and talk to Vince, and he's going to be thinking about what are the hurdles of this development? What are the legislation requirements that we're going to have to do? Are parks and gardens going to, or transport or roading going to need to get involved? Which parts of the council are going to have put their two penny worth into this development? So we can talk about it. And one of the tricks I know of councils is we're supposed to do everything within 20 days. And at the 19th day, we sort of, we, if we do an RFI, a request for information, that stops the clock. But actually, developers, that's not OK because you've got workers on site. So you need to know, is this going to start in 20 days or is it 30 days or is it really complex and it's only 40 or 50 days? But if we sit down and together in partnership, talk about, OK, we think it's going to take about 30 or 40 days. That's a realistic amount. Let's stick to that and then work together in partnership to do it. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say we're going to fix everything. Tim, I was talking to Tim at lunchtime and he said, you know, don't promise too much. Because this is easy to promise and it won't always work, but we can give it a we can give it our best shot and make sure that we are talking about ideas so that we can develop them going forward. And if there's a problem, you've got Vince or whoever's nominated on that team as that one point of contact uh, to, to 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 do that. And indeed, Ian, you talked about the having a business ambassador, and it's, it's that same sort of concept could work for business. You know, this is about developments, but if we had that single point of contact to make sure that business is, is so as we start to transform the organization, I'm going to need to start to think about having the right people in the right jobs to move things forward. So that's going to be my focus for the next three years about how we um, we bring some level of certainty to you all. So look, my key message to you today is that we as an organization, we're open for business. We are open for partnership. We're opening to listening to what we do well, but we're equally opening to listening where we can make our improvements. And I want to put those improvements in place. At the end of the day today, we're going to start thinking about what we've heard. And there's no point in saying, oh, let's do 15 things. I think what we should do is sort of start to crystallize what are the two or three or maybe four at the most type things that we want to focus on. You know, like the Connings, like the elected members jumped on that and they uh, they were brilliant. We, you know, we said this is an option and they, they, they jumped on and they made it happen. And I think we can make some things happen. We don't want to keep talking about it for the next five to 10 years. Let's 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 as as Pete Rainey said, let's get some stuff done. Um, so, look, we, we are not going to be perfect once we do the transformation. But we want to be a council that is easy to do business with. And I do think um, we need to sort of plan a follow up uh, to one of these sessions, maybe in October, to say, OK, we've had those discussions. What are those two or three things that we want to do? And now let's come back and sort of really crystallize that. So we as a group of thinkers and a group of leaders can get some stuff done. And I want you to know that you've got a chief executive of council that wants to get I've got five years in this contract. And I want to get some stuff done. I don't want to be talking in five years about what we could have done. I want to be talking about what we have done and what we've put in place as a really exciting opportunity 
for me, me, led by Mayor Nick and, and our, our male model down here, young uh, uh, our deputy deputy mayor, who's that? That's his next career. Uh, I think here he is. Hang on, there he is. Look at that. What a what a what a stud, hey? But we've got a great team. We, we we've got a really collegial group of elected members, and and that was one of Nick's aims to to, to make sure you know. I think the last training it wasn't perfect. But it's you know it's not always perfect here, but it is it is really collegial in in the, in the council meetings, which is fantastic. We we work well with the senior leadership team, so we've got a great basis to move forward. But we cannot do it alone. We need to do it with you all. We need your ideas. We need to crystallise those ideas today, and we need to move it forward. So that's my pitch. Back to you. Ah, oh, I'm now going to introduce Dean to come up and talk about your findings for Civic um, Civic House and the Library. Sir, over to you. Good, Toto. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for the uh, warm welcome, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this important summit today. I thought I'd start with just building a bit of connection. Uh, I don't live in this beautiful city of Nelson, but I do have some long-standing roots here. My my ancestors uh, settled here in the 1800s, and my great-great-grandfather was actually the mayor of Richmond uh, in many years ago. So uh, a bit of connection with local government and with the region. Just want to acknowledge Mayor Nick, uh, the Deputy Mayor, and other elected members, um, Nigel and his team, and uh, Mayor Tim from, from Tasman, who we've also done some work for. Um, a quick introduction to 22. We're an independent property advisory and strategic advisory business. We've been around for 30 odd years, as you can probably see, um, providing advice to a wide range of clients across the country. And that includes work with local government. The purpose of today is to, as uh, Nigel's alluded to, present the key findings from the business case that was developed at the end of last year, and to really state the case for why Nelson City should invest in a new library, community hub, and civic centre. The business case uh, really built on work council had already commissioned in the past, but also took a fresh perspective at the challenges council has faced over a number of years in deciding how to best renew its existing assets, how best to meet the community's aspirations, and how to unlock some of its strategic goals, like revitalizing the city. So what is the challenge we have in front of us as a city? Well, Nigel's touched on it already. Firstly, council owns and operates two key facilities that are in the need of reinvestment, the Elmer Turner Library and Civic House. And while they may look like they've got plenty of life left in them, both assets have significant obsolescence and are increasingly more expensive to maintain and have inherent limitations compared to modern facilities. Firstly, the library. Now, the site, as you'll probably be aware, is vulnerable to climate change risk as it's close proximity to the river. The building, again, as you can probably see from the photo, has been extended and modified many times, probably even cobbled together since the original 1950s structure and is in need of ongoing maintenance and reinvestment. And it was also not designed as a contemporary library or community facility. The recent investment of two and a half million to strengthen the building only really extends its life for about 10 years. So at some point, council has to make a decision. Civic House. Again, the building has significant deferred maintenance and the building fabric building plant and fit out need significant investment. In its current condition, the building does not provide a modern workplace for staff and is inconsistent with the workplace strategy adopted by council. There's also inadequate public meeting rooms and these are difficult to access. Now there's been various proposals over time to upgrade and renew Civic House. They've all been considered unaffordable and even with considerable investment, they may result in suboptimal solutions compared to a modern equivalent asset. And while the concrete structure of the building is seismically sound, work is needed to strengthen the roof and to replace secondary elements, structural elements, like ceiling tiles and restraints to remove the earthquake prone building notice. Therefore, a long-term investment plan is needed for both assets. 
In contrast, what does the opportunity for investment create? Now, the continued renewal and rejuvenation of the CBD is clearly a strategic priority for Council. That's obviously why we're all here today. And while this image may indicate the city centre is thriving, we know that as you walk further down Trafalgar Street and certainly down some of the side streets, there are retail vacancies and there are buildings that need reinvestment. And while it's looking better than I have seen it before, we know that's just a matter of time. It can change quickly. And the decline of the traditional town centre is not unique to Nelson. Many communities are grappling with similar challenges. A commitment by council to invest in a new library, community hub and civic centre sends a positive message to the community and a positive message to other landowners and businesses that council itself is prepared to invest in the renewal of the city centre. To that end, there are several examples of other communities using the investment in civic and community facilities as a catalyst for urban renewal. Now, I've captured some of these initiatives by way of example. Some of them you'll be familiar with. Some are in planning, some are in delivery, and some have been recently completed. Now, as a practice, we're involved with three of these examples, Taupo, Napier, and Tauranga. Now, they all have slightly underlying drivers, but they all demonstrate the use of civic and community investment as a way to stimulate city centre renewal, while also solving the practical problem of having to replace existing facilities. Now, Tauranga is clearly a much larger city, but potentially an interesting case study, as it faced similar challenges, a, de a decline of the city centre, vacancies, increased crime, and a lack of private sector investment, while other parts of the city were thriving, or are thriving. Now, I don't think Nelson has anything like the challenges that something like Tauranga has faced. But I think the experience we've seen there is council's decision to lease a new office building, a civic office building, and to build a new community hub and library is sending a really positive signal to the city. And we're seeing more private sector investment, more cranes in the sky, and the start of a rejuvenation of that CBD. Closer to home, there are other examples in nearby communities. Blenheim's new library and art gallery. Muchawaka's new library relatively new library, and Picton's Library and Service Centre. Now, many of these examples involve facilities that provide communities with a sense of place. While they may include a library, increasingly they are more contemporary spaces, and they do more than just store books on shelves. They are places that, places that focus on supporting collaboration, innovation, and experience by providing public meeting, multi-purpose, and flexible spaces and often cafes. These are for functions, learning, cultural and community events for people of all ages across the community. In some cases, they are standalone facilities, and in others, they're aggregated alongside civic and office facilities. Just pause for a sec. The other common issue uh, that towns and cities have faced is a lack of modern office buildings that provide contemporary environments for staff. Again, much of our building stock across the country is aging and subject to low seismic or sustainability standards. And generally new developments are driven by specific occupier demand. So why, that is why we're seeing other local authorities either building or leasing new facilities as they need to replace existing assets and they need to keep place, pace rather with modern workplace practices. Nelson is no different. There is a paucity of larger modern office facilities. Those that have been developed, and there's some good examples, are generally in response to a specific tenant need. So in summary, council has a clear decision point. Does it invest in its existing assets that require, sorry, that require considerable expenditure? Or does it invest in a new library, community hub, and civic centre that provides more contemporary facilities and amenities for the community and for its workforce? So let's look at this a bit closer. From the work that we've done, there are five core requirements identified by council, but primarily a community facility and a library. The opportunity to aggregate these alongside public meeting facilities and council's own office facilities and a service centre potentially creates not only a multifunction, functional and agile facility, but also potentially economies of scale. 
Combining these requirements into a single site effectively means the lines are blurred between each of these elements. Now that provides increased collaboration within council and increased collaboration within the, with the community. And it improves the ability to change and adapt these facilities over time as requirements change. In developing the strategic case within the business case, six investment objectives were identified. These criteria link any decision back to Council's overarching vision and strategic priorities. These were, it's got to stimulate the CBD. It has to support social and economic well-being of the community. It has to encourage public engagement. Support Council's teams to be more effective. Improve our sustainability and climate change outcomes. And deliver an affordable solution. And ultimately, some page. And ultimately, the investment needs to support Council's overarching vision of transforming Nelson into a creative, prosperous, and innovative city, if it's not there already. Alongside the investment objectives, five critical success factors were also identified. In essence, how do we ensure any solution is realistic and affordable? Firstly, the solution needs to be recognised as a community investment for the community. It needs to involve minimal disruption to council operations. It needs to be delivered within about five years or when a decision is made to proceed. Sorry, forgot to click. It needs to be delivered within the market's cap capability and capacity. And it needs to be practical and feasible to execute to minimise risk. So what are the options? We objectively looked at the full range of options across what you might call multi-dimensional factors. These range from a single site or a two-site solution as shown. It could be a new or it could be a refurbished solution. And it could either be funded and led by council or led by the market. From this work, eight options were initially long listed and evaluated against the investment objectives and the critical success factors. Several options were considered impractical or unviable and therefore did not make the long list. Demolishing Civic House was one of those. While the building is in need of some love, it potentially has inherent value for an alternative use, subject to testing that with the market in due course. Now, some of you will be aware residential use has been contemplated in the past, and this may well be an appropriate use, subject to the economics of conversion. Also attempting to fit all the requirements into Civic House was also discounted. The existing building only has about 5,100 square metres of usable space when at least 6,000 square metres is required. Even adding further floors, even if that was viable, was considered to only exacerbate the current limitations of the building's design, i.e. relatively more smaller floors. Also, any option that required council staff and operations to remain in Civic House while it was refurbished were also discounted. The extent of work required is significant, and progressively decanting staff floor by floor, for example, is considered unviable. Equally, requiring staff and operations to be split over multiple buildings across the city was also dismissed. Having teams and staff split over multiple sites does not support an effective and collaborative workforce. And finally, leasing only the office and community hub from the market, as separate from the civic offices, for example, was also dismissed at this point on the basis that a specialist facility like that may have limited private sector appetite for investment. Now, this could be retested uh, at some point in the market. Sorry, it could be retested at some point in the future uh, once council engages with the market as we've recommended. Based on this assessment and evaluation, four options were shortlisted. These are considered the most likely options to meet the core requirements 
and to align to the evaluation criteria. In simple terms, these involve either a single site with all the requirements co-located together, or a split solution with the library and community hub on one site and the civic center on another. In either case, this could be funded and led by council, as it typically does for a range of assets and infrastructure, or it could be leased from the market. Now, some of you are asking, what about Civic House? So why has the potential for Civic House been discounted? Sorry, potential refurbishment of Civic House been discounted? Well, I've touched on some of the challenges uh, about the building, but at least just to explore the rationale a bit further. Many of you will be aware that there's been extensive investigations and refurbishment schemes considered over several years, and I touched on that earlier, by consecutive councils. The existing building has significant obsolescence and deferred maintenance. In practical terms, advice from Becca, who have been working with council for some time, indicates the building requires a substantial strip back to the structural frame and full replacement of the building fabric, the building services, and the fit out. Now to allow this to happen, it would require the decant and temporary relocation of all staff and operations for at least two years, probably a little bit longer. And there are very limited alternative options for staff available in the market to occupy that two year period. So you'd end up having council split over several temporary buildings. And even with that level of investment, as I noted earlier, the building's actually too small to, middle, to fit all the requirements without adding more floors, but also too large for the office requirements alone. So if you proceeded with refurbishment and allowed the office for the office purpose only, then you'd end up with surplus space. Now, council has leased space out previously, uh, and, and that could be an option. But I think the inherent floor size, the small floor size rather, and the building design creates a less optimal solution compared to a modern building. And when you look at large organisations, larger corporates, larger government agencies, they're more likely to, to, to be attracted to a to a newer building rather than a refurbished building of this nature, particularly those of scale. The cost to upgrade Civic House is also expensive. Updated advice from Becker indicates the cost of refurbishes in the order of 54.5 million. Now this involves about 37.6 million to upgrade the base building, another 7.9 to fit out council's offices, not the surplus space. And then you've got another 9 million or so of temporary costs, finding alternative space, leasing it, fitting it out, decanting backwards and forwards. So this level of investment, even if you took off the temporary relocation costs, is likely to overcapitalize this asset relative to its value. And it doesn't provide a solution for the library or community hub. So what is a new solution going to cost? Coming back to the shortlisted options, there are two potential ways council could procure a new solution. The conventional process would involve council funding, developing and owning the asset, as it does for a large number of infrastructure and community assets already. This obviously involves a greater level of capital expenditure to be funded through the long-term plan, with the operating costs generally, the ongoing operating costs generally limited to the ongoing building costs like insurance, maintenance, depreciation, et cetera. The alternative approach is to procure the same solution from the market involving a long-term lease. Under this structure, council would typically have a lower capital requirement, generally limited to its fit-out, but equally that could be provided as a turnkey solution. But it obviously has a much higher ongoing operating expense cost over time and has no asset at the end of the lease period. Now this diagram sort of illustrates that over the long term, the financial modeling generally as a rule of thumb equates these options depending on a number of assumptions. But the initial work that we did for the business case indicated that a council led solution, i.e. council funds it, owns it and develops it, is more economically favorable in the long term, generally based on a lower cost of capital. Now, the only way you can really fully test the relativity is to develop both of these options in more detail and obtain competitive responses from the market. Now, if we look at the actual cost for a council-led solution, again, advice from Becker indicates the building cost, including the fit-out, 
to be in the order of 90 million as at late 2023. Now that sounds like a large investment, and it is, but to give you some context, the indicative construction rates adopted by Becker are in line with the costs seen on some of the other projects. As ever, it's difficult to make a true like for like or apples for apples comparison, but it's in this order. Added to this cost is the cost of land, which has been estimated at 5 million, depending on the site and the site area required. And deducted from this estimate is a notional allowance for the realization from the sale of existing assets. This clearly needs to be further validated with valuation advice and through a market process and ensuring council meets its statutory obligations if it indeed does dispose of any of the assets. And clearly the final cost will depend on the nature of the solution and the timing, but this gives some sense of the scale and commitment required. So what do we recommend? To fully realise the opportunity Council has, we consider a single site solution is likely to best meet Council's requirements. This allows Council to best meet its vision and aspirations to rejuvenate the city centre. It also best meets the community's needs and aspirations on the basis there is demand for multi-purpose facilities and, and the library as we've talked about. And it also best meets the core requirements identified to date. But further work needs to be done to prove this is the case. The other benefit of a single site solution and of the recommended approach is it would support the opportunity to, to repurpose the two existing buildings, adding to the wider reinvestment of the city centre, whether this is council led or led by a third party. But as noted, further advice is needed on how best to achieve this outcome. What's next? Well, to validate the assumptions and initial findings from the work to date, further work is invariably needed. This diagram sets out the indicative sequence of activities. These steps would progress after council has engaged with the community and made a decision to proceed or not. I think importantly, the shortlisted options need to be further developed to firm up the assumptions and forecast costs. And council needs to engage with the market, both initially, perhaps through a market sounding process, and more formally through a procurement process in due course. This work will lead to more refined options, costs and timeframes, and risks being identified. And this work would typically feed into a more detailed business case or approval. And we anticipate that it would take up to 12 to 18 months once a decision was made in principle to get through to a detailed business case. So in summary, Council needs to develop a solution for its current assets, as Nigel touched on. A new library, community hub and civic centre provides an opportunity to solve this challenge and to also revitalise the city centre. More work is needed to refine Council's requirements and to decide on the most optimal solution. An initiative like this, whether Council-led or market-led, is an ideal catalyst for Council's overarching vision. Finally, thank you for the opportunity to be part of today's hui. I think the future prosperity of Nelson as a key regional city in New Zealand is not only important for the success of our country, but clearly for the vibrancy of, of your local community. I look forward to continuing this conversation and supporting council deliver its vision. Na mihi nui. Thank you. Can I thank uh, Dean very much uh, for the detailed presentation that councillors felt was a fitting occasion of which to release the substantive report that's been prepared uh, for the Chief Executive on what is a really big issue uh, for our city. I do want to emphasise that uh, our council has made uh, no decision on the report. Today's purpose is to uh, receive it and to release it and for our community to be able to uh, digest on it. Any major civic project of that sort uh, needs a long runway uh, and also requires uh, a large amount of uh, community engagement. Uh, need to be clear, no site's been identified. Uh, it really is that high level big picture uh, question that Dean uh, has posed both for our council uh, and for our community. 
Uh, tomorrow, the council is uh, releasing its long-term plan, the formal legislative process, uh, specifically for the next three years, but it is a, a 10-year document. It specifically, and we made a deliberate decision not to prejudge the outcome uh, of this process. What the council has done has left the funding that was set aside for civic house refurbishment and the funding that was proposed for a library in that. But can I be very clear, it will require a special consultative process or the next long-term plan for such a project to be advanced. So again, I acknowledge the Chief Executive and Dean for the work that's going in there. I really do invite members of the community uh, to read that report, think about the potential uh, as we, as your elected representatives, uh, work through the option that's been explored and presented to you today. Again, can I thank Nigel and Dean. I'd now like to ask uh, our panellists for session seven, Doug Steiner, uh, the Reverend Dr. Graham O'Brien, uh, John Palmer, uh, Anton uh, Drazovic, and Nigel Skeggs to come and join me uh, on the stage. Uh, this next section is designed to share with you some of the wider opportunities uh, in our community. Council has a role, got a really important one, and those sorts of decisions about Civic House are just that. But if you're going to revitalise a city, there's actually a whole lot of other players, and through various channels, Council's been aware uh, of some of these initiatives. Our very first uh, guest on this panel uh, is Doug Steiner. Uh, he's a citizen uh, of Canada. And the first thing I love uh, about uh, Doug, he's a Edmund Hillary Fellow with fellow councillor uh, Rachel Sanson. But if Nelson's got a future, I am one of those that says we want to be outward connect and connected with the world. We don't want to be insular. And, uh, and Doug gives a fresh perspective as someone that's recently chosen to connect uh, with Nelson that I think uh, provides that external perspective that's good and healthy for us. The second thing is I want to acknowledge that Doug has very generously uh, sponsored a number of international students uh, to Nelson. And one of my passions uh, is that I think uh, this city uh, has got a greater potential in that area of international students, a passion that myself and Doug share. I ask you to give Doug Steiner a very warm welcome. Thank you. I uh, hope everybody can hear me and understand my accent. Um, kia ora for everybody. That's all Maori I know right now, but I want to take some lessons. Um, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm going to take a little more than uh, seven minutes, tell you why I ended up here, um, uh, tell you what I've found out about the city, uh, and I think what I can help with. So uh, I want to talk about uh, how hard it is to decide when we came, my wife and I came to New Zealand uh, about figuring out where to live. Uh, so uh, my background's in technology and engineering. So I did an engineering exercise. Uh, we landed here in September of 2022, rented a car and drove 12,800 miles around this country. And in doing that, assessed seven areas, uh, looked at uh, criteria that I designed around a regional sophistication, ease of travel, uh, medical infrastructure, institutional and community involvement, uh, our ability to affect impact, my wife's a human rights lawyer, and weather. Uh, and this uh, shows uh, where we looked. Uh, we spent a total of three weeks in each location. Uh, and the red dots are all the places we visited in the first six months. So it was an extensive exercise. Uh, I, th I think uh, one of the things that uh, you should know is uh, people reached out to us as we were coming here. There was an article about my wife and I in this crazy selection process we're going through actually in the New Zealand Herald. Uh, and uh, my background is in technology and also in behavioral science. I'm an expert in innovation and infrastructure. Uh, I'm also a fellow at the University of Canterbury 
in Christchurch where I'm teaching around this, but I think people should understand why we chose this place. And I'll explain a little bit about the introduction we got here. But I think one of the things that uh, I found the most interesting is we believe, my wife and I, that Nelson is the most open to change outcomes in their own community. And I think the other things that people don't really think about is how easy it is to get here internationally, how sophisticated this uh, city is. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, and then my initial goal was, could I match the capabilities that I'm finding in the two cities, Christchurch being a very entrepreneurial uh, city, uh, and also having education that I thought we could uh, further in uh, Nelson. But I want to talk a little bit about what actually happened, because there were a lot of people that we met almost 500 people in this uh, situation. And the picture in the bottom right hand corner was uh, a relationship I built with Rachel, who's an uh, fellow uh, Edmund Hillary um, fellow, as well as Sam Ng. Uh, and she basically said, I'm going to have a ability for you guys to meet the people that I think would affect any outcome that you want to do. And that picture is the initial meeting that she arranged for us uh, at the free house uh, over some beers to talk about this. I also want to acknowledge the role of the New Zealand or the uh, uh, Nelson Regional Development Authority and Fiona and her team uh, specifically around the process that got this all started because one of the things that we we're really interested in is finding what we could help with and Fiona basically said she wanted us to focus our attention on getting more people into the city and really uh, to come here and work and learn and those are the things that attracted us to do this. I want to talk a little bit about just the competitive advantages we saw, and then I'm going to get into a few things that we've learned, is uh, there's more PhDs per capita in this city uh, than anywhere else in New Zealand, and one of the highest per capita PhDs anywhere in the world. And I think that's something that everybody here should think about a little bit, especially if you're trying to get things done with people uh, with a very big uh, uh, focus on research. Um, the mountain biking community here is very strong. <laughs> Uh, I think that's the reason the orthopedic surgery committee here is very strong as well. Uh, but I, I think this is a competitive advantage. And uh, healthcare, I'm going to talk about aging uh, people. I'm in, I'm in that over 65 or 65 plus category that you saw at the very beginning today that's growing. Um, we have a very big creative uh, industry here. Uh, there's food. Uh, everybody knows about this. But I also think that there's really interesting perspectives of travel and logistics and costs here. I found out in some of the research I did that a lot of trucks move through this region empty going north after delivering stuff in the south. So I think some work more work needs to be done on logistics. And I think something also very interesting that I found out after hearing all these things about how poor the city is uh, economically, it's really hard to get a res reservation at a restaurant. And I think there's more entrees over $40 in the city than anywhere else in uh, Nelson or anywhere else in the South Island. Um, I also am uh, very interested in education and I'm looking at uh, things in uh, some of the things when I'm going out and talking to uh, educational institutions uh, around the world is how safe it is in this country, how particularly safe it is in the city, uh, how there is an ability to have work and student visas uh, that are bilateral between countries and also uh, that everybody here speaks English, which is very helpful for uh, universities in uh, North America. So I wanna, I wanna finish with just a couple of uh, things that uh, I found three new things since I've been here today, because I'm new, I've only been here for four or five months. Uh, one is there's uh, two immigrant uh, immigrants like me that I have a huge amount of respect for that have world-class facility here. And I would like you guys to write this down, uh, their names are Veronica and Didier Crevecour. They own La Poche Patisserie over here at Russell Street and Haven Road. And if you haven't been there, it is one of the best French patisseries in the world. <laughs> and I encourage you to go there. If they leave this city, I'm out. <laughs> I think the second thing is, uh, and I'm encouraging everybody here because my background is in innovation and entrepreneurial studies, is this is a great meeting and, and a meeting of minds in this organization. And I think one of the things that I follow in any innovation is this uh, process of guess what, so what, now what. And I think this is a guess what and so what conference where people are actually 
bring stuff on the table, and we need the now what. And Nigel, thank you for uh, offering to host another now what session. I picked the date. Everybody write it down, October 15th. Yeah. Thank you. So I think just in closing, um, logistics, physical, there's an aging population in the city. Please use it as a comparative or competitive advantage. As people age, especially wealthy people who are retired, they don't move much. And as you get older, the, your circle and radius of movement gets smaller and smaller. Uh, we can be a center for healthcare uh, technology in this uh, city, especially around things that people are very focused on, such as dementia uh, systems and, and caring for older people. I think that uh, we should think about building infrastructure and intellectual capital, not for what is currently here, but for what's not here. Uh, I'm a tech entrepreneur. I've started a bunch of businesses that didn't exist before, and I lot uh, Sam and his team for coming up with some ideas. Let's think about things that we're not doing that we could be doing here. And then helping for me, helping out what uh, civic innovations have worked elsewhere. And I think we saw some of that in the presentations earlier. Let's not try and reinvent the wheel. There's lots of stuff that people have already done. Lots of problems that people have already worked out with some of the things that we're working on as well. And then for me and my wife, we're here. We'd like to help tell us what we can do to help this city. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Doug is a reminder of a number of international people that choose to make a contribution to our city, Doug. So thank you for your contribution, uh, but thank for that uh, new perspective you bring. Our next uh, presenter is the very reverend uh, Dr. Graham O'Brien. And if you have to ask me one of the worst days um, I have ever had, uh, it was when uh, we saw the pictures uh, on the top floor of the beehive of the Christchurch Cathedral collapsed. It was truly depressing. And I can tell you when the Kaikoura earthquake struck, and some of you remember, most of us in Nelson did wake up, I tore out in my car and drove around the city and thankfully drew past our Nelson Cathedral and it was still standing. Uh, our Nelson Cathedral is an iconic building in our city. Uh, it does uh, define us. They have had a challenge for some years and the cathedral community and uh, Dr. O'Brien has asked to give a presentation on their challenge and, and their ambition for upgrading that iconic building in our city. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. O'Brien. A little video to start with, so hopefully it'll kick in. So no mai, hari mai, piki mai, na fano hapu and iwi, a piki mai tena koto. To me and Nick and to kuna hero of fakatu tena koto. Ko Graham takuingoa ko minata, and to fara nui o karaki o fakatu. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. Oh, this is flicking through on an auto, which is here we go from the very beginning. Piki Mai has been a sacred and central focal point for Whakatū Nelson. In pre-European days, Piki Mai was a seasonal Māori pā and sacred site. With the arrival of English settlers in February 1842, the significance of Piki Mai was recognised with the first communion service held by Bishop Selwyn on Piki Mai in August 28, 1842, in a tent he bought from England. I'm not sure why this thing's scrolling. The importance and sacred nature of Pikimai has been preserved with the building of the first wooden church in 1851. And when in 1858, 
We have to leave this. When in 1858, Queen Victoria made Nelson the seat of an Anglican bishop. Nelson City became a, Nelson became a city before the population was sufficient. And the original wooden church was extended to become a cathedral. And in 18, 1925, your current marble cathedral was begun. It's no surprise that Nelson Cathedral remains the iconic building in Fokatu Nelson, giving our community, as the, one of the other speakers recently said, a sense of place. It's no coincidence that Picky Mai means come hither or gather around, so that the iconic steps framed by gardens and cathedral has become the gathering point for our community marking significant events in our history and development as a city. Our aim today, let's see if this will behave itself, is to be at the heart of Whakatū Nelson as we look to revitalise both the city and the cathedral, welcoming the community into their cathedral home. The location of the first survey peg for Nelson is inside Nelson Cathedral, reinforcing the view that there is no more important, focal, uniting, and photographed feature in our city than the cathedral. Today, your cathedral continues to be a busy sacred landmark, but more importantly, it continues to be a popular venue for civic services, cultural events, and because of our superior acoustics for singing and choral music, concerts, especially those held by Chroma Choir, the Nelson Civic Choir, Male Voice Choir, and NBS Nelson Civic Brass. We are a significant performing arts venue, seating between 350 and 400 people, with 11 concerts already booked for 2024. We also hold festivals, and events that attract people into town. We at the cathedral view the building as though we have no walls, a bit like that first tent, and our events bring significant economic benefit to the city. This past Christmas is a good example to appreciate what your cathedral is achieving. Between the end of November and mid-January, we had over 15,000 visitors to the Cathedral Christmas Tree Festival. We had over 500 attend carols in the cathedral because it became a bit wet and normally would have two to 3,000 on the cathedral steps. We had 900 people attend our cathedral services and over 2,700 watch those services on live stream. And in December, we had 1,700 people attend the variety of Christmas concerts being held. Of those 15,000 visitors, to the cathedral over Christmas, 50% were from Nelson, Tasman, 25% were from other parts of New Zealand, and the other 25% were from around the world. Your cathedral is one of the most visited attractions in Nelson. It's open all day and every day. We have also begun to hold our own sold-out concerts, being a midwinter uh, concert by candlelight, and a Christmas concert, both sold out with 350 people attending each. Over the past few years, the cathedral has invested heavily in its own music personnel with Paul Chan, one of New Zealand's best organists, and Nigel Weeks, a national, nationally recognised music director leading our choir. As a sacred building, we hold three services on a Sunday, along with the Whakatū Māori Mission Service in Tareo and a midweek church communion service. Two of these Sunday services are watched uh, on YouTube by over 200 people around the world, and our main 10 a.m. service is broadcast nationally each week on Shine TV. We also hold community activities, such as being a Hapori vegetable hub for distribution. We have a community care support group who visit people in the community, a craft group 
and a monthly social gathering for seniors. We also visit the Wood and Green Gables retirement villages to offer weekly communion services to residents, along with visits to Ernest Rutherford. Nelson is facing, Nelson Cathedral is facing the familiar challenge of earthquake strengthening by, 2020, uh, by 2040, while, as I can stress, remaining safe to use now. We see this as an excellent opportunity to enhance your cathedral for increased community use, especially as an improving performing arts venue, including movable staging and upfront movable pews to make the, the space more usable for choirs and orchestras, as well as other enhancements such as better toilet facilities, heating, you'll be pleased to hear, more connection to the city via a northern entrance, and bringing a 19th century building into the 21st century with solar panels to reduce our climate change footprint. We've been working on this for the last six years, and currently we have spent approximately $150,000 on architectural and engineering plans to design this work in three stages. The current cost estimate is $15 million for strengthening the cathedral and our planned improvements are yet to be costed. We are soon forming a governance team and a fundraising team to over, oversee the strengthening work. The parish and the diocese has always maintained the cathedral and we will now look to government, council and community funding to joining us in protecting and enhancing your cathedral for the next 100 years. In other words, enhancing what we have and making it better and easier for all of Nelson to enjoy their cathedral. Enhancing the cathedral so it remains the cultural and spiritual heart of our city for another 100 years and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, I do know uh, that our Nelson Cathedral, sadly because of the loss of Christchurch, is the most visited cathedral uh, in New Zealand. And just having that iconic spot in the centre of our city uh, does make that an important part of today's conversation. Our next uh, guest uh, is John Palmer, who for me, in a non-physical building sense, is a bit like the Cathedral of Directors and Governance within our community. Uh, when I first became an elected representative, uh, John Palmer chaired the Trust Bank New Zealand Group, and I don't know how many organisations in this community has seen benefits from the Rata Foundation. Uh, they owe a nod to John Palmer as the founder of setting up that very large philanthropic trust, of which very little happens in the city without its support. In the 1990s, uh, John led the kiwifruit industry through a terrible crisis, uh, and established the Zespri brand, and that kiwifruit industry has gone on from strength to strength. More recently, he was the chair of Air New Zealand, again going in a role uh, when it was in a difficult period, uh, and uh, re-established uh, Air New Zealand as a very successful company. More recently, John uh, chairs the Cawthron Trust that you heard about earlier today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, John Palmer uh, give a governance perspective to the challenge of revitalizing our city. Please welcome John Palmer. Uh, kia ora. Um, thank, thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Um, what he didn't add was uh, that in, in that uh, list of uh, so-called achievements, I also chaired Solid Energy and was apparently the sole reason why it failed. Um, uh, and unfortunately, it failed needlessly, but that's a separate question. Um, how many of you recall that building in your lifetime? Not, not very many. That's the old Nelson Provincial Building, which was a landmark in the city. It's, it was a time when the city 
was the centre of the Nelson province, which stretched through essentially all of the northern part of the South Island and the part of the West Coast. Um, that building survived long after provincial government uh, survived. Um, but uh, what the lesson it tells us is that firstly, that important things in the past, uh, particularly beautiful relics of our past should never be destroyed and that should never have been destroyed. But the second thing it tells you is that time moves on um, and that the form of government that finished in I think it was 1876, um, when all provincial governments were abolished, uh, we should never forget some of those lessons of the past and about how governance occurs. I'll come back to that. Uh, these are declarations of interest um, because I, I don't live in the city, um, but uh, my family have been in the region since the very earliest uh, settlement of the European settlement here, and we, one of the pieces of our land is land that we have farmed continuously for about 180 years. So we have pretty deep roots here. Um, but I've done a few things outside the district as well, uh, done some things inside the district. And I just want to pick up on one of those, and that's the Waimea Community Dam. Um, I don't live in what is termed the dam zone, so within our property we don't get entitlement to the dam water. But that was a process that was started uh, in uh, 2001 after the big drought for a group of far-sighted people who said, we've got a problem, we should start to solve it. We should solve it by involving all of the people who can contribute to this, who will have a, a, a proper opinion about how this should happen. And that involved the two councils, Fish and Game, Iwi, Forest and Bird, um, Doc, just about everybody who's involved in it. That was the foundation of the success. In 2016, um, uh, as I was finishing a corporate career, my very good friend Nick Patterson was acting on behalf of the Wyoming Irrigators and tragically he died quite suddenly. And the people came and said to me, John, uh, you haven't got anything to do now. So could you give us a hand for a few months? Um, the end result of that was that I led the Irrigators and then subsequently at the request of the council, led the uh, shareholder group negotiating with the contractor. Uh, that took about three years um, to the culmination of getting the dam started. You heard today about the good news for Nelson City, about Connings coming to Nelson. That's a great news, and you can say the work of the city is really the cause of why that's happening. That's not correct. That's happening because the Waimea Dam was built. Um, without the Waimea Dam, Connings would not be doing firstly what they're doing now and would certainly not be contemplating moving into the city. The, the, the value of that dam, funded by the council um, with a very small, too small a contribution from Nelson City um, and loans taken out by the irrigators, is an investment by the wider region uh, for the benefit of the wider region. And just one small example of what Connings are doing is an example of that. My job there in taking over Nick's role was, was to actually say, well, we've got a problem here. This isn't going anywhere. It's very controversial. It's already too expensive. That was at 65 million. It's ended up costing 196. But I only set out to say to the irrigators, there's only three things that need doing. Um, and the most important of those is to get it done. We got it done. Uh, amid much controversy and a lot more cost. But the key thing and the lesson for all of us is having a vision, having determination to stay the distance and thinking about it in the widest context of where the benefit lies is critical as it's critical here. And I think the point I want to make is that it was very interesting uh, listening to Dean's presentation about the need to revitalize the city. That's an absolute given. The city desperately needs revitalizing. The region needs the city to be revitalized. But that should be done in the context of like, the external influences that will affect the way we all operate um, over the next uh, uh, few years, and particularly over the next three to six years. And I use the term there about post three waters. 
I was one of the very vocal people about Three Waters because the governance structure was wrong and the way that went about it was wrong. And that was to say, to, to have that proposal put in place to actually eviscerate most of the functions of regional authorities and then expect them to continue as though nothing had happened was nonsense. So what we're looking at here is the government are saying to us, and the minister said only two days ago, that there is going to be some change in local government and we hope that people will, will give that some attention themselves. Uh, and if they don't, then we will perhaps decide it for them. I think that that's why the context of all the discussions that take place around all local body tables at the moment, if they do that in the isolation of their own context without the wider context, then I think that that's something that we might miss out on. That's not to decry the work that has been done already, because as I say, I think most of that is absolutely essential, but context is important. And size does matter because as, as populations, independent populations of local authorities of 55 odd thousand people in each case was, was um, not insignificant balance sheets, but issues of um, how we service our, our, our customers um, and how we service our communities needs to take account of the, the fact that the community is not just the people who live here and pay rates. It is the people who invest here, as, as a number of us from Tasman District have property and in, in operating property in Nelson City, um, all of it um, employing a lot of people in the city, that have a view about how we that should happen. It's critical that those are the sort of things that are considered as we think about how we invigorate um, both all local bodies, and in this case, just Nelson City. Those of you who took part, as I did, in commenting about the local government review paper, the thing that was missed in all of that was you could have written the summary of that that really mattered, I think, in about half a page. And that is that funding is the key. You can have all the aspiration you like, but if there's not a proper funding structure between central government and local government, then a lot of it doesn't matter. And ensuring that the structures that are put together in local government are both able to fund themselves better than they can do now, are able to make decisions better and have a proper relationship with central government will be key. And all of us should think about our role in delivering that. When I say scale is important, um, if there was, for example, an amalgamation of Nelson and Tasman, my guess is that in 10 years' time, that combined population will be, will be rapidly approaching the population of Dunedin. That will make us the second largest population area in the South Island. The reason why we're getting ignored is because what used to be the first four cities of New Zealand included Christchurch and Dunedin, no longer includes Dunedin and never again will, and that Taurongas and the Hamiltons and perhaps even other places are well and truly past them. But what I, when I go back to the Waimea Community Dam, well, what I said when I got involved was, A, we had to get it done, and we didn't necessarily make all the best decisions, but if we hadn't got it done, then what would be happening in Tasman District is the growth of the last five years would not have happened at anywhere near that scale, that some of us as users of the land would be facing the dire consequences of running out of water completely, and that the economic uh, downturn and the cost of that are considerable. Scale also allows you a better opportunity to sit at the table of decision making, and that I think is a critical issue for this region, that we have a regional approach to, to that issue. I go back to that because the issue for us is we can't repeat the past. We're not going to try to build a building that looks like that. But somewhere in the region, we've got to have buildings that we are proud of. And the sort of vision that we saw from Dean today is part of that. But we've also got to have buildings that are relevant to the context that we will be living in in the next few years. That is not the context that exists today. There are a number of strands that make uh, Nelson uh, special and different. 
And one of those is this city's long passion for the environment. And whether you look at the establishment of the Maruria Society, whether you look at a whole lot of those national stories of passion for the environment, whether it be the Brookby Marimara Sanctuary and others, it's part of who we are. Uh, the next presenter represents the Nelson Environment Centre. And while there are 14 environment centres around New Zealand, I'm really proud as a Nelsonian that the very first in the country was one that was uh, established here in Nelson. Anton is the, uh, their chief executive and general manager. He's a bundle of energy, and he's asked to present today <laughs> about uh, ambitions for the expansion of the Nelson Environment Centre. Thanks, Nick. Great. All right, special and different. I think that's how I was introduced. I'm special and different today. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. Also, thank you for introducing me to this amazing panel of speakers. I feel truly humbled to be in this row and slightly intimidated. But on with the show, I say. Um, does this work? Yes, a logo. About me. So I am from Christchurch. I've spent most of my life living, working, studying overseas. I've had a very privileged career in professional services, uh, predominantly in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I also had the good fortune to study in Denmark, also live and work in Montreal, Canada, as well as Indonesia, Jakarta. Um, I've worked for, or clients include uh, L'Oreal Group, Marsh, uh, Woolworths Group, uh, Commonwealth Games in Melbourne. I even worked on the World Dubai project for Nikhil at one point. Um, the reason I'm here in Nelson is um, uh, we returned to home to work on the recovery in Kaikoura. My family has a farm up there. And my wife came here on a roadie with a friend and she got back to Christchurch. She went, your shit. He said, this was like Melbourne, it's bloody cold. We're moving up to Nelson. And I went, yep. <laughs> um, and here we are. I think I've been with the organisation now close to six years um, and hugely fortunate to have such an amazing team. We're 90 strong. I've got about 30 paid staff and about 60 volunteers. Now, we are the oldest environment centre in New Zealand. Um, I asked the board for uh, some photographic material to prove this fact. This is a great shot of a couple of our OGs. Richard Fazell in the middle and Derek Shaw, along with the mayor at the time, Philip Wollaston, if I said that correctly. Now, what is scary is this is our 20th anniversary, and this is the oldest photo that we could find. So we're already very well established at this point. Now, a little bit about who we are and what we do. So we focus as an organisation on helping our community live more sustainably, and we do this through our waste minimisation programs. These include, uh, hang on, I've screwed up my presentation, but that's all right, we'll roll it back because you're smart people and can follow me. Um, our programs are focused on environmental, social, economic and cultural impact. Uh, environmental impact includes resource recovery, reduced waste to landfill. Education is key to everything that we do, um, as well as uh, preventing greenhouse gas emissions through our food rescue program. Our social impact includes our food support, uh, education again, practical solutions, uh, economic impact, waste diversion saves money. I'm going too fast, aren't I? I look at people, oh, I'm not going too fast. All right, you can see I like to move fast. Um, the organization through our shops gets about 250,000 people through a year. Um, we generate about 800 grand in income through our shops. We have resellers, makers, artists, other business, all drawing from us. Our guesstimate is we contribute five to 10 million a year to the local economy with our efforts. Um, very proud of what we do. Um, our cultural impact. We provide a safe space for our community members. This is highlighted recently with the first legal graffiti wall in Nelson. So we're here for everyone and we're also here for our artists and to create a safe space. All right, let's talk about our programs. Most of you have heard of Kai Rescue. I, don't, I haven't met anyone to date that hasn't. 
Kai Rescue takes food that can't be sold for whatever reason and redistributes it to the community. We're on track for approximately 200 tonnes this year. That's four tonnes a week of food that we're collecting from Countdown, New World and other suppliers that can't be sold and gifting it to our community through 55 charitable organisations. This includes uh, Iwi, Mirai, schools, kindies, uh, the men's shelter, the women's shelter, which has recently closed. Pretty much any community group is drawing from us. Most of the day, actually. We're really proud of this, the food support that we provide. If it wasn't for the amazing volunteers, this would be unachievable. There's only two paid team members in this program. Um, and we're fortunate to be operating from the old classrooms at YMCA. Huge shout out to Sean from the YMCA. Right, next program, our secondhand stores in Tahuna Nui. So has everyone big to the beam down there with the big yellow robot? Most of Nelson at some point has come through this institution. We established this over 30 years ago. As I mentioned before, we get 250,000 visits a year um, and it generates the, the majority of our income. It goes seven days a week and it redirects over 1,000 tonnes of material from landfill per year. Saves us all money. As a community, you donate your goods that you don't want for whatever reason to us, and we sell it back to you. This is a bloody good business model. I implore you all to have a look at this. No, no, I'm teasing. It's, um, it's, without your support, we couldn't do the work that we do. We're, we're hugely grateful. We have a e-product recovery program. We started this five, six years ago in a little tin shed. We're now on track to do 60 tonnes this year, talking with MFE, where the per head of population, we are leading the charge for New Zealand for recovering e-waste. I am so proud of this. Um, I have an amazing team of people. I've got an ex-Rocket Lab technician, an incredibly, incredibly talented team that is working hard every day, seven days a week, to make the most of this precious resource. Hapori Fruit and Veg Box. Um, we're up to 8, 000, over 8,000 boxes to date. Thank you for a nod before, acknowledging that the church is one of our hubs. So what is this about? Fresh fruit and veg in our community as cheaply as we can do it. So we work with local suppliers to do a $15 pre-order box, and it regularly is equated to what's uh, available through the big boys we're more often than not double the value. So for $15 for us, $30 at the New World or Countdown. I'm so proud of this because I'm getting feedback from our partners, quote, unquote, we have never eaten so much fruit and vegetable from the people that are buying the boxes. That is the objective of this program. Get good, healthy food into our community and we all benefit. All right, a new environment centre for, for Nelson. So Nick and I bumped into each other last week, and Nick's like, I've got, I've, I've got a show next week. Can you jump in? Of course, Nick, <laughs> I said. So I'm here to talk about Haven Row. So we're really proud to share that we recently acquired, I'm going to jump off the stage, this lot here. So we're the proud new owners. This started three years ago because we could not find a location for Kai Rescue that was feasible. Um, I don't need to speak to the challenges of Nelson Real Estate. You're all aware of it. So after uh, we've moved Kai Rescue four times in three years, during that time, I've been able to save all the pennies and enabled us to be able to buy this Brownfield site. We have a rare opportunity to tribute to the fabric of Nelson and develop something that is aspirational, that is from Nelson, for Nelson, by Nelson, and to continue to lead New Zealand in the environmental space. I'm really excited about this opportunity, and I'm here to ask you to come on board with us, because it's not we're not independent. We only exist because of you amazing folks. So we're all in this boat together. So what are we going to do? I don't have the answers, I've got some ideas, and this is the start 
of our community engagement piece to ask what you want from an environment centre. So mandatories for us is we want to use local talent. I highlight an architecture project from Irving Smith. Um, we want it to be from locally sourced material. We want to engage as much of the Nelson Tasman community as possible, businesses, et cetera, to help us realise this dream and vision. What do we want to do there? We want it to be an education space. We want it to be a little warehouse for Kai Rescue. We want it to be a community space. We're talking about a safe place for our youth. We're dealing with a period of time that has never seen more anxiety in youth than ever. This includes previous world wars. So we've got some real challenges ahead of us and being the progressive, forward-thinking organisation that we are, we're looking to provide a safe place and solutions for these challenges. We want you to come on this journey with us. We want your support. We want your ideas. We want your money. We want your advice. Uh, <clears throat> Nigel, some investment. Um, the, no, no, I'm being cheeky. We, we have a rare opportunity here to build something that is an exemplar for this city. More, I think from our traffic management report, approximately 20,000 vehicles go past that site every day. So I want it to be a beacon for Nelson, uh, uh, a, a place for hope, if I can say that. Any questions? Oh, am I allowed to ask questions, Nick? Well, there's questions at the end. Oh, he stole my thunder. Yeah. All right, back to Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Anton, for your passion. I mentioned earlier in my own presentation at the beginning of the day uh, the area opposite where the council owns a number of properties. I do think that corner of Nelson is one that is opportunity knocks uh, for this community to make more of its connections with the sea. And that brings me to our last presentation in the section on opportunities for Nelson. Uh, Nigel Skeggs uh, leads the Council Marina Company. Uh, five years ago, there was a lot of grizzle and grumbles that I had, and I'm sure the community would have heard about the management of our arena. Uh, and Nigel has initially been with the council team, now with our management company. In the long-term plan that council publishes tomorrow, we are proposing to establish a full council-controlled organisation taking up the ownership of the assets in that area of the marina. You've heard previously from speakers about the city maximising its connections with the sea. I think that marina area is one again where opportunity knocks, and I'm looking forward to the presentation from Nigel today on that subject. Nigel. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with you here this afternoon and uh, maybe just a little bit of a background. So I am from Nelson. This is where I grew up. Um, I went to university down in Otago and then went uh, over to Europe where I was a professional sailor and uh, super yacht captain for 10 years and then moved to Fiji where uh, we built a marina. It started with uh, staff of three, an evaluation of three million and just prior to COVID uh, floated on the stock exchange with a market valuation currently of around six, uh, $85 million. Um, as part of that, I was also involved with uh, the government there. I was the chairman of uh, Denarau Island and also the chairman of the Maritime Safety Authority of Fiji. Um, so the, the, the marinas and, and being around marinas is certainly my background. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to come back to Nelson now and um, hopefully do the same thing for Nelson. So. What we're doing at the moment is we've started our master plan. We uh, consulted with the community back in 2022, and the master plan was approved by council in September of that year. What we're looking at in total for the master plan is an investment of around about $120 million in the marina itself, um, a sea sports investment of around $14.5 million, including purchase of uh, some additional land, and we're looking at some public realm uh, projects as well, which are looking at the vicinity sort of nine, uh, nine to $10 million. 
for all of this, we've obviously engaged with uh, everyone through the consultation period of the master plan, but this is a continual process. We'll be engaging with the community as we move through our steps and through uh, the various aspects of the master plan and business cases will be presented for, for each of the developments. Now, there's quite a, a large number of projects in amongst that, and uh, normally I would speak for sort of 45 minutes on this. So to condense it to seven, we're just going to concentrate on a few. But really the roadmap for us is we've got three priority areas. One will be the marina services. So this is actually uh, on the water services for our existing yachties. Um, it is better security. Um, it is better access and parking. Uh, it is better environmental controls. Second part is we also have an amazing opportunity that we've got a big greenfield site down on the peninsula by Ackerson Street. So a large um, number of our projects will be focused around uh, land-based improvements. And then finally, water area developments, which includes quite a large extension to the north of Ackerson Street. Three main projects we've talked about today are the ones that we're working on now and are our priority under the um, under our long term under the council's long term plan and as part of our master plan. First is to look at Nelson City to Sea Link. So this is a priority for us to really activate the marina to start getting people down and enjoying the water and having access to the water, um, which uh, which is unencumbered and and is free. So. The first uh, option or first first part of this project is to link up from just here where the city walkway now finishes and bring that walkway right up into the marina with a cycleway and a wide promenade. Um, there's an amazing opportunity here for us to look at art installations, to look at telling the story for Nelson, to make it a destination itself, not just a cycleway or a pathway, but, but an actual attraction. And we know, for well, many of you will hopefully been down and tried Ruby's Cafe. It's become one of the most popular cafes in Nelson. And really what it's shown us um, and why we've been trying to do this is, is that if we activate the area, if we give people a reason to come, then they will. And, and people are finding it a very enjoyable um, outlook and a place to, to be. That um, promenade will come right round the marina front and will also link into our marinas as well. Um, to give us an, an area that will allow public access, but also won't restrict the activities in our core market and our core role, which is to protect and uh, people's vessels and their vehicles when they're, when they're parked there and to give them good access to their boats. The promenade is being pushed forward slightly, so, um, and this is because we put an application in last year to the Tourism Infrastructure Fund and uh, we received $1.13 million dollars for that. So that funding agreement is just about to be hopefully signed and we hope to start construction on this part of the promenade uh, by the end of this year. The promenade will continue right up to the existing boat ramp. Uh, we will look at uh, revitalising the, the little park down there and potentially um, where there are the existing sea sports um, location uh, as an area where we can start looking at doing some restaurants um, and activate that area and give people, again, a reason to, to be in the marina and a great outlook where we'll have restaurants on the water that is facing the sunset. Our other big project we're working on at the moment is our hard stand um, upgrade. So uh, Port Nelson have uh, got their new travel lift coming. It's a 550-ton machine. Because of that, there's now a bit of a gap in the market that we're needing to fill. We have the oldest travel lift in the country. Um, it's currently rated to 45 tonne. Uh, our new one will be a 100 tonne one, the same as this one in the picture here. And it's variable width, so it will allow us to go to nine metres beam. Um, that will bring in a new market for us that will help with, uh, as part of our commitment to, um, to the blue economy and Moana Nui, to be able to service the aquaculture uh, industry and the inshore fishing industry as well as our white boats. To do that, we need a little bit more space because we need to separate those two categories of vessels. Um, someone with their million dollar white boat on one side doesn't want to be working beside a steel fishing boat that's grinding. So we're looking to expand the yard. That includes looking at putting in sheds. This will give us better environmental controls for painting, for sanding. Um, it will also allow particularly the commercial craft uh, the opportunity to um, to work 
every day, regardless of the weather, so they can get their boats back in the water. So we're looking here to increase to around, at the moment we have only eight spaces that we can use. Um, under our new development, our new consent, we're looking to have up to 50 plus the workshops. Now to support this, we will be looking also as this phase of um, putting in a new marine centre. So this marine centre will be a place to be able to centralise and bring in all of the um, all the people that are working on the vessels. Along the back end of that, is the intention is to have a customer facing area and then workshops that they can have um, that open up into the boat yard so they can bring the boats right to their venues. And then on the front area here, we'll be looking at marine services and charneries and that type of um, of tenancy. Brilliant opportunity this, I believe, for Nelson. Um, both economically, it's going to bring in a significant amount of money and investment and, and money into from out of the region. Um, we'll be looking to service a lot of the boats in Waikawa. They no longer have facilities for most of those, for a large number of their vessels. We've got Havelock's vessels. We have our own and we have the vessels um, in, uh, across in Tasman as well. So um, it'll bring that economic development. It will also bring in a lot of employment and great opportunity, I hope, for our youth through um, apprenticeship type programs. There's no reason for Nelson not to be the hub of boating. We have the facilities here. We have the skill set here, thanks to our fishing industry. The rest of the country doesn't know that yet in terms of our white boat market. Our job and Port Nelson's job is to go out and say, we have the facilities. We know we can do this job work for you and start bringing and attracting that business into Nelson. Part of that, we, we are also, another big project that we're looking at is to relocate the sea sports facility. We've done, there, are, there was a lot of questions on the viability of this location. Unfortunately, Nelson doesn't have a lot of access to the water and we're very restricted on location. So after a thorough researching, this was decided to be the most appropriate place. Um, studies have confirmed that we can mitigate some of the risks that are associated with this venue and we'll be continuing to do that as we move forward. The idea is that will be a public facility um, that will house the Sea Scouts, Wakarama, the, the rowing clubs, etc. Um, but also give everyone in Nelson the access to come down, launch their boat or their um, or windsurfers, etc., and, and get access, safe access to Nelson's Haven. As part of that phase is then into our major development, uh, and this is looking at around about a 260 berth extension. Nelson Marine at the moment has a, a real shortage of space. Uh, the marina was built when a 12 metre boat was a really big boat, and now we um, are really struggling for the, bigger, for the bigger vessels where the average size in New Zealand now is getting up to 15, 16 metres. With this extension, that will bring, um, the, all of these berths will be 14 metres plus. It will bring some bigger boats in um, and allow us to reconfigure our existing marina where most boats are actually oversized and put them into the right slots. Um, and that will hopefully relieve some of our um, tensions at the moment. For example, for a 16 metre boat, I couldn't give you a date. It's probably at the moment seven, eight years before we could find a berth for you. For a 15 metre berth, we've got a five year wait list at the moment. And we've got a couple of hundred people that are on that wait list. And I know we would have more if they thought there was a possibility they're going to get a, a berth soon. So a great opportunity and um, a great opportunity for Nelson. And then finally, our other major project is just looking at what does Nelson do when we start growing the city, when the city starts going up, there's going to be less car parks, less spaces for keeping boats. So our view is that long, long term, maybe 14, 15 years away, there is an opportunity to then start stacking boats as well and bring them on the land and take some of that inventory that's currently lying around the streets and on the sides of roads, bring it into that facility and... Um, and uh, give everyone a place to, to berth their boat that's boat uh, close to the water. So what's happening um, in terms of timelines, as mentioned, in September of 22, we had the master plan approved, and we did a section 17A review on the governance structure. In June 23, uh, the Nelson Marina Management CCO was formed, and the board started in July of last year. We're currently tomorrow go out to consultation under the LTP to become an independent asset owning CCO. October this year, we should start construction 
on the promenade phase one. Boatyard construction will begin, we hope, in June 20, uh, 2025. And then between 2024 to 2026, we'll be doing the planning, design, consent work for the marina extension and the sea sports facility, and hope to be starting construction on that somewhere around 2027. On, at the moment, we've done quite a few projects, and, we're, and there's going to be a lot of small projects ongoing. Again, I've only got probably spent well over my seven minutes, but trying to condense it, that's just a couple of the core projects, just to um, get you interested in what we're up to. It's an exciting time. Great to come down to the marina, please. If you haven't for a while, please do come down and see what we're doing down there. Come for a coffee at Ruby's and enjoy the water. Thank you very much. An exciting uh, presentation from Nigel. Uh, one of the collective jobs that Council feels very deeply in my opening comments, I noted that we felt a bit shortchanged from the Provincial Growth Fund and not getting our share. We've been very early engaged with the new government uh, and the marina developments was one of those that really lit the candle of the ministers and officials and we're working hard to try and secure government support we're very pragmatic in the sense that it is the government's money and we need to shape our projects to try and maximise the investment that we get. Uh, we've got a moment for a couple of speakers if anybody wants to fire a tough one to any one of our five panellists before we break for afternoon tea. Any questions or comments about what some of what you've heard? Maybe one cup of tea. Shoot. I'm David Newman, and I'm here with David, who run a company called Study Nelson, do we bring international students from Europe to study at various institutions in New Zealand. So um, I'm really um, I'm really here to champion the value of international education and um, the money it brings into our regions. And um, pre-COVID um, international education was one of the biggest um, foreign exchange earners. We're now officially in a recession, we need money. This is for us, I think, a real opportunity for the region to put its um, thinking head on to look at how to support the institutions that we have. Um, so in MIT, I heard before, instead of uh, 685 full-time um, international students has now 185. Um, that's a really sad affair. And that, I think, needs to change. And so my question really is, is there um, expertise in the room? Is there thinking around this in the room about that topic? Thank you. I'm going to throw you that at you, Doug. What do you see as someone that's been involved internationally in education for the opportunities that we've got in this city uh, to have a crack uh, at a greater share of the international student market? Yeah, that, thank you. It's a good question. It's something that I'm thinking deeply about. Um, my background has been as an educator as well as an, an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, when people say they want younger people here in the city, uh, I think the easiest way to get people here is to come and to learn things. And it's something that uh, both my wife and I are uh, keenly focused on. And hopefully uh, through the winter and into the next spring, we should be able to see if there's some possibility there. So I do agree with you. I think there is opportunity. I think there's also a challenge for our community as the new government reviews the Tipukinga structure uh, as to how does our city make sure that what comes out of that works for that international student opportunity. The bit that's worried me a little in the next 10 years of our young people's demographic pointed out in Nick's presentation is that the number of younger people, you know, that university sector, is going to be quite competitive for international students. That makes it even more important that we can do international students. So I've got a real uh, passion and individual view that I think this is an area that opportunity knocks. Pre-COVID, we were doing very well, very keen to engage with yourself, but others where any MIT goes about how we can get back into that market. What surprised me in coming in as mayor is the number of retailers who said to me that they were dependent on the international students for both their workforce and for their custom. And I think the character of Nelson City has lost as a consequence of the loss of those international students. So a big challenge there. I, I, I just add one comment that if this is a, a strategic uh, initiative, 
uh, that the, the city wants to follow. The, the biggest issue isn't getting students here, it's housing. And I think uh, Olivia highlighted this morning that there's uh, it's not a great deal for a student if they're going to try and come and work uh, work and uh, learn in uh, Nelson, but they have to live in Richmond and commute. And I think one of the things that uh, this whole community has to think about is how do you have education and community? Uh, how do we billet people properly? There's lots of housing here. There's lots of spare rooms here, but it's going to take people in the community to invite students into their homes uh, and to to be able to uh, to interact with that community. I think that's probably going to be vitally important. On your collective behalf, oh, one, uh, yes, we'll have one last question, then we'll wrap up. Floor is yours. I think it's now or never. Uh, so I'm here on a multicultural, uh, Nelson, multicultural lens, uh, which um, I think I've, each one of you have uh, promoted your hubs, but we are promoting a multicultural hub. That's a low hanging fruit that anyone is just investment people, but we are already bringing all this. Um, you can see from the multicultural festival alone that we've got a lot of um, small business entrepreneurs, multicultural um, uh, ethnic communities, and we are a thriving um, refugee settlement. And we've got the people right here, just need to invest in people. You don't need so much infrastructure. We have a multicultural hub and uh, they do baskets. They all they are entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs in the in food and everything else, and bring them together. And and social cohesion. We've got all the answers. In every dog, uh, you talk about an aging population and the healthcare. Who's behind those healthcare? Migrant workers, Filipino, the bus, the transport. Everywhere you say that I've been here today, listening this morning. Every everywhere is dotted a, a migrant ethnic uh, community that's been there already doing the ma the mahi. So and arts, we're not just we're not under the uh, makeshift spaces. We are in our own entity. We have been exist for, existing for thirty years. So uh, invest uh, in a multi. Um, invite people to invest in the a multicultural hub. Talk to us, and uh, we'll follow that through. So we bring economy in this country. So kia ora. Kia ora. Thank kia ora. You, Good stuff, Maria. <laughs> And making a good point about that changing face of Nelson and ensuring that we are inclusive. Look, on all of your body's behalf, uh, can I acknowledge Doug, Graham, John, uh, Anton and Nigel for the presentations? Each of them quite different, but each of them can add to the challenge that we have around revitalisation of our city. We'll return at 3.15 as we dig into the arts and the creative element. But before we conclude, can you please put your hands together for our five points? Tanakoto Kato Ko Ali Boswick Toko Ingawa, no Gernzi Les Il de la Manche Aho, Ketamahia Hau, Ki Nelson Tasman Chamber of Commerce, Ketamahia Keta Noho Aho, Ki Fakatu, Norera Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanatato Kato. I didn't introduce myself properly last time, so I felt I probably should do that. Uh, my name is Ali Boswick and I am the Chief Executive of Nelson Tasman Chamber of Commerce and also the Chairman of the uh, Nelson Festivals Trust, which runs the Nelson Arts Festival. On June the 1st, I lived, lived in Nelson for 28 years, which is slightly disconcerting. <laughs> Can't quite believe where that's gone. Um, and in that time, actually have seen a lot of change and also have seen not much change. So it's actually really lovely to be a part of um, the event today. J you'll notice... Possibly. Uh, we've got one person missing today. Unfortunately, June, Judine Edgar is actually an apology. She was hoping to be here to represent the Theatre Royal. She's the chairman of the Theatre Royal Trust, but unfortunately can't be here. Um, if, if I don't know if there's anybody else in the room that could take her place. I suspect not, but we've certainly got some information from Judine that hopefully will come through in the context of the conversation. Before I uh, introduce the panel properly and let them introduce themselves, I just thought I'd give a bit of um, context and some, st some stats around what we're talking about today, which is essentially how our arts and heritage in institutions, it says can contribute, but I say contribute to the revitalization of the city. Some uh, Ministry for Culture and Heritage um, stats that came out last year from a 2023 participation survey said nearly all New Zealanders, 97% have participated at least once in one form of cultural activity in the last three months. Now, this includes listening to music, watching movies, visiting galleries, historical places, everything you'd imagine. 
29% of New, Zealand, New Zealanders reported going to a museum in the last three months. One in five New Zealanders, or 21%, reported attending a musical dance or theatre performance in the last three months. 29% of New Zealanders reported attending a public commemoration event in the last year, and 35% of New Zealanders reported visiting a visual arts gallery in the last 12 months. And Nelson is no different. If anything, we probably score slightly higher in those, in those statistics. And Nelson City, as has actually been said before, is the arts precinct for the region. And that's where we can really double down to create that distinctive feel for the city in relation to the wider region. Now, I'm going to liken this a little bit to Saxon Field, which is much more of a contemporary development, but as a sports precinct for the region, it works really well. And that was due to some really good planning and some great champions. Uh, the Kerry Marshall, the late Kerry Marshall, the former mayor of Nelson and Tasman, was very instrumental in that. And also was somebody who now he's retired, I can say his name and not get me into trouble, is Andrew Petherham, who worked for Nelson City Council for a long time and was really instrumental in making that um, sports precinct come to life. Now, arts activity by its very nature requires an audience. An audience is people, and people bring energy, activity, and spending. And we know from the Arts Festival that when the activity happens, there's an immediate hit for our businesses, particularly hospitality. Now, some of you may have heard um, about Dr. Richard Florida, who was sort of quite a rock star economist in the early 2000s, and his uh, premise around the rise of the creative class. Essentially, invest in creative activity, and this in turn will attract creative, innovative, entrepreneurial people. And people want an attractive, interesting, creative backyard to play in. Now, unlike some regions, we don't have to start from scratch. We're very fortunate that we've got four very significant institutions that are the pillars of our arts and heritage sector. They're the physical points on the landscape and the hubs of activity, that, and that, that they are all, by virtue of their history and origin, origination, they in, intrinsically tell our stories. They're imbued with heritage. We've got the Provincial Museum and Library, which is the literary and scientific institution, which was established in actually May 1841 on the Whitby, so older than Nelson City Council. The Theatre Royal, which was established in 1878. The um, Formerly the School of Music, now the um, Nelson Centre for Musical Arts, established in 18 1894. And the Suta to Aratoya Fokutu, which opened in 1899. And how cool was that, having a gallery and a School of Music opening within six years of each other? So today uh, we've got a panel of people who are representing those institutions and also Sophie Kelly, who is somebody who uses those institutions and probably is well known to many of you. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and they'll all give us a short intro on what they're doing, about five minutes, and then we'll have some discussion. So I'd like to introduce that we've, oh, we have got some kind of an order. I'll introduce James. Welcome to the stage. James Donaldson, who is the director of the Center, Nelson Centre of Musical Arts. Thank you very much, Ellie. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko James Donaldson, toku ingoa nā utotaki. Yeah. I've, um, I've really enjoyed the exchange today of what I think are some brilliant visionary ideas and frankly, refreshing positivity. It's energising to hear not just ideas for what we might do, um, but to hear from people who are actually doing it. We've, um, we've been asked, as Ali said, to discuss how the arts can contribute to the revitalization of our city. And I'm a little worried because um, I think that our job has already been done. I don't think I need to convince you that arts and culture have a role to play. Correct me if I'm wrong. But every single speaker today has directly addressed the relevance of the creative sector to today's outcomes. And we've heard a lot about the importance of building support and facilitating culture and original thought. I was a little worried that Justin from Scott Construction was going to break the molds um, and ruin that pattern. Uh, but then I took a step back and realized that what he does is art. <laughs> <laughs> so the arts and culture are both the definition and the measure of a vibrant city. When people gather, creativity follows. And people gather to appreciate and connect around original thought. We don't need hard numbers to prove that. We understand this intuitively. And Nelson is lucky. In our city centre, we already have internationally renowned arts facilities, including a theatre, an art gallery, a musician, uh, sorry, museum, and a concert hall. And I apologise, I have missed so much that happens in this city and that list. Take my word for it, right now demand in the arts is unprecedented. So if the arts is the answer to a vibrant city, 
why is the city centre still lacking in vitality? And I'd like to suggest the answer lies in the other underlying theme that has been prevalent today. We're not taking risks. We're not choosing in the arts to program for originality, diversity, and relevance because it's risky. Because right now, to put one foot wrong, to program one wrong concert, show, or exhibition would put us under. And that makes us irrelevant. We're putting on yesterday's shows because we know who the audience is. We're not programming innovatively. We're not building and growing infrastructure. We're not consistently valuing our arts and culture sector. I have some bad news. If you want to hear NZ to say play their symphonic programs, you're going to have to go to Blenheim. We don't have a big enough stage or enough audience seating for, for NZSO here. Likewise, if you want to see one of New Zealand opera's fabulous productions, aside from their schools program, they physically cannot deliver their product here. Facilitate arts and culture and the vibrancy will flow from the theatres and the galleries to the footpaths, the restaurants, and the hotels. And the arts actually don't cost us much in the greater scheme. The arts have always been a great investment in both social and economic outcomes. Uh, and just here, I'm going to pause for a moment because I have a comment from Judine. Uh, Judine was on the phone just minutes ago. Um, this, I promise, will be the shortest speech Judine Edgar ever gave. <laughs> and a disclaimer, I cannot repeat some of the words she used. <laughs> um, any investment, no matter how small, can work miracles in our sector. And she cites Green Meadows, Isle Park, and the Skateboard Park. One size does not fit all. People often ask me about the Theatre Royal and NCMA and are we competitive? Do we compete over the same audiences in the shows? And no, we don't. The reason is that we were built with a very specific purpose in mind. We don't compete over audiences. They know which, uh, which place to go to to see what they want to see. Investment must augment and complement what we already have. We need to work, as we work through this process, we need to work with key organisations so that we can level off each other and strengthen the sector. Don't assume you can talk to one of us and get the full picture. And finally, from Judine, we need to honour our existing taonga. We have a responsibility. She asks... How can we utilize and support existing infrastructure? And with that in mind, Ellie, um, is that about five minutes? That's perfect, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Lucinda um, Blackley Jimson, who's Chief Executive of the Nelson Provincial Museum. Uh, kia ora. Uh... Ko Lucinda Jimson Tokawinoa, uh, no Whanganui Atara Aho, but it's wonderful to be in Whakatū Nelson now. Now, I have sneaked in a wee presentation. Um, I'm a very visual person. We're very visual people probably on the panel, um, so I can't resist the opportunity to speak with, um, with some pictures. Okay, we're here from, uh, I'm here from Tasman Bay's Heritage Trust. Nelson Provincial Museum. As you know, we're a CCO, jointly supported by Nelson City and Tasman District Councils. We are a cultural anchor point in the central city, and we're the kaitiaki of the Regional Heritage Collection, which is valued at $20 million. So we talk a lot about... So I'll just move this through, about those warm fuzzies of what museums actually contribute to the livabilities of our cities. We know that they make our cities better places to live. We know that they make them more attractive. We know that families use them. We know that our schools use them. We know that people pop into a central museum like us, they know that they come in in the lunchtime. We know that they use them for engagement and for lots of different things. And some of these are about leading and facilitating, facilitating relevant conversations, being committed to quality experiences, enabling community connection and support, a commitment to te tiriti or waitangi, and representation and storytelling. And storytelling has come up a lot today. And that's what we do. We tell stories. We tell the stories of wakatū. 
in all their beautiful variety and some of them that are quite hard as well. Just also wanted to point out nationally what museums and galleries provide. So 3.6 billion in cultural value to New Zealand. This is quite recent research from Bill Business, Business Economic and Research Limited Company, who was commissioned by Museums Aotearoa. Two billion in environmental value. 2.2, sorry, 272 million contribution to GDP. And 24.6 million contribution to the education sector. What we do is huge and we do it with very little. So these are the warm fuzzies that I was talking about, but I think it's also really important to talk about what we actually do in dollar terms too. So for example, um, our community, we have say 62,000 visitors on average. We have more than that pre-COVID, we're rebuilding, but that's on average and that includes around 5,500 students every year. 60% of those visitors spend on hospitality. So they go from the museum and buy coffees, they go out to lunch, they may go and have a glass of wine with their friend who they've just gone and seen the exhibition with. 40% spend in retail, and that's not just an art museum shop, that's great because that helps our bottom line, but they actually go and buy something at the other shops in our community. So any business with an asset base of 20 million would be able to return significant profits. Now, that's what we, what we do. Obviously, we're here as a public good, but we really need people to get behind our institutions and support them because we actually bring so much to the community. Um, these are a snapshot of some of our um, spaces over the last couple of years and some of the um, engagements and some of the connection through the, our exhibition program that we've had. We do provide a home for our heritage, a home for our people. We provide a home for the students coming in. But, you know, remember that 20 million collection? That fortunately didn't happen today, but it was only two months ago. Had a call when I was dead asleep um, in the morning uh, saying, yeah, we've got a fire alarm going off in the collection. So if you want to have a um, stern wake-up experience, try being a museum director when someone uh, rings to say your collection's potentially on fire. These are the risks that we are facing every day in the current collection and heritage facility that we have and we operate from. And so what are we doing about it? We are building a new archives, research and collection facility in Church Street to protect our collection and most of all, make it accessible for people. We need a new home for our collection. That's what it looks like at the moment. This is a situation that our staff are working in. They're in puffer jackets um, during most of the year because it's absolutely freezing in there. As an employer, we shouldn't be having our people in spaces like that. We've done an amazing amount of work on this project and we are about two or three weeks away from having the detailed design signed off and then we will be um, submitting for building consent. This is good. it's an indicative drawing of the design. Uh, we're actually working with artist Robin Slow, who many of you will know. He's a significant artist um, based in Moho, Golden Bay, um, who will be designing the screen at the front of the building in consultation with Iwi. It's going to be a significant artwork. It's going to be one of the largest in Wakatu. Uh, this is some of his uh, work that it will be a little bit like. This is from the orthopedic um, building um, in Salisbury Road, for those of you who drive past that on commute in from Richmond, like me. Um, it's pretty stunning, so have a look at it. Um, it's going to be designed to actually make the collection accessible and safe. The ground floor is all designed around access. And it's going to have amazing benefits for Nelson. It, we know that when we get a crane on the skyline, activity perks up. We're going to be bringing workers into the community. Uh, we are going to be replacing a really rather gnarly um, car park that you might have seen poking out in the cathedral image where you saw above um, 
it, yeah, ab above the cityscape, and there was a really nasty looking hole of a car park. That's where this building is going to be. We're going to contribute to the vibrancy of Church Street, and bring people into the city to use this facility, because what a, a lot of the things that have been touched on today is about what do we bring it, this people into the city with? And I'll say this is one of the answers. So that's just an update on our funding. And um, yeah, we're so very close to going. Thank you. Thank you. Next, if I could ask Julie Catchpole, who's the director of the Suta Te Arotoia Whakatū. Kia ora. Kia ora tato. Uh, as you heard, I'm Julie Catchpole, the director of the Suta Art Gallery Te Arotoia Whakatū. So what's remarkable about the Suta and how does it contribute to the vitality of Nelson? Well, we aim to be a must-see destination of national importance, and we aim to make art matter. And that's through a bricks-and-mortar location and through our programs and being leaders in our field, and that is in New Zealand. Outreach and collaborations, e.g. to support initiatives like the Nelson Clay Week, festivals, Nelson Jewellery Week, Te Ramaroa, and so the list goes on. Now, the Suta was the third art gallery to be established in New Zealand. We were just pipped at the post by Auckland Art Gallery. And our original Bishop Suta Memorial Gallery is the oldest gallery space in New Zealand in continual use for its original purpose. And we're just about to mark our 125th anniversary. Can heritage contribute to revitalisation? Is it called? Cool? Well, yes, actually, especially when it's a unique proposition and when we, the Suta, are combined with several other organisations, all in extraordinary buildings, all restored, updated in award-winning contemporary facilities, us, the Theatre Royal, the Nelson Centre for Musical Arts, they're all buildings that are serving their original purpose but they're revitalised and serving communities today or audiences today. And hopefully soon, as we've just learned, uh, we see the Nelson Institute, aka the Nelson uh, Provincial Museum in its new ARC facility. So the Suta is in its environment, surrounded by beautiful settings, the Queen's Gardens, another heritage site to the west, Albion Square, and then in its bigger context, the Nelson CBD and the uh, heritage, arts, and culture facilities are like these anchor points, pillars around the CBD. They're legacy facilities, and they're an essential part of this region's DNA. They lend this city its very unique character. I want to share with you some statistics that show us the suit of punching above our weight. We're financially, let me just say, very highly efficient. I received uh, an email from Wellington City Gallery and they outlined their achievements for their last uh, financial year. They had 113,000 visitors come through. We had in that same period 105,000 uh, visitors in our last financial year. I predict this year we will easily exceed that, that visitor number. In perspective, this is equivalent to every single person in Nelson, Tasman region coming into the Suta, plus more. Obviously, not everybody locally does use us, but many do. But that rest of the visitors are visitors to our region. And just this February, for instance, we've seen a huge influx of overseas tourists into the gallery a third up on the previous year for overseas visitors. Educationally, we deliver lessons to over 5,000 students compared to 3,800 in the Wellington City Gallery. And that's with us only a part-time staff member. We even put on more exhibitions. So reverting back to the value of heritage, it's not something that holds us back. Rather, it's a way of energizing us forward walking backwards into the future. 
Look at the excitement and energy for this Tuku 24 festival. The entities here on the stage represent po or pillars, the frame of a walkable city. But ironically, collectively, we might be perceived as establishment. But we can also be perceived as centres of excellence, places to aspire to, in our case, to be represented in, inspirational, extra special. Now, with establishment, there's always a push against it. Actually, you need that for a vital arts sector. It's healthy. The pushing of boundaries, new art spaces, new ways to present art, alternative theatre, the unconventional and the experimental. And actually, we've got that dynamics happening in the city right now. We've just had the opening up of The Bench, a contemporary jewellery making space on Collingwood Street. Lee Woodman's new st studio space opened in Hardy Street on Saturday night. In their own ways, they're going to be centres of excellence. The arts precinct that's going to be developing around the refinery. What we also need is a greater presence of Māori art and there are exciting developments happening in that space too with a FIO, the Toy Māori Hub, opening up here on the edge of the Maitai. Council, organisations like Makeshift and enlightened building owners can all help foster that energy. Council, actually not necessarily by direct funding, but by being willing to help, by finding a ways to allow interventions to happen, allowing public en engagement and events, flexible thinking that helps with safety plans, that enables building owners. We're enormously grateful for instance, with uh, Makeshift and our project that you let the art walk happen, taking the suit at the community's collection out to the streets, telling our stories, making a tourism visitor activity, keeping our cityscape enlivened, minimising graffiti. We need more art, art out there, though. That's my beef. Big statements and in the details, and it was really heartening to hear with the marina uh, project designed into the very fabric of our streetscapes, our civic buildings, our street furniture, our paving, art that tells our stories, art that challenges us to rethink and look. I hope that Nelson will keep respecting its cultural heritage, but also build on this energy. And this is just my, my own personal thing. Not ever becoming mallized or blandized let it be a boutique place, lived in, quirky, interesting, vibrant, absolutely dynamic at street level, fun and creative. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, Sophie Kelly, who will be known to lots of you in the room, but I'll let you introduce your many hats, Sophie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ko katoa, ko Sophie Kelly, toko ingoa, ko na tahu te iwi, te urahau te waka, uh, no whakatū a hau, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like I'm slightly on the back foot because I thought we were here for a conversation. <laughs> it's really fortunate that I wrote some notes um, because at the moment I'm in this interesting age and stage where everything just drops out of your brain. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself and speak a little bit about the Adam Chamber Music Festival and the work that I do. Um, my back... I'm actually really disappointed I didn't know that I could do a presentation because working in the creative sector, what I could have actually put together for you. But we had a really bad break. What a missed opportunity. I'm not going to name anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of improv. Um, my background is in the performing arts. Um, I uh, program curation and arts management. I'm currently the director of the International Adam Chamber Music Festival, which we just completed a couple of weeks ago, a biennial festival held here in Nelson that showcases the very top international and New Zealand chamber mus musicians for 10 days. Um, it was an enormous success, I'm really proud to say. It's the first festival that we've had since the pandemic, um, and it was incredible to see so many people flocking back um, to be part of that event. We had over 7,000 people participate. 25% are actually international, so 25% of our ticket holders travel from the UK, America, Australia to come to the festival. 
46% from around New Zealand and the rest from local. Um, most of those people actually stay here for the entire duration of the festival. So um, the economic benefit of that to this region is really huge. Um, my other role um, is I'm the artistic director of a festival in Wanaka and also their off-year aspiring conversations event. I always like to say I'm not a performer myself, but I really, in this role, like to consider myself an enabler. Uh, using my skills to help artists showcase their work and connect with audiences. I'm also the proud co-chair of Arts Council Nelson, a fantastic institution that's been going for over 30 years, um, who do a phenomenal amount of work in this community. I'm a huge advocate for arts and creativity. They're vital for fostering cultural enrichment, emotional expression, critical thinking, and social cohesion. They inspire innovation, challenge us to see things from a different perspective, and conserve as we know, as a real catalyst for positive change in our communities. I'm a firm believer that embracing and supporting the arts ensures a more vibrant, empathetic and interconnected world for all of us. And I think right now that's more important than ever. I'm here today, as Ali said, uh, in the context of being a user of cultural institutions, as most of the work that I do relies hugely on these facilities um, to present performances for our audiences to enjoy. I guess um, the Adam Festival is a great example of this, and I'd just really like to acknowledge James and his team at the NCMA, who really let us completely take over um, that space for a couple of weeks. And really, the Adam Festival couldn't exist without the NCMA because of its phenomenal acoustics, um, and the musicians just absolutely love playing in that space, and the audience, as I said, come from afar to enjoy it, that kind of intimacy of that. Um, but also just the incredible quality of acoustics. I, I, I will take this opportunity also to add that I can't help but imagine what we could do with a bigger performing arts venue. Um, mm -hmm. We could do so much more with that festival if we had the ability to have a bigger capacity. So just a little punch in there for that. Um, there's lots of things I'd like to speak to in terms of what I advocate for around economic growth, community cohesion, urban renewal, cultural tourism, but I think we'll touch on a lot of that in the conversation. So um, thank you and uh, Norera. Thank you. Someone who didn't have too much to say, I thought that was very eloquent, Sophie, so I think you did, I think you did pretty well. Um, I thought I'd start with uh, something that's dear to all of our hearts and that's the money because I think that one of the things that we've talked about today is actually the investment and what investment looks like. And one of the areas of investment that we know we need to unlock, and Volker touched on this earlier, is that philanthropic um, investment. So I just wanted to sort of check, ask all of you how important that is to your operation and how tenuous that is or how secure it is and how, how do you feel that looks in the future in terms of connecting with people for new new philanthropists to come and support these things? And I'll start with you. As you're right in the middle of a campaign, well, we're we probably tapping into <laughs> lots of philanthropists <laughs> at the moment. Uh, we certainly are, and we have a really um, amazing fundraising campaign led by Emma Thompson, um, who's here, and we have some really amazing ambassadors who are going out and um, approaching people uh, for their contributions. I, I guess we would say that it is a tough environment post-COVID um, that has changed that fund fundraising and philanthropic um, arena, mm -hmm. you know, um, in, in some quite marked ways. So I think there are challenges for all of our arts organisations really going forward. Mm. Uh, but those relationships, when we build them, are so incredibly value for, valuable for us, mm. um, just in terms of the really having people involved, potentially in a multi-generational way, and to, to be able to make such a strong contribution to our organisation. And do you have a, a, an idea of sort of what percentage of your revenue would come from philanthropic investment? Is it something that you you quantify in that way? Couldn't give you a figure off the top no, of I should have warned my head, but uh... <laughs> I'm just interested now you were talking. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sophie, over to you. Obviously, yeah. Adam Chamber Music Festival. Yeah, interesting. So obviously, it's it's integral to mm. our, our budget and programming. Mm. Um, I think we uh, have around thirty three percent of our overall budget is from philanthropic donations. Um, we um, we really uh, engage our audience strongly in that, yeah. obviously, yeah. and um, we have don donors from wide and far. We're extraordinarily lucky at the moment to have um, our new chair of the uh, Nelson Music Festival Trust is Alistair Kerr. He is uh, Scottish, and he comes from a background where he said that if in Europe, uh, if you earn over a certain threshold of income, it's absolutely expected for you to mm. give back to the community. 
um, and he's a huge advocate for that, yeah. and he's not afraid to say that mm. quite directly yeah. to people. Um, and I can also add that just over this last festival, um, you know, Alistair and I spoke very openly about that, and obviously, mm. again, acknowledging the current environment, uh, that we simply cannot put that festival on with that support. Mm. And I'm really thrilled to say that we've pretty much had the pledges from all of our donors and many new to, for us to be able to proceed with the next festival already. Um, just because we put it right out there and mm. spoke very openly about it. Yeah. So just following on from that, actually, Julie, do you think it's a bit of a cultural thing as well that people don't necessarily want to talk about money? Because actually to approach people and ask mm. them to support you is not an easy thing to do. It's quite a, a barrier for some institutions to overcome. Do you think that's part of it? I'm not suggesting you're not successful, but I'm just wondering if that's part of the dynamic. Yes, I think in the Kiwi culture, that is yeah. that is quite challenging, actually. Uh, and I think perhaps in cultures like um, the United States, they've got quite a different uh, philosophy around giving, and they've had tax advantages and things, too, that would encourage giving. Yeah. But for an uh, entity like the Suta, I mean, it wouldn't have existed in the first place if it wasn't for legacy thinking. And... Our collection is entirely generated from fundraising, donations, bequests, um, money invested on our bequests. So that's the way that that grows. Sooner or later, and sooner actually, the collection, for instance, as a community asset will be, just in money terms, be of greater value than the buildings that we inhabit. Mm. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah, an interesting perspective. conundrum. Yeah. yeah. And James, I'm guessing you're in the same sort of boat. I mean, obviously the, the School of Music has was. I mean, a, a lot of people and the certain council, I think he might have disappeared now. Oh, no, I can see Councillor Rainey, who's, you know, th there are some families that have been very involved in that institution mm. for many over generations. Yes, definitely. Um, and it's certainly true that Nelson does some pretty amazing things when the community gets together and decides to do something cool. The, the results are very long lasting. Um, 130 years in our case, uh, mm -hmm. a bit longer in, in, in the suitors' uh, case. Um, I think the, the current situation, to give you a little bit of context, our revenues, sorry, our expenditures have doubled since 2019. Mm -hmm. um, grant funding as a, as a whole has uh, used to account for about 50% of that. It is now about 30% of that. So it hasn't kept pace. And I'm talking about grant funding generally here. Um, so in response to that reality, we are looking to our community a lot more and where donations, uh, we were looking for $5 donations and $10 donations in 2019, um, we are now looking for significantly greater sums of money. Um, donations account for about 10% of our, our revenue at the moment, or um, certainly that's what we're hoping for this year. Have any ideas? Uh, let, me, let me know. But yeah, philanthropy is probably the answer and if it's okay mm. I'll just talk very briefly about our long-term plans because I probably depressed you a bit before <laughs> <laughs> so um, being aware that we cannot continue to rely on um, on on the community to give year on year because people run out of money communities run out of money we're looking 10 years down the track and what we're hoping to do is establish now a philanthropic fund, um, an endowment fund we're calling the NCMA Foundation that will provide a sustainable income for, for the Centre of Musical Arts um, from about 2030. Um, the fund now has about a million dollars in it, or three quarters of a million dollars, and the goal is $10 million by 2030, and that will be invested. And as, as a, re a return comes online from that investment, we'll start to see the benefit. Um, so, yep, we'll be coming to you and asking for quite a bit of money in the next few years. You've been warned. Um, I guess that takes me to sort of my next, uh, something I've been thinking around a lot, and having been in and around the arts for a long time, is the way we, we talk about money in the arts, which is often about funding, it's about grants, it's about donations, it's not always about investment. So I'm just wondering, you know, from your perspective, um, how we can start to make people think differently about the investment that's being made and I guess as an extension of that, then, not that you'll ever do this completely, but depoliticise some of the decision making that sits around the investment in the arts, which some people see as discretionary. Hard question, I know, but it's something I think we, we sort of probably have to really think about because it's something that we need to start changing the, the rhetoric. 
hopefully you agree. You I'm starting with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the difficult questions. <laughs> um, absolutely. I mean, it's a real challenge. We know that there are more demands on everybody's purses currently. Uh, we know that there it is a, a difficult economic situation for our visitors coming in. And we know that we are also a community good and so that we have a real responsibility to provide services for um for tamariki um you know without um, introducing a cost barrier so we do have to be get really smarter and look at different ways of being able to generate some of that mm. some of that income and i think that is a challenge and i think that one of the mm. challenges is for all of us to to um to work together as organizations to see how we can get leverage um, with that rather than I know I think we're all going out there potentially needing your support so how do we work together um, uh, you know rather than going out there yeah. potentially competing with each other I think yeah. is a challenge for all the arts organizations yeah, absolutely mm. so if, if you, I mean you've probably thought about this a lot as well I'm sure over the yeah years. I think um, one of the things that we're sort of doing some work on and really trying to think about is um, changing the kind of mindset of uh, when we speak about investing in the arts, then what actually that donor or mm. organization receives, mm. that it's not so much about what mm. they get, because there's been a strong mm. culture of that for a very long mm. time, you know, whether they get tickets or, mm. you know, their branding on something, what have you, it's much more about investing in the long-term sustainability mm. of the festival mm. um, and that it's around the social benefits and the education and the learning, all of those things. Um, so we're really trying to kind of shift our focus on that and communicate that to our donors. Mm. And that's that's been really positive, actually. And actually, I realise, too, that a lot of the time we don't speak that much mm. about those things because we know them, but we don't we don't share them with our um, own audiences. So, And I think yeah. it always comes back to that storytelling all the time, isn't it, about what those benefits Absolutely. are? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it must be the same. Like you, you just talked again about you earlier about your, you know, your asset base, mm. <laughs> which is extensive and valuable. How you leverage that for future investment is a difficult, mm. you know, a difficult conundrum. I'll just go off, off piece a little bit with this, but um, when we um, the investment in in the building itself, the the bricks and mortar, when we rebuilt the suitor, we had this idea that we wanted to do it with local architects, local construction, and that was a hugely successful. Um, mode of operation because it generated immense civic pride in the facility. It gave a local architectural firm uh, a leg up and now they are represented nationally. Uh, they've got offices everywhere. Scott's Construction, who was a building company involved, you know, they've grown bigger and bigger. And, you know, the, we use local materials and so on. And that's a, an investment in this community and growing businesses in this community and the pride in this community. Yeah. And, and I imagine you went through a similar exercise at the NCMA. Yeah. Yes, um, I'm just I'm very conscious that um, it's it's not just about infrastructure because yeah. I mean that's absolutely valuable and what we've got at NCMA now and the Suter and yeah. the Theatre Royal is fabulous. It really is, but it's not just about that. It's actually about yeah. the social investment. It's about the returns um, to our people. You know, that's what we're here for. That's who we are. Um, and um, I think if you want to look at a study, a micro study for revitalization, you could look at any one of these yeah. organisations. Um, just a, a quote, these are not my words, formerly a tired and impractical building that was really only relevant as a bar with a concert hall attached. That was how the, <laughs> um, the, uh, the School of Music was described back in the day. Now, 100,000 visitors a year. Um, according to the numbers, everyone in Nelson visits us twice. Um, regular weekly users, we call them members, we now have about 1,100, 1,200 of them. Um, occupancy has been at capacity for the last five years, but still somehow every year we manage to fit some more in. Um, it's a phenomenal success. Sophie mentioned the artists who come through the place and consistently every single one, about them, one of them rave about not just the decisions we made in 1894 when we decided we we're going to build the place um, and the wonderful acoustics in that hall, but the new facility we decided in 2018. And I think that might just be the take home almost from today is don't, don't be afraid to take those risks, to make those cool decisions that we celebrate for the next 150 years of Nelson. 
I think that's right. One of the things I sometimes think about as well is that how many buildings that open today do we all, you know, when the Theatre Royal opened, a thousand people attended the opening, a population mm. of 6,000. Mm. How many times do we celebrate those new buildings, mm. which, you know, potentially we should. That's a whole other conversation. Sophie, you touched on, you mentioned cultural tourism, and that's something as a driver for tourism. Obviously, this is a, a really important sector. It's something that we know that people come and participate in. What, In terms of your experience, how have you seen that change over the years? And what do you, how do you think we should position ourselves going forwards? Oh, that's a big question. Big question as well. Got yeah. loads. Um, I've got a whole list. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think it's definitely been a difficult few years. <laughs> um, I think that Nelson has sort of lost its um, sense of uh, sort of creative pride a wee bit, mm. so to speak. I regret saying that. <laughs> um, but I think that meanwhile, there has been some really exciting things brewing and happening um, within the sector. Uh, I look at uh, Lloyd and Yanya, for example, at the moment and the work that Arts Council is doing um, with Nelson Clay Week and Nelson Jewellery Week. Um, just extraordinary events that have been so incredibly successful and we're seeing people come already specifically to participate in those and that are really putting Nelson on the map as a destination. Um, likewise, I, mean, I have to speak about the Adam Festival. One of the reasons that the audiences come is obviously for the festival, but they also come because they love the region and they see it as a creative destination where they can go to artist studios, they can go out and visit other sites, go to the museum, go to the gallery. They all take part in those activities. I think they think of it actually more bigger and broadly than mm. we possibly do ourselves. Mm. We might have lost sight of that a little. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and in terms of obviously the redevelopment mm. um, that you're going through, is that in your mind as well in terms of that that tourist market? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we know that we have a lot of tourist visitors over summer. Mm. We really want to have our ground floor regional gallery, that being almost the key to unlock the region for people. It's the first stop that you come to when you come into Nelson. You want to find out actually what you're going to go and see when before you go into your three national parks. You want to find out about the people. So we really want to um, develop that area as well to be able to tell those regional stories and hopefully to get a night of, of accommodation out of it as well, <laughs> not for us, but, you know, for the, the people around us so that we really increase that um, that depth of the, the tourists bringing those very good outside the region dollars into mm. the into the city and the facility that we're building is definitely going to be accessible it is about bringing people in here it's about increasing the education as access it's about increasing people's access to their whole, their heritage we know that we get a lot of researchers actually to the current research facility in ISIL from overseas they've traveled mm -hmm. um, to be able to come here we can't host them properly we want to be able to do that and we expect to do that a lot more. Mm. Um, we've, I think we've got about five minutes left. So um, appreciating there's a whole lot more we could talk about. So I was going to add something really quickly to that. One, some of the feedback that I've had, especially um, Arts Council, but also Adam Chamber, and one thing that I think is a really important success factor in our cultural tourism um, potential is our geographic um, position for one but also just people rave about the fact that everything's so easy yeah. to access mm -hmm. they can see all of these institutions within a day they can go to various galleries they can do their circles they just can't believe that they can mm -hmm. hold all of those things mm -hmm. into a short space of time yeah and i think we probably don't tell that story enough either mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so i am going to finish this with one question for or two questions for each of you actually but hopefully in reasonably short um answers i just like to sort of uh, appreciating there are lots of issues but also lots of opportunities what would be sort of your one key issue facing your own institution and the biggest opportunity you see over the next five years start with you julie i'll start with you no no don't start with that <laughs> I'll, start with james. Think. I'll start with james the so the key threat yes the, the biggest threat but also the biggest opportunity that you see i think this conversation that we've had today is the opportunity i mm. think it is hugely exciting it really is. Um, and I see a lot of potential and that commitment to act. I think we have been here before. Um, let's not make this yet another summit. Uh, let's let's actually do something out of this. The messaging, I think, is pretty clear and the consensus around the room has been quite compelling. So let's take that and run with it. Um, the threat, I think, is, I think I've touched on it already, it's very, very hard to be vital, to be relevant when you're worried about keeping the doors open, when you're worried about paying your staff, when your focus is intently on how are we going to get enough, enough um, money together 
this week because next week we've got payroll. That's tough. And that's been actually, to be honest, in varying degrees, my last seven years. I think we've got to break that pattern. We've got to set these organizations free to deliver the vitality that we're after in our city center. Mm. That'll be mine. Can I come to you now, Julie? Well, <laughs> same challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I suspect um, it'll be similar. But the opportunities are about, you know, forums like this and greater collaboration between us all so we can get out there and promote Nelson Tasman Inc. Yeah. yeah. Sophie? Yeah, yeah, I mean, investment, obviously, yes, the biggest yeah. threat, yeah. goes without yeah. saying. Um, I think the other one is momentum. Mm -hmm. I think we, um, you know, we, we know it's been a difficult time, but I think we have to seize these amazing things that are happening in our community now and really get behind them mm -hmm. so that we can uplift that great work that's happening and have cross-collaboration um, and support each other. Yeah. Do you think also just through the last few years that we, we've lost some talent from Nelson because of what's happened? Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And not just in Nelson, around New Zealand. Around New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Lucinda? Well, I think you know what our yes. big challenge yeah. are. Yeah. We've got to get um, that collection into a good purpose-built facility that's going to increase access. Yeah. We've got to do this project. Yeah. It's um, really heartening to see that in my next slides. Uh, we've got to, we've really got to get the collection out. We've got to get our people into a decent space. And we can only go from there about increasing that arts and cultural yeah. hub in the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, thank you. I've had to be quite disciplined because I could have gone on for a lot longer. But I would like to thank all of you and Judine in her absence. So Lucinda, Sophie, Julie and James, thank you so much. Thank you. Completely endorse uh, Ali's thank you uh, to our, our panellists uh, and their efforts. Uh, myself, the Deputy Mayor and the Chief Executive earlier this year began by visiting a number of similar sized cities. And in visiting those cities, we came back and looked at our, reflected on our own institutions, whether it be our School of Music, our Theatre Royal, our Museum, uh, and of course our treasured suitor, and felt just so enriched by what we had here uh, and the calibre of the leadership and the trust that support those institutions. It's a miracle that some of them have got through COVID. We acknowledge that. We know you're under uh, pressure, but we're committed to getting you through and you being part of our city revitalization story. So thank you again. Mm. We now come to that part of the program where we're going to break into 14 uh, groups uh, on each table. Uh, it's just really difficult with a big forum of 150-odd people for everybody to be able to be heard, and that is the key purpose over the, the next 30-odd um, minutes. Uh, we want to hear your feedback on what you like about what you've heard today, the ideas you love, the ideas you like, the ideas you don't like, and the ideas uh, that have been missed. If you're on a breakout table we are all the commercial and builder guys or you're all the arty guys, we would much prefer that you mixed up and we're at tables uh, where there were perhaps people you don't know and people that have a wider group. Each of the breakout groups is to be chaired by one of uh, our elected councillors as well as myself, uh, Chief Executive Nigel Philpott uh, and our Deputy Chief Executive um, uh, Alec uh, Levertis. Uh, we're not going to have, and you can imagine how long it would drag the day out if we had every one of those groups reporting back, but we have a staff member assigned to each of those tables. Uh, though Our council has got a specific meeting next week of which then we're going to pull that back together and then report back to you via email. If I have a challenge, it's one that came from the chief executive. And that is that we've had dozens and dozens, I know, and acknowledge the huge effort of what if and, and crystallizing a whole lot of ideas. If I had a challenge for each of the breakout groups would be to identify five ideas that you want translated from this summit uh, into action. It's my plea that those ideas, the world today is not just about the council. Uh, and I really love and the work of what if where there are some community things that for relatively small sums of money can drive things. So don't make just the five concentrated on the council. What can we collectively do as a community uh, that 
would uh, make a difference. So uh, stretch your legs for two minutes. The intention is to reconvene at uh, 4.45. Give it heaps. We look forward to hearing those ideas from your groups. Thank every one of you for uh, participating in those uh, breakout um, sessions and acknowledge both uh, those that have facilitated those discussions uh, and uh, those uh, with notes. Uh, it's my job just to uh, wrap up uh, the summit and the day. Uh, and what you didn't know, and we didn't tell you at the beginning of the day, is that you've all been part of a experiment as lab rats because we have a student with us who is doing a PhD on city revitalization. And I'm just going to ask her to say a few words, introduce herself, because she may have further contact with you. Niku. Uh, hello, uh, I just have a, a limited time, so I just want to summarize what I want to say. Uh, so I'm Niku Tavakoli, you can easily call me Niku, and I'm a PhD candidate in uh, landscape architecture from Lincoln University. Um, and maybe some of you know Jackie Bowring, he, she is my uh, supervisor, and uh, I try to uh, explore different urban revitalization. Uh, 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 sorry, urban revitalization strategies around the world. Uh, to see if they are adoptable in Nelson City Center or not. Uh, so I would be truly happy and grateful uh, to know your ideas uh, about the potential future of Nelson. And I'm trying to conduct um, workshops with uh, professionals and community members like you, and also would be a, a great privilege uh, to have uh, Maori and Evie um, in my workshop as well. So uh, what um, you will experience in the workshop is uh, seeing different revitalized uh, Nelson Center um, photos. And I want you to doubt vote uh, your most and least favorite and discuss about them. Uh, and um, and this is the flyer, so you can find them uh, on your tables as well. So if you are interested, just uh, you can uh, easily email me via this email contact, uh, and then I will send you the research information sheet and all the details. Thank you so much. Thank you and good luck. Now, my partner in crime with today has been both the Chief Executive and uh, the Deputy Mayor, uh, and so I'm now going to ask uh, Nigel to make some uh, closing comments and some introductions. Thanks, thanks, Nick. Hey, look, it's really important that we don't just have a day of talk and we don't do anything. So we, it's all about next steps for me, and Nick's going to be talking about, a little bit more about that. But um, look, we've had, um, to keep costs down, we've had a bit of a hiring freeze on at the, at the Council for a while. But um, when the councillors came up with, the, with one of the three most important things is the revitalization of the city, we have broken that rule and that we have we have built the city development team that's been sort of uh, that's been lapsed for a, for a while. So I do want to invite Claire, Gareth and Chelsea just to come up, show your face. These are these are going to be these people are going to be my eyes and ears. I've been meeting with many of you, but it, I can't do everything. So look. I meet with, with the, the team regularly and they will know everything I know and I will know everything they know. So there's going to be at least four of us now you can talk to. And of course, we met, we met Vince earlier from, from the, from the um, CDT team. So I just wanted to say we are serious about moving stuff forward. This is the team you're going to be talking with. Have conversations with them, please. And let's get some shit done. So, stuff, stuff done. I've got to say, stuff. Stuff. Got to stop saying shit. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, kia ora. Just a quick couple of comments from me, uh, which is, firstly, I, I think it's important to give some confidence. I asked the question right at the start of the day of, like, what can we do to build confidence? And I think there's one thing we didn't highlight, which is that this is actually something that Council has not done at the scale of having this many people in one room with one dedicated focus. And I think that that should give you hope that this is different from previous 
rounds of consultation. This is a focused and concerted effort that has the backing of council, but actually has all of you involved in a way that hasn't been the case in the past. And from a political aspect, I can say uh, we've set expectations that things will happen. Um, and as people who uh, like to stay in public favour, I think we're now going to have to make sure that that happens. Uh, the final thing I want to acknowledge is that this is just one sort of set of our partnerships that need to be present and active uh, for us to succeed in our endeavours. Uh, this was very deliberately focused at those people with, uh, I guess, the most direct stake, uh, our business owners, our retailers, our property developers. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're partnering more widely with the community, which is something that we're also going to continue to engage on. Um, and uh, as we signed the really significant uh, partnership agreement with Te Iwi or Te Tauihu or Te Waka Maui is the significance of that direct engagement as well, is that this is a sort of multi-petal approach and we need to all be moving in step. And so there's more engagement to come at different levels, uh, but I really want to acknowledge just how much energy and time you've all given today because uh, I'm going to have a really busy week trying to kick some of this into action and I'm sure Nick will be in the same boat. So kia ora koutou. Kia ora. Thanks, Rohan. Just a couple of takeouts from me. Um, I did feel by about December last year, our community had got itself into a bit of a negative funk with a lot of talk about what's not right about Nelson. I, I felt exactly the opposite today. I actually think there's a genuine, deep-seated community, iwi council view of not just what's good about Nelson, but the potential of Nelson. And I think someone said this morning, uh, there's a real need for a positive spirit. And I hope each of us will go out today, speak well of our city, because just in the same way of which negative comment can make it worse, positive comment can help us get momentum. I think that's an important takeout. I love that term from Sam about the city's full of long driveways and we need more cul-de-sacs. I thought it was a really beautiful analogy of some of the conversations that we've had today and how we want to now make sure that those uh, cul-de-sacs uh, keep open. Uh, I am to presentation and uh, Pete Rainey is going to be forever Mr. GSD. Um, I think for us to be able to follow that through and get good stuff done, uh, then we're going to have to have some new mechanisms in place. Uh, myself and the Deputy Mayor and Council team have a system of task forces, and they've actually been very successful working, for instance, with Alec on the storm recovery. Uh, we're looking to get some new task forces up and running around picking up from the ideas today. Uh, now, I want to put an invitation out there. I think there will specifically be a new council task force focused on picking up on this revitalisation agenda. I want to hear what the other tables said, but one of the messages I got from mine was actually this connection with the sea, this ocean stuff that you heard in a number of speakers or something. Uh, and I think there needs to be something also in that space. If there are community out members out there that have got energy and got time, council is open-minded about including some non-elected member representation on some of those task forces. It is on a voluntary role, but if you think there's one of those things that's got your passion, then please be connected with us. I also think there's a... A danger and I again one of the panelists said well how do we make sure we have this ripper summit we all go away feeling well uh, here's the commitment today is that put it in your diary on the 28th of September exactly six months after today we are going to have a report back on progress on the summit uh, it will be a lesser event 26 just as well I have my mind here to keep the old fella on the straight and narrow 26th of September uh, we're going to have not a full day but we are going to have a report back, so there's some back accountability um, back to the community. I want to conclude today with some thank yous. Firstly, I want to acknowledge every one of the presenters that we have had today. They've been incredibly diverse. Every one of them have been passionate about City. Everyone, in my view, has added value to our day. The Ideas Factory has been in overdrive, and we have the genesis of so much of what can give our city a lift. 
I want to again acknowledge uh, Anne and the uh, What If group for your inspiration. And I really ask people to take away the document that's been so professionally produced uh, out of that process and brew on it. Uh, and some of that stuff is a challenge for council and we take that on board. But I think if we're really to get the gains for all that energy and effort, we need others to pick up on that. And I do think there's a, just as there is for council with its task force, there's a challenge for what if for you to talk about and about how we can take that process forward further. My very last thank you is to the council team that have start, uh, have worked hard to facilitate today. I particularly want to acknowledge uh, Paul Shattuck, uh, who has been responsible for the logistics today, uh, but also a wider council team that's been very committed to making today successful. Could you please put your hands together for them? I'd like to conclude with asking our Māori Ward Councillor, uh, Kahu Pakipaki, to conclude with a, a few remarks and also a karakia to wind up uh, what I think has been a very successful day, Kahu. O taranaki wai wai ha koko rā kai me menge. O taranaki te maunga titohia ki te hawa uru rā uru ki tai. Tu ke tongariro mo tu ke a taranaki. He ririki a pihanga i wai ho i muri nei e. Ko te uri ko au e. Tēnā koutou, ki te whānau. Mihi nui ki a koutou, ki te whare e tū nei. Tēnā koe. Ko ngā tūpuna i maira nō, te mate ma mai kia rātou te whānau a love. Ki Waikawa, haere rā moi, 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 moi rā. Ka apiti hono tātai hono rātou ki a rātou, ka apiti hono tātou ki a tātou. Ka huri au ki ngā iwi e waru o te tau iho te waka a Māui, me ngā hāpori o o whakatū, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. They gave me a microphone. And running through my head today, kia ora Nick, thank you for that. <laughs> running through my head, I thought I would, uh, <clears throat> lots of things I wanted to say, but uh, <clears throat> leave that on, by the way. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kahu Pakipaki, uh, sitting in the Māori ward seat in our, in our council. Uh, my ancestors arrived on the first boats, they're written on the wall down there. The Brunning family, Johann Matthias Augustus Brunning, arrived in the 1840s. Uh, he kind of, uh, his children met up with some of the locals and thought that they looked quite nice. And, uh, and hello, there's a, there's a long succession of occupation that preceded even the arrivals of the first Germans here. I've got a construction background, project management. I'm really interested in the growth of this, this community. And also I've been involved with iwi, social services and the arts community. And there were two two takeaways that I had that that I thought that it was really important for uh, for me to throw out before I did the akarakia. One of them is we have our two two rangatahi that are here at the moment, Finn and, and, and Malachi. So thank you very much for coming. Um, awesome. We are talking about attracting students internationally. We're we're talking about we're looking outwards when they're right here. They're they're in the room with us. So what they want to hear is they want to hear us saying that we want to invest in them. That's point number one. In the arts, we kind of missed a really important thing about the arts, and they extend into the Māori community, and that is we have uh, Te Mana Kuratahi that was last year, we have Te Mana Kurarua that's happening this year, and we have Te Matatini coming to Nelson, and that is, forget the... The, the symphony orchestra. Forget all of those other fancy ballet stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have an opportunity to represent at a, at a national level, and, um, and I'm really proud. And I'm hoping the people in this room can actualize that and actually realize um, and showcase our region in, in this space. That would be, be really good. So I'm going to end on a karakia that, that, we, that we do at, our, at council. And this karakia is, uh, I'll explain it, that it reminds us that we have kaitiakitanga, 
that we are, we are guardians and we have a responsibility. It recognizes the sky, the air, our maunga, our river, our awa, and the, the land, and also the people. So there's the explanation. Kotangi o te karakia whakakapi o te, o te rā mei, me enoi tātou. Te aki nga te rangi, te aki nga te hau, te aki nga te maunga, te aki nga te awa, te aki nga te moana, te aki nga te whai o te ao, te aki nga papa tuanu, e tuturu whakamaua ki a tīna. Au mea hui e tā e ki e. Kia ora mai tātou. Thank you, Lord. Lee. The Chamber of Commerce has had a very generously uh, served with that I think to the end of our well.